Book One of Jerusalem Delivered. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso. Translated by Edward Fairfax. Book One The Argument. God sends his angel to Tortosa down. Godfrey unites the Christian peers and knights, and all the lords and princes of renown choose him their duke to rule the wars and fights. He mustereth all his host, whose number known, he sends them to the fort that Sion heights. The aged tyrant, Judah's land that guides, in fear and trouble to resist provides. The sacred armies and the godly knight that the great sepulchre of Christ did free, I sing. Much wrought his valor and foresight, and in that glorious war much suffered he. In vain gainst him did hell oppose her might, in vain the Turks and Morians armed be. His soldiers wild, to brawls and mutins pressed, reduced he to peace, so heaven him blessed. O heavenly muse, that not with fading bays deckest thy brow by the Laconian spring, but sittest, crowned with stars immortal rays in heaven where legions of bright angels sing inspire life in my wit my thoughts upraise my verse ennoble and forgive the thing if fiction's light i mix with truth divine and fill these lines with other praise than thine thither thou knowst the world is best inclined where luring parnas most his sweets imparts and truth conveyed in verse of gentle kind to read perhaps will move the dullest hearts so we if children young diseased we find anoint with sweets the vessels foremost parts to make them taste the potion sharp we give they drink deceived and so deceived they live ye noble princes that protect and save the pilgrim muses and their ship defend from rock of ignorance and errors wave your gracious eyes upon this labor bend. To you these tales of love and conquest brave I dedicate. To you this work I send. My muse hereafter shall perhaps unfold your fights, your battles, and your combats bold. For if the Christian princes ever strive to win fair Greece out of the tyrant's hands, and those usurping Ismaelites deprive of woeful Thrace, which now captived stands, you must from realms and seas the Turks forth drive, as Godfrey chased them from Judah's lands. And in this legend all that glorious deed read whilst you arm you, arm you whilst you read. Six years were run, since first in martial guise the Christian lords were raid the eastern land, Nice by assault and Antioch by surprise. Both fair, both rich, both won, both conquered stand. And this defended they in noblest wise Gainst Persian knights and many a valiant band. Tortosa won, lest winter might them shend, They drew to holes, and coming spring attend. The sullen season now was come and gone That forced them late cease from no noble war, When God Almighty from his lofty throne Set in those parts of heaven that purest are, as far above the clear stars every one as it is hence up to the highest star looked down and all at once this world beheld each land each city country town and field all things he viewed at last in sirius stayed upon the christian lords his gracious eye that wondrous look wherewith he oft surveyed men's secret thoughts that most concealed lie he cast on puissant godfrey that essayed to drive the Turks from Sion's bulwarks high, and full of zeal and faith, esteemed light all worldly honor, empire, treasure, might. In Baldwin next he spied another thought, whom spirits proud to vain ambition move. Tancred he saw, his life's joy set at naught, so woebegone was he with pains of love. Bowmond, the conquered folk of Antioch, brought the gentle yoke of Christian rule to prove. He taught them laws, statutes, and customs new, arts, crafts, obedience, and religion true. And with such care his busy work he plied, that to naught else his acting thoughts he bent. 
in young Rinaldo fierce desires he spied, a noble heart of rest impatient, to wealth or sovereign power he not applied his wits, but all to virtue excellent, patterns and rules of skill and courage bold he took from Guelfo and his father's old, Thus, when the Lord discovered, had, and seen the hidden secrets of each worthy's breast, out of the hierarchies of angels sheen the gentle Gabriel called he from the rest. Twixt God and souls of men that righteous been, ambassador is he for ever blessed. The just commands of heaven's eternal king, twixt skies and earth he up and down doth bring. To whom the Lord thus spake, Godfredo fine, and in my name ask him, why doth he rest? Why be his arms to ease and peace resigned? Why frees he not Jerusalem distressed? His peers to counsel call, each baser mind let him stir up. For chieftain of the rest, I choose him here. The earth shall him allow, his fellows late shall be his subjects now. This said, the angel swift himself prepared to execute the charge imposed aright. In form of airy members, fair and bared, his spirits pure were subject to our sight. Like to a man in show and shape he fared, but full of heavenly majesty and might. A stripling seemed he thrice five winters old, and radiant beams adorned his locks of gold. A silver wings he took a shining pair, fringed with gold, unwearied, nimble, swift. With these he parts the winds, the clouds, the air, and over seas and earth himself doth lift. Thus clad, he cut the spheres and circles fair, and the pure skies with sacred feathers clift. On Lebanon, at first his foot he set, and shook his wings with Rory Maydew's wet. Then to Tortosa's confines, swiftly sped the sacred messenger with headlong flight. Above the eastern wave appeared red the rising sun, yet scantly half in sight. Godfrey e'en then his morn devotion said, as was his custom, when with titan bright appeared the angel in his shape divine, whose glory far obscured Phoebus' shine. Godfrey, quoth he, behold the season fit to war, for which thou waited hast so long. Now serves the time, if thou or slip not it, to free Jerusalem from thrall and wrong. Thou with thy lords in council quickly sit, Comfort the feeble, and confirm the strong. The Lord of hosts their general doth make thee, And for their chieftain they shall gladly take thee. I, messenger from everlasting Jove, In his great name thus his behests do tell. Oh, what sure hope of conquest ought thee move, What zeal, what love should in thy bosom dwell? This said, he vanished to those seats above, in height and clearness which the rest excel, down fell the duke, his joints dissolved asunder, blind with the light, and struck and dead with wonder. But when recovered, he considered more the man, his manner and his message said, if erst he wished, now he longed sore to end that war, whereof he lord was made, nor swelled his breast with uncouth pride, therefore, that heaven on him above this charge had laid, but for his great creator would the same, his will increased, so fire augmenteth flame. The captains called forth from every tent, unto the rendezvous he them invites. Letter on letter, post on post he sent, and treatance fair with counsel he unites. All, what a noble courage could augment, the sleeping spark of valor, what incites, he used, that all their thoughts to honor raised, some praised, some prayed, some counselled, all pleased. The captains, soldiers, all, save Bohemann, came, and pitched their tents, some in the fields without, some of green boughs their slender cabins frame, some lodged were Tortosa's streets about. Of all the host the chief of worth and name assembled been, a senate grave and stout. Then Godfrey, after silence, kept the space, Lift up his voice, and spake with princely grace. Warriors, whom God himself elected hath his worship true in Zion to restore, and still preserved from danger, harm, and scath, by many a sea and many an unknown shore, you have subjected lately to his faith 
some provinces rebellious long before, and after conquests great have in the same erected trophies to his cross and name. But not for this our homes we first forsook, and from our native soil have marched so far, nor us to dangerous seas have we betook, exposed to hazard of so far-sought war, of glory vain to gain an idle smoke, and lands possessed that wild and barbarous are, that for our conquests were too mean a prey to shed our bloods, to work our souls' decay. But this the scope was of our former thought, of Zion's fort to scale the noble wall, the Christian folk from bondage to have brought, wherein, alas, they long have lived thrall, in Palestine an empire to have wrought, where godliness might reign perpetual, and none be left that pilgrims might deny to see Christ's tomb and promised vows to pay. What to this hour successively is done was full of peril, to our honor small, not to our first designment, if we shun the purposed end, or here lie fixed all. What boots it us these wars to have begun, or Europe raised to make proud Asia thrall, if our beginnings have this ending known, not kingdoms raised, but armies overthrown? Not as we list erect we empires new on frail foundations laid in earthly mould, whereof our faith and country be but few among the thousands stout of pagans bold, where not behooves us trust to Greece untrue, and western aid we far removed behold, who buildeth thus, methinks, so buildeth he, as if his work should his sepulchre be. Turks, Persians conquered, Antiochia won, be glorious acts, and full of glorious praise, by heaven's mere grace, not by our prowess done, those conquests were achieved by wondrous ways. If now from that directed course we run, the god of battles thus before us lays, his loving kindness shall we lose, I doubt, and be our byword to the lands about. Let not these blessings then, sent from above, abused be, or split in profane wise, but let the issue correspondent prove to good beginnings of each enterprise. The gentle season might our courage move, now every passage plain and open lies. What lets us then, the great Jerusalem, with valiant squadrons round about to him? Lords, I protest, and hearken all to it, ye times and ages, future, present, past, hear all ye blessed in the heavens that sit, the time for this achievement hastened fast. The longer rest, worse will the season fit. Our surety shall with doubt be overcast, if we forslow the siege. I well foresee from Egypt will the pagan succored be. This said, the hermit Peter rose and spake, who sat in council those great lords among. At my request this war was undertaken in private cell who erst lived closed long, what Godfrey wills of that no question make, there cast no doubts where truth is plain and strong, your acts I trust will correspond his speech, yet one thing more I would you gladly teach, these strifes, unless I far mistake the thing, and discords raise, oft in disordered sort, your disobedience and ill-managing of actions lost for want of due support, refer I justly to a further spring, spring of sedition, strife, oppression, tort, I mean commanding power to sundry given in thought, opinion, worth, estate, uneven. Where diverse lords divided empire hold, where causes be by gifts, not justice tried, where offices be falsely bought and sold, needs must the lordship there from virtue slide. Of friendly parts one body then uphold, create one head the rest to rule and guide, to one the regal power and scepter give, that henceforth may your king and sovereign live. And therewith stayed his speech. O gracious muse, what kindling motions in their breasts do fry, with grace divine the hermits talk infuse, that in their hearts his words may fructify. By this a virtuous concord they did choose, and all contentions then began to die. 
the princes with the multitude agree that Godfrey, ruler of those wars, should be. This power they gave him by his princely right all to command, to judge all, good and ill, laws to impose to land subdued by might, to make in war both when and where he will, to hold in due subjection every wight, their valors to be guided by his skill. This done, report displays her tell-tale wings, and to each ear the news and tidings brings. She told the soldiers who allowed him meet, and well deserving of that sovereign place, their first salutes and acclamations sweet received he with love and gentle grace. After, their reverence done, with kind regret requited was, with mild and cheerful face he bids his armies should the following day on those fair plains their standards proud display. The golden sun rose from the silver wave, and with his beams enameled every green, when up arose each warrior bold and brave, glistering in filed steel and armor sheen, with jolly plumes their crests adorned they have, and all to fore their chieftain mustered been. He from a mountain cast his curious sight on every footman and on every knight. My mind, time's enemy, oblivion's foe, dispose or true of each noteworthy thing. O oh, let thy virtuous might avail me so, that I each troop and captain great may sing, that in this glorious war did famous grow, forgot till now by time's ill handling. This work, derived from thy treasures dear, let all times hearken, never age outwear. The French came foremost, battleless and bold, late led by Hugo, brother to their king. From France, the isle that rivers four enfold with rolling streams descending from their spring. But Hugo dead, the lily fair of gold, their wanted ensign, they to for them bring under Clotharius great, a captain good and hardy knight, as sprung of prince's blood. A thousand were they in strong armors clad, next whom there marched forth another band, that number nature and instruction had, like them, to fight far off or charge at hand, all valiant Normans by Lord Robert lad, the native duke of that renowned land, two bishops next their standards proud up bear called reverend william and good adamere their jolly notes they chanted loud and clear on merry mornings at the mass divine and horrid helms high on their heads they bear when their fierce courage they to war incline the first four hundred horsemen gathered near to orange town and lands that it confine but Adamer the Pogen youth brought down in number like in hard essays as stout. Baldwin, his ensign fair, did next to spread among his Boliniers of noble fame. His brother gave him all his troops to lead when he commander of the field became. The Count Carinto did him straight succeed, grave in advice, well skilled in Mars's game. Four hundred brought he, but so many thrice led Baldwin clad in gilden arms of price. Guelpho next them the land and place possessed, whose fortunes good with his great acts agree. By his Italian sire, from the house of Est, well could he bring his noble pedigree. A German born, with rich possessions blessed, a worthy branch sprung from the Guelphian tree. Twixt Rhen and Danube the land contained he ruled, where Soves and Rhetians while on reign. His mother's heritage was this, and right, to which he added more by conquest got. From thence approved men of passing might he brought, that death or danger feared not. It was their wont in feasts to spend the night, and pass cold days in baths and houses hot. Five thousand late, of which now scantly are the third part left, such is the chance of war. The nation then with crisped locks and fair that dwell between the seas and Arden wood, where Moselle streams and Rhen the meadows wear, a batten soil, for grain, for pasture good, their islanders with them, who oft repair their earthen bulwarks gainst the ocean flood, the flood elsewhere that ships and barks devours, but there drown cities, countries, towns, and towers. Both in one troop, and but a thousand all, under another Robert fierce they run. 
then the english squadron soldiers stout and tall by william led their sovereign's younger son these archers be and with them come with all a people near the northern pole that won whom ireland sent from locks and forests hoar divided far by sea from europe's shore tancredi next nor amongst them all was one rinald except a prince of greater might with majesty his noble countenance shone high were his thoughts his heart was bold in fight no shameful vice his worth had overgone his fault was love by unadvised sight bred in the dangers of adventurous arms and nursed with griefs with sorrows woes and harms fame tells that on that ever blessed day when christian swords with persian blood were dyed the furious prince tancredi from that fray his coward foes chased through forests wide till tired with the fight the heat the way he sought some place to rest his weary side and drew him near a silver stream that played among wild herbs under the greenwood shade a pagan damsel there unwares he met in shining steel all save her visage fair her hair unbound she made a wanton net to catch sweet breathing from the cooling air on her at gaze his longing looks he set sight wonder wonder love love bred his care o love o wonder love new-born new-bred now grown now armed this champion captive led her helm the virgin dawn and but some white she feared might come to aid him as they fought her courage burned to have assailed the knight yet thence she fled uncompanied unsought and left her image in his heart a bite. Her sweet idea wandered through his thought, her shape, her gesture, and her place in mind he kept, and blew love's fire with that wind. Well might you read his sickness in his eyes. Their banks were full, their tide was at the flow. His help far off, his hurt within him lies, his hopes unsprung, his cares were fit to mow. Eight hundred horse from Champagne came he guys. Champagne, a land where wealth, ease, pleasure grow, rich nature's pomp and pride. The Tyrian main there woos the hills, hills woo the valleys plain. Two hundred Greeks came next, in fight well tried, not surely armed in steel or iron strong, but each a glaive had pendant by his side their bows and quivers at their shoulders hung their horses well inured to chase and ride in diet spare untired with labor long ready to charge and to retire at will though broken scattered fled they skirmish still tatin their guide and except tatin none of all the greeks went with the christian host o sin o shame o greece accursed alone did not this fatal war affront thy coast? Yet safest, thou an idle looker-on, And glad attendest which side won or lost. Now, if thou be a bond-slave vile become, No wrong is that, but God's most righteous doom. In order last, but first in worth and fame, Unfeared in fight, untired with hurt or wound, the noble squadron of adventurers came terrors to all that tread on asian ground cease orpheus of thy minois arthur shame to boast of lancelot for thy table round for these whom antique times with laurel dressed these far exceed them thee and all the rest dudon of consa was their guide and lord and for of worth and birth alike they been they chose him captain by their free accord for he most acts had done, most battles seen. Grave was the man in years, in looks, in word. His locks were gray, yet was his courage green. Of worth and might the noble badge he bore, old scars of grievous wounds received of yore. After came Eustace, well-esteemed man for Godfrey's sake, his brother, and his own, the king of Norway's heir, Gernando then, proud of his father's title, Sept crown roger of balneville and angerland for hardy knights approved were and known besides were numbered in that warlike train rambold gentonio and the gerards twain 
Ubaldo then and puissant Rosamond of Lancaster the heir in rank succeed. Let none forget Obizo of Tuscan land, well worthy praise for many a worthy deed, nor those three brethren, Lombards fierce and yond, Achilles, Sforza, and stern Palamede, nor Otton's shield be conquered in these stowers, in which a snake, a naked child, devours. Guesher and Rafi in valor like there was, the one and other Guido famous both, Germer and Eberard, to overpass in foul oblivion, would my muse be loath. With his Gildippes dear, Edward, alas, a loving pair, to war among them goeth, in bond of virtuous love together tied, together served they, and together died. In school of love are all things taught, we see, there learn this maid of arms the ireful guise, still by his side a faithful guard went she, one true love not their lives together ties, no wound to one alone could dangerous be, but each the smart of others' anguish tries. If one were hurt, the other felt the sore, she lost her blood, he spent his life therefore. But these and all Rinaldo far exceeds, star of his sphere, the diamond of this ring, the nest where courage with sweet mercy breeds, a comet worthy each eye's wondering, his years are fewer than his noble deeds. His fruit is ripe soon as his blossoms spring. Armed, a Mars might coyest Venus move, and if disarmed, then God himself of love. Sophia, by adage flowery bank him bore, Sophia the fair, spouse to Bertolda great, fit mother for that pearly, and before the tender imp was weaned from the teat, the princess Maud him took. In virtue's lore she brought him up, fit for each worthy feat, till of these wars the golden trump he hears, that soundeth glory, fame, praise in his ears. And then, though scantly three times five years old, he fled alone by many an unknown coast, or Aegean seas, by many a Greekish hold, till he arrived at the Christian host, a noble flight, adventurous, brave, and bold, whereon a valiant prince might justly boast. Three years he served in field, when scant begin few golden hairs to deck his ivory chin. The horsemen passed, their void left stations fill the bands on foot, and Raymond them beforn of Toulouse lord, from lands near Pyrene Hill, by Garon streams and salt sea billows worn. Four thousand foot he brought, well armed, and skill had they all pains and travel to have borne. Stout men of arms, and with their guide of power, like Troy's old town defensed with Ilion's tower. Next Stephen of Amboise did five thousand lead, the men he pressed from Tours and Brois, but late, to hard assays unfit, unsure at need, yet armed to point in well-attempered plate. The land did like itself the people breed, the soil is gentle, smooth, soft, delicate. Boldly they charge, but soon retire for doubt, like fire of straw soon kindled, soon burnt out. The third Alcastro marched, and with him the boaster brought six thousand Switzers bold, audacious were their looks, their faces grim, strong castles on the alpine cliffs they hold, their shares and culters broke, to armor's trim they changed that metal, cast in warlike mould, and with this band late herds and flocks that guide, now kings and realms he threatened and defied. The glorious standard last to heaven they spread, with Peter's keys ennobled, and his crown, with it seven thousand stout Camillo had, embattled in walls of iron brown. In this adventure and occasion, glad so to revive the Romans' old renown, or prove at least to all of wiser thought their hearts were fertile land, although unwrought. But now was passed every regiment, each band, each troop, each person worth regard, when Godfrey with his lords to council went, and thus the duke his princely will declared. I will, when day next clears the firmament, our ready host in haste be all prepared, 
closely to march to Sion's noble wall, unseen, unheard, or undescried at all. Prepare you then for travail strong and light, fierce to the combat, glad to victory. And with that word and warning soon was dight each soldier, longing for near-coming glory. Impatient be they of the morning bright, of honor, so them pricked the memory. But yet their chieftain had conceived a fear within his heart, but kept it secret there. For he by faithful spile was assured that Egypt's king was forward on his way, and to arrive at Gaza old procured a fort that on the Syrian frontiers lay. Nor thinks he that a man to wars inured will aught for slow, or in his journey stay, for well he knew him for a dangerous foe. And herald called he then, and spake him so. A pinnace take thee, swift as shaft from bow, and speed thee, Henry, to the Greekish main. There should arrive, as I by letters know, from one that never aught reports in vain, a valiant youth in whom all virtues flow, to help us this great conquest to obtain. The prince of Danes he is, and brings to war a troop with him from under the Arctic star. And, for I doubt the Greekish monarch sly will use with him some of his wonted craft, to stay his passage or divert awry elsewhere his forces, his first journey laughed, my herald good and messenger well try, see that these suckers be not us bereft but send him thence with such convenient speed as with his honor stands and with our need. Return not thou, but leisure stay behind, and move the Greekish prince to send us aid. Tell him his kingly promise doth him bind to give us succors by his covenant made. This said, and thus instruct, his letters signed, the trusty herald took, nor longer stayed, but sped him thence, to dun his lord's behest, and thus the duke reduced his thoughts to rest. Aurora bright her crystal gates unbarred, and bridegroom-like forth stepped the glorious sun, when trumpets loud and clarions shrill were heard, and every one to rouse him fierce begun. Sweet music to each heart for war prepared, the soldiers glad by heaps to harness run, so, if with drought endangered be their grain, poor plowmen joy when thunders promise rain. Some shirts of mail, some coats of plate put on, some donned a cuirass, some a corslet bright, an hauberk some, and some an habergeon. So every one in arms was quickly dight, his wanted guide each soldier tends upon, loose in the wind waved their banners light, their standard royal towards heaven they spread, the cross triumphant on the pagans dead. Meanwhile the car that bears the lightning's brand upon the eastern hill was mounted high, and smote the glistering armies as they stand, with quivering beams which daze the wondering eye, that phaeton like it fired sea and land, the sparkles seemed up to the skies to fly, the horses neigh, the clattering armors sound, pursue the echo over dale and down. Their general did with due care provide to save his men from ambush and from train. Some troops of horse that lightly armed ride he sent to scour the woods and forest main. His pioneers their busy work applied to even the paths and make the highways plain. They filled the pits and smoothed the rougher ground and opened every strait they close it found. They meet no forces gathered by their foe, no towers defensed with rampire, moat, or wall, no stream, no wood, no mountain could forslow their hasty pace, or stop their march at all. So when his banks the prince of rivers, Po, doth overswell, he breaks with hideous fall the mossy rocks, and trees o'ergrown with age, nor aught withstands his fury and his rage. The king of Tripoli, in every hold shut up his men, munition, and his treasure. The straggling troops sometimes assail he would, save that he durst not move them to displeasure. He stayed their rage with presents, gifts, and gold, and led them through his land at ease and leisure. To keep his realm in peace and rest he chose, with what conditions Godfrey list impose. Those of Mount Seir, that neighboreth by east the holy city, 
faithful folk each one down from the hill descended most and least and to the christian duke by heaps they gone and welcome him and his with joy and feast on him they smile on him they gaze alone and were his guides as faithful from that day as hesperus that leads the sun his way along the sands his armies safe they guide by ways secure to them well known before upon the tumbling billows frotted ride the armed ships coasting along the shore which for the camp might every day provide to bring munition good and victual store the isles of greece sent in provision meat and store of wine from sios came and crete great neptune grieved underneath the load of ships hulks galleys barks and brigantines in all the mid-earth seas was left no road wherein the pagan his bold sails untwines spread was the huge armada wide and broad from venice jeans and towns which them confines from holland england france and sicil sent and all for judah ready bound and bent all these together were combined and knit with surest bonds of love and friendship strong together sailed they fraught with all things fit to service done by land that might belong and when occasion served disbarked it then sailed the asian coasts and isles along thither with speed their hasty course they plied where christ the lord for our offences died the brazen trump of iron-winged fame that mingleth faithful troth with forged lies foretold the heathen how the christians came how thitherward the conquering army hies of every night it sounds the worth and name each troop each band each squadron it descries and threateneth death to those fire sword and slaughter who held captived israel's fairest daughter the fear of ill exceeds the evil we fear for so our present harms still most annoy us each mind is pressed and open every ear to hear new tidings though they no way joy us this secret rumor whispered everywhere about the town these christians will destroy us the aged king his coming evil that knew did cursed thoughts in his false heart renew this aged prince eclipid aladine ruled in care new sovereign of this state a tyrant erst but now his fell engine his graver age did somewhat mitigate he heard the western lords would undermine his city's wall and lay his towers prostrate to former fear he adds a new come doubt treason he fears within and force without for nations twain inhabit there and dwell of sundry faith together in that town the lesser part on christ believed well on termagant the more and on mahon but when this king had made this conquest fell and brought that region subject to his crown of burdens all he set the paynims large and on poor christians laid the double charge his native wrath revived with this new thought with age and years that weakened was of yore such madness in his cruel bosom wrought that now than ever blood he thirsteth more so stings a snake that to the fire is brought which harmless lay benumbed with cold before a lion so his rage renewed hath though tame before if he be moved to wrath i see quoth he some expectation vain in these false christians and some new content our common loss they trust will be their gain they laugh we weep they joy while we lament and more perchance by treason or by train to murder us they secretly consent or otherwise to work us harm and woe to ope the gates and so let in our foe but lest they should effect their cursed will let us destroy this serpent on his nest both young and old let us this people kill the tender infants at their mother's breast the houses burn their holy temples fill with bodies slain of those that loved them best and on that tomb they hold so much in price let's offer up their priests in sacrifice 
Thus thought the tyrant in his traitorous mind, But durst not follow what he had decreed, Yet if the innocent some mercy find, From cowardice, not ruth, did that proceed. His noble foes durst not his craven kind Exasperate by such a bloody deed. For if he need, what grace could then be got If thus of peace he broke or loosed the knot? His villain heart, his cursed rage restrained, To other thoughts he bent his fierce desire, The suburbs first, flat with the earth he plained, And burnt their buildings with devouring fire. Loath was the wretch the Frenchman should have gained, Or help or ease by finding aught entire. Cedron, Bethsaida, and each watering else Empoisoned he, both fountain, springs, and wells. So wary wise this child of darkness was, The city's self he strongly fortifies. Three sides by sight he well defensed has, That's only weak that to the northward lies. With mighty bars of long-enduring brass The steel-bound doors and iron gates he ties, And lastly legions armed well provides Of subjects born and hired aid besides. End of Book One Book Two of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso, translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The argument: Is Mino conjures, but his charms are vain. Aladdin will kill the Christians in his ire. Sophronia and Olinda would be slain to save the rest. The king grants their desire. Clorinda hears the fact and fortune's plain, their pardon gets and keeps them from the fire. Argantes, when Elite's speeches are despised, defies the duke to mortal war. While thus the tyrant bends his thoughts to arms, Ismeno gan to fore his sight appear. His mean, dead bones laid in cold graves that warms and makes them speak, smell, taste, touch, see, and hear. His mean, with terror of his mighty charms that makes great Dece in deepest hell to fear, that binds and looseth souls condemned to woe, and sends the devils on errands to and fro. A Christian once, Macon he now adores, nor could he quite his wonted faith forsake, but in his wicked arts both oft implores help from the Lord and aid from Pluto Blake. He from deep caves by Acheron's dark shores where circles vain and spells he used to make, to advise his king in these extremes is come. Achitophel so counseled Absalom. My lead, she says, the camp fast hither moves, the axe is laid unto this cedar's root, but let us work as valiant men behooves, for boldest hearts good fortune helpeth out. Your princely care your kingly wisdom proves, well have you labored, well foreseen about, If each perform his charge and duty so, Not but his grave here conquer shall your foe. From surest castle of my secret cell I come, Partaker of your good and ill. What counsel, sage, or magic's sacred spell May profit us, all that perform I will. The sprites impure, from bliss that whilom fell, shall to your service bow, constrained by skill. But how we must begin this enterprise, I will your highness thus in brief advise. Within the Christian's church, from light of skies, an hidden altar stands far out of sight, on which the image consecrated lies of Christ's dear mother, called a virgin bright. An hundred lamps a burn before her eyes. She, in a slender veil of tinsel dight, On every side great plenty doth behold Of offerings brought, myrrh, frankincense, and gold. This idol would I have removed away from thence, And by your princely hand transport In Macon's sacred temple safe it lay which then I will enchant in wondrous sort, that while the image in that church doth stay, no strength of arms shall win this noble fort, or shake this puissant wall, 
such passing might have spells and charms if they be said aright advised thus the king impatient flew in his fury to the house of god the image took with words unreverent abused the prelates who that deed forbade swift with his prey away the tyrant went of god's sharp justice not he feared the rod but in his chapel vile the image laid on which the enchanter charms and witchcraft said when phoebus next unclosed his wakeful eye uprose the sexton of that place profane and missed the image where it used to lie each where he sought in grief in fear in vain then to the king his loss he gan descry, who, sore enraged, killed him for his pain, and straight conceived in his malicious wit some Christian bad this great offence commit. But whether this were act of mortal hand, or else the prince of heaven's eternal pleasure, that of his mercy would this wretch withstand, nor let so vile a chest hold such a treasure, as yet conjecture hath not fully scanned, by godliness let us this action measure, and truth of purest faith will fitly prove that this rare grace came down from heaven above. With busy search the tyrant gan invade each house, each hold, each temple, and each tent. To them the fault or faulty one bewrayed or hid, he promised gifts or punishment. His idle charms the false enchanter said, but in this maze still wandered and miswent, for heaven decreed to conceal the same, to make the miscreant more to feel his shame. But when the angry king discovered not what guilty hand this sacrilege had wrought, his ireful courage boiled in vengeance hot against the Christians, whom he falters thought. All ruth, compassion, mercy he forgot, a staff to beat that dog he long had sought. Let them all die, quoth he, till great and small, so shall the offender perish, sure withal, to spill the wine with poison mixed with spares. Slay then the righteous with the faulty one. Destroy this field that yieldeth not but tares, with thorns this vineyard all is overgone. Among these wretches is not one that cares for us, our laws, or our religion. Up, up, dear subjects, fire and weapon take. Burn, murder, kill these traitors for my sake. This Herod thus would Bethlehem's infants kill. The Christians soon this direful news receive. The trump of death sounds in their hearing shrill. Their weapon, faith, their fortress was the grave. They had no courage, time, device, nor will to fight, to fly, excuse, or pardon crave, but stood prepared to die, yet help they find whence least they hope, such knots can heaven unbind. Among them dwelt her parents' joy and pleasure, a maid whose fruit was ripe, not over-eared. Her beauty was her not esteemed treasure, the field of love with plough of virtue eared, her labor goodness, godliness her leisure, her house the heaven by this full moon a cleared, for there from lover's eyes withdrawn, alone with virgin beams this spotless Cynthia shone. But what availed her resolution chaste, whose soberest looks were whetstones to desire? nor love consents that beauty's field lie waste, her visage set Olindo's heart on fire. O subtle love, a thousand wiles thou hast, by humble suit, by service, or by hire, to win a maiden's hold, a thing soon done, for nature framed all women to be won. Sophronia she, Olindo, hight the youth, both of one town, both in one fate were taught, she fair, he full of bashfulness and truth, loved much, hoped little, and desireth not. He durst not speak, by suit to purchase Ruth. She saw not, marked not, wist not what he sought. Thus loved, thus served he long, but not regarded, unseen, unmarked, unpitied, unrewarded. 
To her came message of the murderment, Wherein her guiltless friends should hopeless starve, she that was noble, wise, as fair and gent, Cast how she might their harmless lives preserve. Zeal was the spring whence flowed her hardiment, For maiden's shame yet was she loath to swarve. Yet had her courage tamed so sure a hold, That boldness, shame-faced, shame, had made her bold. And forth she went, a shop for merchandise, Full of rich stuff, but none for sale exposed, a veil obscured the sunshine of her eyes, the rose within herself her sweetness closed. Each ornament about her seemly lies, by curious chance or careless art composed, for what the most neglects, most curious prove, so beauties helped by nature, heaven, and love. Admired of all, on went this noble maid, Until the presence of the king she gained. Nor, for he swelled with ire, was she afraid, But his fierce wrath with fearless grace sustained. I come, quoth she, but be thine anger stayed, And causeless rage gainst faultless souls restrained. I come to show thee and to bring thee both the white, Whose fact hath made thy heart so wroth. Her modest boldness, and that lightning ray which her sweet beauty streamed on his face, had struck the prince with wonder and dismay, changed his cheer and cleared his moody grace, that had her eyes disposed their looks to play, the king had snared been in love's strong lace. But wayward beauty doth not fancy move, a frown forbids, a smile engendereth love. It was amazement, wonder, and delight, although not love, that moved his cruel sense. Tell on, quoth he, unfold the chance aright, thy people's lives I grant for recompense. Then she, behold the falter here in sight, this hand committed that supposed offense. I took the image, mine that fault, that fact, mine be the glory of that virtuous act. This spotless lamb thus offered up her blood To save the rest of Christ's selected fold. O noble lie, was ever truth so good? Blessed be the lips that such a leasing told. Thoughtful a while remained the tyrant wood, His native wrath he gan a space withhold, And said, That thou discover, soon I will. What aid, what counsel hadst thou in that ill? My lofty thoughts, she answered him, envied another's hand should work my high desire. The thirst of glory can no partner bide. With mine own self I did alone conspire. On thee alone, the tyrant then replied, shall fall the vengeance of my wrath and ire. Tis just and right, quoth she, I yield consent. Mine be the honor, mine the punishment. The wretch, of new enraged at the same, Asked where she hid the image so conveyed. Not hid, quoth she, but quite consumed with flame. The idol is of that eternal maid, For so at least I have preserved the same With hands profane from being eft betrayed. My lord, the thing thus stolen, demand no more. Here see the thief, that scorneth death therefore. And yet... No theft was this, yours was the sin, I brought again what you unjustly took. This heard, the tyrant did for rage begin to whet his teeth, and bend his frowning look. No pity, youth, fairness, no grace could win, joy, comfort, hope, the virgin all forsook. Wrath killed remorse, vengeance stopped mercy's breath, love's thrall to hate and beauty slave to death. Cain was the damsel, and without remorse the king condemned her guiltless to the fire. Her veil and mantle plucked they off by force, and bound her tender arms in twisted wire. Dumb was this silver dove, while from her course these hungry kites plucked off her rich attire, and for some deal perplexed was her sprite, her damask late now changed to purest white. 
The news of this mishap spread far and near, The people ran, both young and old, to gaze. Olindo also ran, and gan to fear His lady was some partner in this case. But when he found her bound, stripped from her gear, And vile tormentors ready saw in place, He broke the throng, and into present brast, And thus bespake the king in rage and haste, Not so! Not so this girl shall bear away from me The honor of so noble feet. She durst not, did not, could not so convey The massy substance of that idol great. What slight had she the wardens to betray? What strength to heave the goddess from her seat? No, no, my lord, she sails but with my wind. Ah, thus he loved, yet was his love unkind. He added further, where the shining glass lets in the light amid your temple side, by broken byways did I inward pass, and in that window made a postern wide, nor shall therefore the ill-advised lass usurp the glory should this fact betide. Mine be these bonds, mine be these flames so pure, O glorious death, more glorious sepulture. Sophronia raised her modest looks from ground, and on her lover bent her eyesight mild. Tell me, what fury, what conceit unsound presenteth here to death so sweet a child? Is not in me sufficient courage found to bear the anger of this tyrant wild? Or hath fond love thy heart so overgone? Wouldst thou not live, nor let me die alone? Thus spake the nymph yet spake but to the wind. She could not alter his well-settled thought. O oh, miracle, O oh, strife of wondrous kind, where love and virtue such contention wrought, where death the victor had for me designed, their own neglect each other's safety sought. But thus the king was more provoked to ire, their strife for bellows served to anger's fire. He thinks such thoughts self-guiltiness finds out, they scorned his power, and therefore scorned the pain. Nay, nay, quoth he, let be your strife and doubt, you both shall win, and fit reward obtain. With that the sergeants hent the young man stout, and bound him likewise in a worthless chain, then back to back, fast to a stake both ties, Two harmless turtles dight for sacrifice. About the pile of faggots, sticks, and hay, The bellows raised the newly kindled flame, When thus Solindo in a doleful lay Begun too late his bootless plaints to frame. Be these the bonds? Is this the hoped-for day Should join me to this long-desired dame? Is this the fire alike should burn our hearts? Ah, hard reward for lovers, kind desarts. Far other flames and bonds kind lovers prove. But thus our fortune casts the hapless die. Death hath exchanged again his shafts with love, And Cupid thus lets borrowed arrows fly. O oh, Hymen, say, what fury doth thee move To lend thy lamps to light a tragedy? Yet this contents me, that I die for thee. Thy flames, not mine, my death and torment be. Yet happy were my death, mine ending blessed, My torments easy, full of sweet delight. If this I could obtain, that breast to breast Thy bosom might receive my yielded sprite, And thine with it in heaven's pure clothing dressed, Through clearest skies might take united flight. Thus he complained, whom gently she reproved, And sweetly spake him thus, that so her loved. Far other plaints, dear friend, tears and laments, The time, the place, and our estates require. Think on thy sins, which man's old foe presents Before that judge that quits each soul his hire. For his name suffer, for no pain torments him Whose just prayers to his throne aspire. Behold the heavens, thither thine eyesight bend, thy looks, sighs, tears, for intercessors sent. The pagans loud cried out to God and man, 
the Christians mourned in silent lamentation. The tyrant's self, a thing unused, began to feel his heart relent with mere compassion. But not disposed to ruth or mercy then, he sped him thence home to his habitation. Sophronia stood not grieved nor discontented, by all that saw her, but herself, lamented. The lovers, standing in this doleful wise, a warrior bold unwares approached near, in uncouth arms clad and strange disguise, from countries far but new arrived there. A savage tigress on her helmet lies, the famous badge Clorinda used to wear, that once in every warlike stour to win, by which right sign well known was that fair inn. She scorned the arts these silly women use, another thought her nobler humor fed, her lofty hand would of itself refuse to touch the dainty needle or nice thread. She hated chambers, closets, secret mews, and in broad fields preserved her maidenhead. Proud were her looks, yet sweet, though stern and stout, her dam a dove, thus brought an eagle out. While she was young, she used with tender hand the foaming steed with frory bit to steer, to tilt and tourney, wrestle in the sand, to leave with speed Atlanta swift to rear. Through forests wild and unfrequented land to chase the lion, boar or rugged bear, the satyrs rough, the fawns and fairies wild, she chased oft, oft took, and oft beguiled. This lusty lady came from Persia late, she with the Christians had encountered eft, and in their flesh had opened many a gate, by which their faithful souls their bodies left. Her eye at first presented her the state of these poor souls, of hope and help bereft, greedy to know, as is the mind of man, their cause of death. Swift to the fire she ran. The people made her room, and on them twain her piercing eyes their fiery weapons dart. Silent she saw the one, the other plain, the weaker body lodged the nobler heart. Yet him she saw lament as if his pain were grief and sorrow for another's smart, and her keep silent so as if her eyes dumb orators were to entreat the skies. Clorinda changed to ruth her warlike mood, few silver drops her vermil cheeks depaint. Her sorrow was for her that speechless stood, her silence more prevailed than his complaint. She asked an aged man, seemed grave and good come say me sir quoth she what hard constraint would murder here love's queen and beauty's king what fault or fate doth to this death them bring thus she inquired and answer short he gave but such as all the chance at large disclosed she wondered at the case the virgin brave that both were guiltless of the fault supposed her noble thought cast how she might them save, the means on suit or battle she reposed. Quick to the fire she ran, and quenched it out, and thus bespake the sergeants and the rout, Be there not one among you all, that dare in this your hateful office aught proceed till I return from court, nor take you care to reap displeasure for not making speed, to do her will the men themselves prepare. In their faint hearts her looks such terror breed. To court she went, their pardon would she get, But on the way the courteous king she met. Sir king, quoth she, my name Clorinda hight, My fame perchance hath pierced your ears ere now. I come to try my wonted power and might, And will defend this land, this town, and you. All hard essays esteem I eath and light, Great acts I reach to, to small things I bow. To fight in field, or to defend this wall, Point what you list, I not refuse at all. To whom the king, What land so far remote from Asia's coasts, Or Phoebus' glistering rays, O glorious virgin, That recordeth not thy fame, Thine honor, worth, renown, and praise, since on my side I have thy succors got, I need not fear in these mine aged days. 
for in thine aid more hope, more trust I have than in whole armies of these soldiers brave. Now Godfrey stays too long, he fears I ween, thy courage great keeps all our foes in awe, for thee all actions far and worthy been, but such as greatest danger with them draw. Be you commandress therefore, princess, queen of all our forces, be thy word a law. This said, the virgin gan her beaver veil, and thanked him first, and thus began her tale. A thing unused, great monarch, may it seem to ask reward for service yet to come. But so your virtuous bounty I esteem, that I presume for to entreat, this groom and silly maid from danger to redeem, condemned to burn by your unpartial doom, I not excuse, but pity much their youth, and come to you for mercy and for ruth. Yet give me leave to tell your highness this, you blame the Christians, them my thoughts acquite, nor be displeased, I say you judge amiss, at every shot look not to hit the white. All what the enchanter did persuade you is against the lore of Macon's sacred right, for us commandeth mighty Mahomet no idols in his temple pure to set. To him therefore this wonder done refar, give him the praise and honor of the thing, of us the gods benign so careful are, lest customs strange into their church we bring. Let Ismen with his squares and trigons war, his weapons be the staff, the glass, the ring. But let us manage war with blows like knights, our praise in arms, our honor lies in fights. The virgin held her peace when this was said, and though to pity never framed his thought, yet for the king admired the noble maid, his purpose was not to deny her aught. I grant them life, quoth he, your promised aid against these Frenchmen hath their pardon bought, nor further seek what their offences be. Guiltless I quit, guilty I set them free. Thus were they loosed, happiest of humankind, O Lindo, blessed be this act of thine, true witness of thy great and heavenly mind, where sun, moon, stars of love, faith, virtue shine. So forth they went, and left pale death behind, to joy the bliss of marriage rites divine. With her he would have died, with him content was she to live, that would with her have brent. The king, as wicked thoughts are most suspicious, supposed too fast this tree of virtue grew. O oh, blessed Lord, why should this Pharaoh vicious thus tyrannize upon thy Hebrews true? Who to perform his will, vile and malicious, exiled these and all the faithful crew, all that were strong of body, stout of mind, but kept their wives and children pledge behind? A hard division when the harmless sheep must leave their lambs to hungry wolves in charge, but labors virtues watching, ease her sleep. Trouble best wind that drives salvation's barge. The Christians fled, whither they took no keep, some strayed wild among the forests large, some to Emmaus, to the Christian host, and conquer would again their houses lost. Emmaus is a city small, that lies from Zion's walls, distant a little way, a man that early on the morn doth rise, may thither walk ere third hour of the day. Oh, when the Christian Lord this town espies, how merry were their hearts, how fresh, how gay, but for the sun inclined fast to west, that night there would their chieftain take his rest. Their canvas castles up they quickly rear, and build a city in an hour's space, when, lo, disguised in unusual gear, two barons bold approach and gan the place. Their semblance kind and mild their gestures were, peace in their hands and friendship in their face. From Egypt's king ambassadors they come, them many a squire attends and many a groom. The first, Elites, born in lowly shed, of parents' base, 
a rose sprung from a briar, that now his branches over Egypt spread. No plant in Pharaoh's garden prospered higher, with pleasing tales his lord's vain ears he fed, a flatterer, a pickthank, and a liar. Cursed be a state got with so many a crime, yet this is off the stair by which men climb. Argantes called is that other knight, a stranger came he late to Egypt's land, and there advanced was to honor's height, for he was stout of courage, strong of hand. Bold was his heart, and restless was his sprite, fierce, stern, outrageous, keen as sharpened brand, scorner of God, scant to himself a friend, and pricked his reason on his weapon's end. These two entreatance made, they might be heard, nor was their just petition long denied. The gallants quickly made their court of guard, and brought them in where sat their famous guide whose kingly look his princely mind declared, where noblest virtue, troth, and valor bide. The slender curtsy made Argantes bold, so as one prince salute another wold. Aletes laid his right hand on his heart, bent down his head, and cast his eyes full low, and reverence made with courtly grace and art, for all that humble lore to him was known. His sober lips then did he softly part, Whence of pure rhetoric whole streams outflow, And thus he said, while on the Christian lords Down fell the mildew of his sugared words, O oh, only worthy whom the earth all fears, High God defend thee with his heavenly shield, and humble so the hearts of all thy peers, that their stiff necks to thy sweet yoke may yield. These be the sheaves that honor's harvest bears, the seed thy valiant acts, the world, the field. Egypt the headland is, where heaped lies thy fame, worth, justice, wisdom, victorize. These altogether doth our sovereign hide in secret storehouse of his princely thought, and praise he may in long accordance bide with that great worthy which such wonders wrought, nor that oppose against the coming tide of proffered love, for that he is not taught your Christian faith. For though of diverse kind, the loving vine about her elm is twined. Receive, therefore, in that unconquered hand the precious handle of this cup of love, if not religion, Virtue be the band twixt you to fasten friendship, not to move. But, for our mighty king doth understand, you mean your power against Judah land to prove. He would, before this threatened tempest fell, I should his mind and princely will first tell. His mind is this. He prays thee be contented to joy in peace the conquests thou hast got. Be not thy death nor science fall lamented. Forbear this land, Judea trouble not. Things done in haste, at leisure be repented. Withdraw thine arms, trust not uncertain lot, for oft we see what least we think betide. He is thy friend against all the world beside. True labor in the vineyard of thy Lord, ere prime thou hast imposed day work done. What armies conquered, perished by thy sword? What cities sacked? What kingdoms hast thou won? All ears are mazed, while tongues thine acts record. Hands quake for fear, all feet for dread do run. And though new realms you may to thraldom bring, no higher can your praise, your glory spring. Thy sign is in his apogean placed, and when it moveth next, must needs descend. Chance is uncertain, fortune double-faced. Smiling at first, she frowneth in the end. Beware thine honor, be not then disgraced. Take heed thou mar not, when thou think'st to mend. For this the folly is of fortune's play, Gainst doubtful, certain, much gainst small to lay. Yet still we sail, while prosperous blows the wind, 
Till on some secret rock unwares we light, The sea of glory hath no banks assigned, They who are wont to win in every fight Still feed the fire that so inflames thy mind, To bring more nations subject to thy might. This makes thee blessed peace so light to hold, Like summer's flies that fear not winter's cold. They bid thee follow on the path now made so plain and easy, enter fortune's gate, nor in thy scabbard sheathe that famous blade, till settled by thy kingdom and estate, till Mecon's sacred doctrine fall and fade, till woeful Asia all lie desolate. Sweet words I grant, baits and allurements sweet, but greatest hopes oft greatest crosses meet. For if thy courage do not blind thine eyes, If clouds of fury hide not reason's beams, Then mayst thou see this desperate enterprise, The field of death watered with danger streams. High state the bed is where misfortune lies, Mars most unfriendly when most kind he seems, Who climbeth high, on earth he hardest lights, and lowest falls attend the highest flights. Tell me, if great in council arms and gold, The prince of Egypt war against you prepare, What if the valiant Turks and Persians bold Unite their forces with Cassano's heir? Oh, then, what marble pillar shall uphold The falling trophies of your conquest bare? Trust you the monarch of the Greekish land? That reed will break and breaking wound your hand. The Greekish faith is like that half-cut tree by which men take wild elephants in hind. A thousand times it hath beguiled thee as firm as waves in seas or leaves in wind. Will they who erst denied you passage free, passage to all men free by use and kind, fight for your sake? Or on them do you trust to spend their blood That could scarce spare their dust? But all your hope and trust perchance Is laid in these strong troops Which thee environ round. Yet foes unite are not so soon dismayed As when their strength you erst divided found. Besides, each hour thy bands are weaker made With hunger, slaughter, lodging on cold ground. Meanwhile the Turks seek succors from our king. Thus fade thy helps, and thus thy cumbers spring. Suppose no weapon can thy valor's pride subdue, That by no force thou mayst be won. Admit no steel can hurt or wound thy side, And be it heaven hath thee such favor done. Gainst famine yet what shield canst thou provide? What strength resist, what slight her wrath can shun. Go shake the spear and draw thy flaming blade, And try if hunger so be weaker made. The inhabitants each pasture and each plain destroyed have, Each field to waste is laid, In fenced towers bestowed is their grain, Before thou camest this kingdom to invade. These horse and foot, how canst thou then sustain? Whence comes thy store? Whence thy provision made? Thy ships to bring it are perchance a sign. Oh, that you live so long as please the wind. Perhaps thy fortune doth control the wind, doth loose or bind their blasts in secret cave. The sea, pardie, cruel and deaf by kind, will hear thy call, and still her raging wave. But if our armed galleys be assigned to aid those ships which Turks and Persians have, say then, what hope is left thy slender fleet? Dare flocks of crows a flight of eagles meet? My lord, a double conquest must thou make, if you achieve renown by this emprise. For if our fleet your navy chase or take, for want of victuals all your camp then dies. Or if by land the field you once forsake, Then vain by sea were hope of victories. Nor could your ships restore your lost estate, For steed once stolen, 
we shut the door too late. In this estate, if thou esteemest light the proffered kindness of the Egyptian king, then give me leave to say, this oversight beseems thee not, in whom such virtues spring. But heaven's vouchsafe to guide thy mind aright to gentle thoughts that peace and quiet bring, so that poor Asia her complaints may cease, and you enjoy your conquest got in peace. Nor ye that part in these adventures have, part in his glory, partners in his harms. Let not blind fortune so your minds desave to stir him more to try these fierce alarms, but like the sailor scaped from the wave, from further peril that his person arms by staying safe at home, so stay you all. Better sit still, men say, than rise to fall. This said Elites, and a murmur rose that showed dislike among the Christian peers. Their angry gestures with mislike disclose how much his speech offends their noble ears. Lord Godfrey's eye three times environ goes to view what countenance every warrior bears, and lastly on the Egyptian baron stayed, to whom the duke thus for his answer said, Ambassador, full both of threats and praise, thy doubtful message hast thou wisely told. And if thy sovereign love us, as he says, tell him he sows to reap an hundredfold. But where thy talk the coming storm displays of threatened warfare from the pagans bold, to that I answer as my custom is in plainest phrase, lest mine intent thou miss. No, that till now we suffered have much pain by lands and seas where storms and tempests fall, to make the passage easy, safe, and plain that leads us to this venerable wall, that so we might reward from heaven obtain to free this town from being longer thrall, nor is it grievous to so good an end our honors, kingdoms, lives, and goods to spend, nor hope of praise, nor thirst of worldly good enticed us to follow this emprise, the heavenly father keep his sacred brood from foul infection of so great a vice. But by our zeal, a be that plague forstood. Let not those pleasures us to sin entice. His grace, his mercy, and his powerful hand will keep us safe from hurt by sea and land. This is the spur that makes our courses run. This is our harbor, safe from danger's floods. This is our build, the blustering winds to shun. This is our guide through forests, deserts, woods. This is our summer's shade, our winter's sun. This is our wealth, our treasure, and our goods. This is our engine, towers that overthrows, our spear that hurts, our sword that wounds our foes. Our courage hence, our hope, our valor springs, not from the trust we have in shield or spear, not from the succors France or Grecia brings. On such weak posts we list no buildings rear. He can defend us from the power of kings, from chance of war that makes weak hearts to fear. He can these hungry troops with manna feed and make the seas land if we passage need. But if our sins us of his help deprive, of his high justice let no mercy fall, yet should our deaths us some contentment give to die where Christ received his burial, so might we die not envying them that live, so would we die not unrevenged all. No Turks nor Christians, if we perish such, have cause to joy, if to complain too much. Think not that wars we love and strife affect, or that we hate sweet peace or rest in a. Think not your sovereign's friendship we reject, because we list not in our conquests stay. But for it seems he would the Jews protect, pray him from us that thought aside to lay, nor us forbid this town and realm to gain, and he in peace rest, Joy, long more may reign. This answer given, Argantes wild drew nar, trembling for ire and waxing pale for rage, nor could he hold 
his wrath increased so far, but thus inflamed bespake the captain sage, Who scorneth peace shall have his fill of war. I thought thy wisdom should thy fury swage, but well you show what joy you take in fight, which makes you prize our love and friendship light. This said, he took his mantle's foremost part and gan the same together fold and wrap, then spake again with fell and spiteful heart, so lions roar, enclosed in train or trap. Thou proud despiser of inconstant mart, I bring thee war and peace closed in this lap. Take quickly one, thou hast no time to muse, if peace we rest, we fight if war thou choose. His semblance fierce and speeches proud provoke the soldiers all, War, war, at once to cry. Nor could they tarry till their chieftain spoke. But for the night was more inflamed hereby, his lap he opened and spread forth his cloak. To mortal wars, he says, I you defy. And this he uttered with fell rage and hate, and seemed of Janus' church undo the gate. It seemed Fury, discord, madness fell, flew from his lap, when he unfolds the same, his glaring eyes with anger's venom swell, and like the brand of foul electo flame, he looked like huge Typhius loosed from hell, again to shake heaven's everlasting frame, or him that built the tower of Shinear, which threateneth battle against the morning star. Godfredo then, Depart, and bid your king haste hitherward, or else within short while, for gladly we accept the war you bring, let him expect us on the banks of Nile. He entertained them then with banqueting, and gifts presented to those pagans vile. Aletes had a helmet, rich and gay, late found at Nice, among the conquered prey. Argant a sword, whereof the web was steel, pummel rich stone, hilt gold approved by touch, with rarest workmanship all forged wheel, the curious art excelled the substance much. Thus fair, rich, sharp, to see, to have, to feel, glad was the Paynim to enjoy it such, and said, How I this gift can use and wield, Soon shall you see, when first we meet in field. Thus took they Kanji, and the angry knight thus to his fellow parleyed on their way. Go thou by day, but let me walk by night. Go thou to Egypt, I at Sion stay. The answer given, thou canst unfold aright, no need of me what I can do or say. Among these arms I will go wreak my spite. Let Paris court it, Hector loved to fight. Thus he, who late arrived a messenger, departs a foe in act, in word, in thought. The law of nations or the lore of war, if he transgress or no, he recketh not. Thus parted they, and ere he wandered far, the friendly starlight to the walls him brought. Yet his bell heart, thought long that little way, grieved with each stop, tormented with each stay. Now spread the night her spangled canopy, and summoned every restless eye to sleep. On beds of tender grass the beasts down lie, the fishes slumbered in the silent deep. Unheard were serpents hiss and dragons cry, birds left to sing and Philomene to weep. Only that noise heaven's rolling circles kest sung lullaby to bring the world to rest. Yet neither sleep nor ease nor shadows dark could make the faithful camp or captain rest. They longed to see the day, to hear the lark, record her hymns and chant her carols blest. They yearned to view the walls, the wished mark to which their journeys long they had addressed. Each heart attends, each longing eye beholds what beam the eastern window first unfolds. 
End of Book Two. Book Three of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso. Translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Argument. The camp at Great Jerusalem arrives. Clorinda gives them battle. In the breast of fair Erminia, Tancred's love revives. He justs with her unknown, whom he loved best. Argant adventurers of their guide deprives. With stately pomp they lay their lord in chest. Godfrey commands to cut the forest down and make strong engines to assault the town. The purple morning left her crimson bed and donned her robe of pure vermilion hue. Her amber locks she crowned with roses red in Eden's flowery gardens gathered new. When through the camp a murmur shrill was spread, Arm, arm, they cried, arm, arm, the trumpets blew. Their merry noise prevents the joyful blast, so hum small bees before their swarms they cast. Their captain rules their courage, guides their heat, their forwardness he stayed with gentle rein, and yet more easy haply were the feet to stop the current near Charybdis' main, or calm the blustering winds on mountains great, than fierce desires of warlike hearts restrain. He rules them yet, and ranks them in their haste, for well he knows disordered speed makes waste. Feathered their thoughts, their feet in wings were dight. Swiftly they marched, yet were not tired thereby, for willing minds make heaviest burdens light. But when the gliding sun was mounted high, Jerusalem, behold, appeared in sight. Jerusalem they view, they see, they spy. Jerusalem with merry noise they greet, with joyful shouts and acclamations sweet. As when a troop of jolly sailors row, some new-found land and country to descry, through dangerous seas and under stars unknow, thrall to the faithless waves and trothless sky. If once the wished shore begun to show, they all saluted with a joyful cry, and each to other show the land in haste, forgetting quite their pains and perils past. To that delight which their first sight did breed, that pleased so the secret of their thought, a deep repentance did forthwith succeed, that reverend fear and trembling with it brought. Scantly they durst their feeble eyes to spread upon that town where Christ was sold and bought, where for our sins he faultless suffered pain, there where he died, and where he lived again. Soft words, low speech, deep sobs, sweet sighs, salt tears rose from their breasts, with joy and pleasure mixed. For thus fares he the Lord aright that fears, fear on devotion, joy on faith is fixed. Such noise their passions make, as when one hears the hoarse sea waves roar hollow rocks betwixt, or as the wind in holts and shady greaves a murmur makes among the boughs and leaves. Their naked feet trod on the dusty way, following the example of their zealous guide. Their scarfs, their crests, their plumes and feathers gay, they quickly doffed and willing laid aside. Their molten hearts, their wanted pride allay, along their watery cheeks warm tears downslide. And then such secret speech as this they used, while to himself each one himself accused. Flower of goodness, root of lasting bliss, Thou well of life, whose streams were purple blood that flowed here to cleanse the soul amiss of sinful men. Behold this brutish flood that from my melting heart distilled is. Receive in grief these tears, O Lord, so good, for never wretch with sin so overgone had fitter time or greater cause to moan. This while the wary watchman looked over from tops of Sion's towers, the hills and dales, and saw the dust the fields and pastures cover, as when thick mists arise from moory vales. At last the sun-bright shields he gan discover, and glistering helms, for violence none that fails, the metal shone like lightning bright in skies, and man and horse amid the dust descries. Then loud he cries, Oh, what a dust ariseth! Oh, how it shines with shields and targets clear! 
up, up to arms, for valiant heart despiseth the threatened storm of death and danger near, behold your foes, then further thus deviseth, haste, haste, for vain delay increaseth fear, these horrid clouds of dust that yonder fly, your coming foes does hide, and hide the sky, the tender children and the fathers old, the aged matrons and the virgin chaste that durst not shake the spear nor target hold, themselves devoutly in their temples placed, the rest of members strong and courage bold, on hardy breasts their harness donned in haste, some to the walls, some to the gates them dight, their king meanwhile directs them all aright. All things well ordered, he withdrew with speed up to a turret high, two ports between, that so he might be near at every need, and overlook the lands and furrows green. Thither he did the sweet Erminia lead, that in his court had entertained been, since Christians Antioch did to bondage bring, and slew her father, who thereof was king. Against their foes Clorinda sallied out, and many a baron bold was by her side. Within the postern stood Argantes stout to rescue her, if ill mote her betide. With speeches brave she cheered her warlike rout, and with bold words them heartened as they ride. Let us by some brave act, quoth she, this day of Asia's hopes the groundwork found and lay. While to her folk thus spake the virgin brave, thereby behold forth passed a Christian band, towards the camp that herds of cattle drave, for they that morn had forayed all the land. The fierce virago would that booty save, whom their commander singled hand for hand, a mighty man at arms, who guardo height, but far too weak to match with her in fight. They met, and low in dust was guardo laid, twixt either army, from his cell downcast. The pagans shout for joy, and hopeful said, those good beginnings would have endings blessed. Against the rest on went the noble maid, she broke the helm and pierced the armed breast. Her men the paths rode through, made by her sword. They passed the stream where she had found the ford. Soon was the prey out of their hands recovered. By step and step the Frenchmen gan retire, till on a little hill at last they hovered, whose strength preserved them from Clorinda's ire. When, as a tempest that hath long been covered in watery clouds, breaks out with sparkling fire, with his strong squadron, Lord Tancredi came, his heart with rage, his eyes with courage flame. Mast great the spear was, which the gallant bore, that in his warlike pride he made to shake as winds tall cedars tossed on mountains hoar. The king, that wondered at his bravery, spake to her that near him seated was before, who felt her heart with love's hot fever quake. Well shouldst thou know, quoth he, each Christian knight by long acquaintance, though in armor dight. Say, who is he shows so great worthiness that rides so rank and bends his lance so fell? To this the princess said, nor more nor less, her heart with sighs, her eyes with tears did swell. But sighs and tears she wisely could suppress, her love and passion she dissembled well, and strove her love and hot desire to cover, till heart with sighs and eyes with tears ran over. At last she spoke, and with a crafty slight her secret love disguised in clothes of hate. Alas, too well, she says, I know that night, I saw his force and courage proved late, too late, I view it when his power and might shook down the pillar of Cassano's state. Alas, what wounds he gives, how fierce, how fell! No physic helps them cure, nor magic's spell. Tancred he hight, O Macon, would he wear my thrall, ere fates him of his life deprive. For to his hateful head such spite I bear, I would him reave his cruel heart on live. Thus said she. They that her complainings hear, in other sense her wishes credit give. She sighed with all, they construed all amiss, and thought she wished to kill, who longed to kiss. This while forth pricked Clorinda from the throng, and gainst Tancredi set her spear in rest. Upon their helms they cracked their lances long, and from her head her gilden cask he cast, for every lace he broke and every thong, and in the dust threw down her plumed crest. 
about her shoulders shone her golden locks like sunny beams on alabaster rocks her looks with fire her eyes with lightning blaze sweet was her wrath what then would be her smile tancred whereon think'st thou what dost thou gaze hast thou forgot her in so short a while the same is she the shape of whose sweet face the god of love did in thy heart compile the same that left thee by the cooling stream safe from sun's heat but scorched with beauty's beam the prince well knew her though her painted shield and golden helm he had not marked before she saved her head and with her axe well steeled assailed the knight but her the knight forbore gainst other foes he proved him through the field yet she for that refrained ne'er the more but following turn they cried in ire for wise and so at once she threats to kill him twice not once the baron lifts his armed hand to strike the maid but gazing on her eyes where lordly cupid seemed in arms to stand no way to ward or shun her blows he tries but softly says no stroke of thy strong hand can vanquish tancred but thy conquest lies in those fair eyes which fiery weapons dart that find no lighting place except this heart at last resolved although he hoped small grace yet ere he died to tell how much he loved for pleasing words in women's ears find place and gentle hearts with humble suits are moved o thou quoth he withhold thy wrath a space for if thou long to see my valor proved were it not better from this warlike rout withdrawn somewhere alone to fight it out so singled may we both our courage try clorinda to that motion yielded glad and helmless to the forestward gan high whither the prince right pensive went and sad and there the virgin gan him soon defy one blow she strucken and he warded had when he cried hold and ere we prove our might first hear thou some conditions of the fight she stayed and desperate love had made him bold since from the fight thou wilt no respite give the covenants be he said that thou unfold this wretched bosom and my heart outrive given thee long since and if thou cruel would i should be dead let me no longer live but pierce this breast that all the world may say the eagle made the turtle dove her prey save with thy grace or let thine anger kill love hath disarmed my life of all defence an easy labour harmless blood to spill strike then and punish where is none offence this said the prince and more perchance had will to have declared to move her cruel sense but in ill time of pagans thither came a troop and christians that pursued the same the pagans fled before their valiant foes for dread or craft it skills not that we knew a soldier wild careless to win or lose saw where her locks about the damsel flew and at her back he proffereth as he goes to strike where her he did disarmed view but tancred cried o oh, stay thy cursed hand and for to ward the blow lift up his brand but yet the cutting steel arrived there where her fair neck adjoined her noble head light was the wound but through her amber hair the purple drops down railed bloody red so rubies set in flaming gold appear but lord tancredi pale with rage as lead flew on the villain who to flight him bound the smart was his though she received the wound the villain flies he full of rage and ire pursues she stood and wondered on them both but yet to follow them showed no desire to stray so far she would perchance be loath but quickly turned her fierce as flaming fire and on her foes wreaked her anger wroth on every side she kills them down amain and now she flies and now she turns again as the swift oor by volga's rolling flood chased through the plains the mastiff curs to fawn flies to the succor of some neighbor wood and often turns again his dreadful horn against the dogs imbrued in sweat and blood that bite not till the beast to flight retorn 
or as the moors at their strange tennis run defenced the flying balls unhurt to shun so ran clorinda so her foes pursued until they both approached the city's wall when lo the pagans their fierce wrath renewed cast in a ring about they wheeled all and gainst the christians backs and sides they showed their courage fierce and to new combat fall when down the hill argantes came to fight like angry mars to aid the trojan knight furious to fore the foremost of his rank in sturdy steel forth stepped the warrior bold the first he smote down from his saddle sank the next under his steel lay on the mould under the sarsen's spear the worthies shrank no breastplate could that cursed tree outhold when that was broke his precious sword he drew and whom he hit he felled hurt or slew clorinda slew ardelio aged knight whose graver years would for no labor yield his age was full of puissance and might two sons he had to guard his noble yield the first far from his father's care and sight called alicandro wounded lay in field and polyphern the younger by his side had he not nobly fought had surely died tancred by this that strove to overtake the villain that had hurt his only dear from vain pursuit at last returned back and his brave troop discomfit saw well near thither he spurred and gan huge slaughter make his shock no steed his blow no knight could bear for dead he strikes him whom he lights upon so thunders break high trees in lebanon dudon his squadron of adventurers brings to aid the worthy and his tired crew before the residue young rinaldo flings as swift as fiery lightning kindled new his argent eagle with her silver wings in field of azure fair erminia knew see there sir king she says a knight as bold and brave as was the son of peleus old he wins the prize in just and tournament his acts are numberless though few his years if europe six like him to war had sent among these thousands strong of christian peers syria were lost lost were the orient and all the lands the southern ocean wears conquered were all hot afric's tawny kings and all that dwells by nilus unknown springs rinaldo is his name his armed fist breaks down stone walls when rams and engines fail but turn your eyes because i would you wist what lord that is in green and golden mail dudon he hight who guideth as him list the adventurer's troop whose prowess seld doth fail high birth grave years and practice long in war and fearless heart make him renowned far see that big man that all in brown is bound gernando called the king of norway's son a prouder knight treads not on grass or ground his pride hath lost the praise his prowess won and that kind pair in white all armed round is edward and gildippes who begun through love the hazard of fierce war to prove famous for arms but famous more for love while thus they tell their foeman's worthiness the slaughter rageth in the plain at large tancred and young rinaldo break the press they bruise the helm and pierce the sevenfold targe the troop by dudon led performed no less but in they come and give a furious charge argantes self felled at one single blow inglorious bleeding lay on earth full low nor had the boaster ever risen more but that rinaldo's horse even then down fell and with the fall his leg oppressed so sore that for a space there must he allgates dwell meanwhile the pagan troops were nigh forlore swiftly they fled glad they escaped so well argantes and with him clorinda stout for bank and bulwark served to save the rout these fled the last and with their force sustained the christians rage that followed them so near their scattered troops to safety well they trained and while the residue fled the brunt these bear dudon pursued the victory he gained and on tigranes nobly broke his spear then with his sword headless to ground him cast so gardeners branches lop that spring 
too fast. Algazer's breastplate of fine temper made, nor Corban's helmet, forged by magic art, could save their owners, for Lord Dudon's blade cleft Corban's head, and pierced Algazer's heart, and their proud souls down to the infernal shade from Amarath and Mahomet depart. Nor strong Argantes thought his life was sure, he could not safely fly, nor fight secure. The angry pagan bit his lips for teen, he ran, he stayed, he fled, he turned again, until at last, unmarked, unviewed, unseen, when Dudon had Almansor newly slain, within his side he sheathed his weapon keen. Down fell the worthy on the dusty plain, and lifted up his feeble eyes uneath, oppressed with leaden sleep of iron death. Three times he strove to view heaven's golden ray, And raised him on his feeble elbow thrice, And thrice he tumbled on the lowly lay, And three times closed again his dying eyes. He speaks no word, yet makes he signs to pray, He sighs, he faints, he groans, and then he dies. Argantes proud, to spoil the corpse disdained, but shook his sword with blood of Dudon stained. And turning to the Christian knights, he cried, Lordings, behold this bloody reeking blade, last night was given me by your noble guide. Tell him what proof thereof this day is made. Needs must this please him well that is betide, that I so well can use this martial trade, to whom so rare a gift he did present. Tell him the workman, fits the instrument. If further proof hereof he long to see, say it still thirsts, and would his heart blood drink. And if he haste not to encounter me, say I will find him when he least doth think. The Christians at his words enraged be, but he to shun their ire doth safely shrink under the shelter of the neighbor wall, well guarded with his troops and soldiers all. Like storms of hail, the stones fell down from high, cast from the bulwarks, flankers, ports, and towers. The shafts and quarries from their engines fly as thick as falling drops in April showers. The French withdrew, they list not press too nigh. The Saracens escaped all the powers. But now Rinaldo from the earth upleapt, where by the leg his steed had long him kept. He came and breathed vengeance from his breast Gainst him that noble Dudon late had slain. And being come, thus spake he to the rest, Warriors, why stand you gazing here in vain? Pale death our valiant leader hath oppressed. Come wreak his loss, whom bootless you complain. Those walls are weak, they keep but cowards out. No ramp here can withstand a courage stout of double iron, brass, or adamant, or if this wall were built of flaming fire, yet should the pagan vile a fortress want to shroud his coward head, safe from mine ire. Come, follow then, and bid base fear avaunt. The harder work deserves the greater hire. And with that word, close to the walls he starts, nor fears he arrows, queries, stones, or darts. Above the waves, as Neptune lift his eyes to chide the winds that Trojan ships oppressed, and with his countenance calm seas, winds, and skies, so looked Rinaldo when he shook his crest before those walls. Each pagan fears and flies his dreadful sight, or trembling stayed at least. Such dread his awful visage on them cast, so seem poor doves at goshawk's sight aghast. The herald Lidger now from Godfrey came, to will them stay and calm their courage hot. Retire, quoth he, Godfrey commands the same, to wreak your ire this season fitteth not. Though loath, Rinaldo stayed, and stopped the flame that boiled in his hardy stomach hot. His bridled fury grew thereby more fell, so rivers stopped above their banks to swell. The bands retire, nor dangered by their foes in their retreat, so wise were they and wary, to murdered Dudon each lamenting goes, from wanted use of Ruth they list not vary. Upon their friendly arms they soft impose the noble burden of his corpse to carry. 
Meanwhile, Godfredo from a mountain great beheld the sacred city and her seat. Jerusalem is seated on two hills of height unlike, and turned side to side. The space between a gentle valley fills, from mount to mount expansed fair and wide. The rest is easy, scant to rise espied. But mighty bulwarks fence that plainer part, so art helps nature, nature strengthens art. The town is stored of troughs and cisterns made to keep fresh water, but the country seems devoid of grass, unfit for plowman's trade, not fertile, moist with rivers, wells, and streams. There grow few trees to make the summer shade, to shield the parched land from scorching beams save that a wood stands six mile from the town with aged cedars dark and shadows brown by east among the dusty valleys glide the silent streams of jordan's crystal flood by west the midland sea with bounders tide of sandy shores where joppa whilom stood by north samaria stands and on that side the golden calf was reared in bethel wood bethlehem by south where Christ incarnate was, a pearl in steel, a diamond set in brass. While thus the duke on every side descried the city's strength, the walls and gates about, and saw where least the same was fortified, where weakest seemed the walls to keep him out. Erminia, as he armed rode, him spied, and thus bespake the heathen tyrant stout. See Godfrey there, in purple clad and gold, his stately port and princely look behold. Well seems he born to be with honor crowned, so well the lore he knows of regiment. Peerless in fight, in counsel grave and sound, the double gift of glory excellent. Among these armies is no warrior found graver in speech, bolder in tournament. Raymond, Pardee, and counsel match him might, Tancred and young Rinaldo like in fight. To whom the king... He likes me well, therefore. I knew him while home in the court of France, when I from Egypt went ambassador. I saw him there break many a sturdy lance, and yet his chin no sign of manhood bore. His youth was forward, but with governance. His words, his actions, and his portents brave, of future virtue timely tokens gave. Presages, ah, too true. With that a space he sighed for grief. Then said, Fain would I know the man in red, With such a knightly grace a worthy lord he seemeth by his show. How like to Godfrey looks he in the face, How like in person, but some deal more low. Baldwin, quoth she, that noble baron hight, By birth his brother, and his match in might. Next look on him that seems for counsel fit, Whose silver locks betray his store of days. Raymond he hight, a man of wondrous wit, of Tholau's lord, his wisdom is his praise, what he forethinks doth as he looks for hit, his stratagems have good success always. With gild and helm beyond him rides the mild and good Prince William, England's king's dear child. With him is Guelpho as his noble mate, in birth, in acts, in arms alike the rest. I know him well since I beheld him late, by his broad shoulders and his squared breast. But my proud foe, that quite hath ruinate my high estate, and Antioch oppressed, I see not, Bohemond, that to death did bring mine aged lord, my father, and my king. Thus talked they. Meanwhile Godfredo went down to the troops that in the valley stayed, and for in vain he thought the labor spent to sail those parts that to the mountains laid, against the northern gate his force he bent, against it he camped, against it his engines played. All felt the fury of his angry power that from those gates lies to the corner tower. The town's third part was this, or little less, for which the duke his glorious ensigns spread, for so great compass had that fortress, that round it could not be environed with narrow siege, nor Babel's king, I guess, that whilom took it such an army led. But all the ways he kept, by which his foe might to or from the city come or go. His care was next to catch the trenches deep, 
so to preserve his resting camp by night, lest from the city while his soldiers sleep they might assail them with untimely slight. This done, he went where lords and princes weep with dire complaints about the murdered knight, where Dudon dead lay, slaughtered on the ground, and all the soldiers sat lamenting round. His wailing friends adorned the mournful bier with woeful pomp, whereon his corpse they laid. And when they saw the Boulogne prince draw near, all felt new grief, and each new sorrow made. But he, without an show or change of cheer, his springing tears within their fountain stayed. His rueful looks upon the corpse he cast a while, and thus bespake the same at last. We need not mourn for thee, here laid to rest. Earth is thy bed, and not the grave. The skies are for thy soul the cradle and the nest. There live, for here thy glory never dies. For like a Christian knight and champion blessed, thou didst both live and die. Now feed thine eyes with thy Redeemer's sight, where crowned with bliss thy faith, zeal, merit, well-deserving is. Our loss, not thine, provokes these plaints and tears. For when we lost thee, then our ship our mast, our chariot lost her wheels, their points our spears, the bird of conquest, her chief feather cast. But though thy death far from our army bears her chiefest earthly aid, in heaven yet placed thou would procure its help divine. So reaps he that sows godly sorrow, joy by heaps. For if our God, the Lord omnipotent, those armed angels in our aid down send that were at Dothan to his prophet sent. Thou wilt come down with them, and well defend our host, and with thy sacred weapons bent gainst Sion's fort, these gates and bulwarks rend, that so thy hand may win this hold, and we may in these temples praise our Christ for thee. Thus he complained, but now the sable shade eclipsed the night, had thick enveloped the sun in veil of double darkness made sleep eased care rest brought complaint to bed all night the wary duke devising laid how that high wall should best be battered how his strong engines he might haply frame and whence get timber fit to build the same up with the lark the sorrowful duke arose a mourner chief at dudon's burial of cypress sad a pile his friends compose under a hill or grown with cedars tall beside the hearse a fruitful palm tree grows ennobled since by this great funeral where dudon's corpse they softly laid in ground the priest sung hymns the soldiers wept around among the boughs they here and there bestow ensigns and arms as witness of his praise which he from pagan lords that did them owe had won in prosperous fights and happy frays. His shield they fixed on the bowl below, and there this distich under it, which says, This palm with stretched arms doth overspread the champion Dudon's glorious carcass dead. This work, performed with advisement good, Godfrey his carpenters and men of skill in all the camp sent to an aged wood, with convoy meet to guard them safe from ill. Within a valley deep this forest stood, to Christian eyes unseen, unknown, until a Syrian told the duke, who thither sent those chosen workmen that for timber went. And now the axe raged in the forest wild, the echo sighed in the groves unseen, the weeping nymphs fled from their bowers exiled. Down fell the shady tops of shaking treen. Down came the sacred palms, the ashes wild, the funeral cypress, holly evergreen, the weeping fir, thick beech, and sailing pine. The married elm fell with his fruitful vine. The shooter yew, the broad-leaved sycamore, the barren plantain, and the walnut sound, the myrrh that her foul sin doth still deplore, the alder, owner of all waterish ground, sweet juniper, whose shadow hurteth sore, proud cedar, oak, the king of forests crowned. Thus fell the trees, with noise the deserts roar, 
the beasts their caves, the birds their nests forlore. End of Book Three Book Four of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso Translated by Edward Fairfax This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland The Argument Satan, his fiends and sprites, assembleth all, and sends them forth to work the Christian's woe. False Hidriort, their aid from hell, doth call, and sends Armida to entrap his foe. She tells her birth, her fortune, and her fall, asks aid, allures, and wins the worthy so that they consent her enterprise to prove. She wins them with deceit, craft, beauty, love. While thus their work went on with lucky speed, and reared rams their horned fronts advance, the ancient foe to man and mortal seed his wannish eyes upon them bent askance. And when he saw their labors well succeed, he wept for rage, and threatened dire mischance. He choked his curses, to himself he spake, such noise wild bulls that softly bellow make. At last, Resolving in his damned thought to find some let to stop their warlike feet, he gave command his princes should be brought before the throne of his infernal seat. O oh, fool, as if it were a thing of naught, God to resist or change his purpose great, who on his foes doth thunder in his ire, whose arrows hailstones be and coals of fire. The dreary trumpet blew a dreadful blast, and rumbled through the lands and kingdoms under. Through wasteness wide it roared, and hollows vast, and filled the deep with horror, fear, and wonder. Not half so dreadful noise the tempests cast that fall from skies with storms of hail and thunder, not half so loud the whistling winds do sing, broke from the earthen prisons of their king. The peers of Pluto's realm assembled been amid the palace of their angry king in hideous forms and shapes to fore unseen that fear, death, terror, and amazement bring. With ugly paws some trample on the green, some gnaw the snakes that on their shoulders hing, and some their forked tails stretch forth on high and tear the twinkling stars from trembling sky. There were Silenus' foul and loathsome rout, there sphinxes, centaurs, there were gorgons fell, there howling skillas yawling round about, there serpents hiss, there seven-mouthed hydras yell, Chimera there spews fire and brimstone out, and Polyphemus blind supporteth hell. Besides, ten thousand monsters therein dwells, misshaped unlike themselves and like naught else. About their prince each took his wonted seat, On thrones red-hot he built a burning brass. Pluto in middest heaved his trident great Of rusty iron huge that forged was. The rocks on which the salt sea billows beat, And atlas tops the clouds in height that pass, Compared to his huge person, mole-hills be. So his rough front, his horn so lifted he. The tyrant proud frowned from his lofty cell, and with his looks made all his monsters tremble. His eyes, that full of rage and venom swell, two beacons seem that men to arms assemble. His feltered locks that on his bosom fell, on rugged mountains, briars, and thorns resemble. His yawning mouth that foamed clotted blood, gaped like a whirlpool wide in Stygian flood. And, as Mount Etna vomits sulphur out, with clifts of burning crags and fire and smoke, so from his mouth flew kindled coals about, hot sparks and smells that man and beast would choke. The gnarring porter durst not whine for doubt, still were the furies while their sovereign spoke, and swift Cocytus stayed his murmur shrill, while thus the murderer thundered out his will. Ye powers infernal, worthier far to sit about the sun, whence you your offspring take, with me that while on through the welkin flit, down tumbled headlong to this empty lake, our former glory still remember it, 
our bold attempts and war we once did make gainst him that rules above the starry sphere for which like traitors we lie damned here and now instead of clear and gladsome sky of titan's brightness that so glorious is in this deep darkness lo we helpless lie hopeless again to joy our former bliss and more which makes my griefs to multiply that sinful creature man elected is and in our place the heavens possess he must vile man begot of clay and born of dust nor this sufficed but that he also gave his only son his darling to be slain to conquer so hell death sin and the grave and man condemned to restore again he break our prisons and would all gates save the souls that here should dwell in woe and pain and now in heaven with him they live always with endless glory crowned and lasting praise but why recount i thus our passed harms remembrance fresh makes weakened sorrows strong expulsed were we with injurious arms from those due honors us of right belong but let us leave to speak of these alarms and bend our forces gainst our present wrong ah see you not how he attempted hath to bring all lands all nations to his faith then let us careless spend the day and night without regard what haps what comes or goes let asia subject be to christians might a prey be scion to her conquering foes let her adore again her christ aright who her before all nations whilom chose in brazen tables be his lore writ and let all tongues and lands acknowledge it so shall our sacred altars all be his our holy idols tumbled in the mould to him the wretched man that sinful is shall pray and offer incense myrrh and gold our temples shall their costly deckings miss with naked walls and pillars freezing cold tribute of souls shall end and our estate or pluto reign in kingdoms desolate oh be not then the courage perished clean that whilom dwelt within your haughty thought when armed with shining fire and weapons keen against the angels of proud heaven we fought i grant we fell on the phlegrian green yet good our cause was though our fortune not for chance assisteth oft the nobler part we lost the field yet lost we not our heart go then my strength my hope my spirits go these western rebels with your power withstand pluck up these weeds before they overgrow the gentle garden of the hebrews land quench out this spark before it kindles so that asia burn consumed with the brand use open force or secret guile unspied for craft is virtue against a foe defied among the knights and worthies of their train let some like outlaws wander uncouth ways let some be slain in field let some again make oracles of women's yeas and nays and pine in foolish love let some complain on godfrey's rule and mutinies against him raise turn each one's sword against his fellow's heart thus kill them all or spoil the greatest part before his words the tyrant ended had the lesser devils arose with ghastly roar and thronged forth about the world to gad each land they filled river stream and shore the goblins fairies fiends and furies mad ranged in flowery dales and mountains hoar and under every trembling leaf they sit between the solid earth and welkin flit about the world they spread forth far and wide filling the thoughts of each ungodly heart with secret mischief anger hate and pride wounding lost souls with sins empoisoned dart but say my muse recount whence first they tried to hurt the christian lords and from what part thou knowst of things performed so long agone this latter age hears little truth or none the town damascus and the lands about ruled hydraort a wizard grave and sage acquainted well with all the damned rout of pluto's reign even from his tender age 
Yet of this war he could not figure out the wished ending or success presage, for neither stars above nor powers of hell, nor skill, nor art, nor charm, nor devil could tell. And yet he thought, O vain conceit of man, which as thou wishest, judgest things to come, that the French host to sure destruction ran, condemned quite by heaven's eternal doom. He thinks no force withstand of anguish can the Egyptians' strength, and therefore would that some both of the prey and glory of the fight upon this Syrian folk would haply light. But for he held the Frenchman's worth in prize, and feared the doubtful gain of bloody war, he that was closely false and slyly wise, cast how he might annoy them most from far. And as he gan upon this point devise, as counsellors in ill still nearest are, at hand was Satan, ready ere men need, if once they think, to make them do the deed. He counselled him how best to hunt his game, what dart to cast, what net, what toil to pitch. A niece he had, a nice and tender dame, peerless in wit, in nature's blessings rich. To all deceit she could her beauty frame, false, fair, and young, a virgin, and a witch. To her he told the sum of this emprise, and praised her thus, for she was fair and wise. My dear, who underneath these locks of gold and native brightness of thy lovely hue hidest grave thoughts, ripe wit, and wisdom old, more skill than I in all mine arts untrue, to thee my purpose great I must unfold, this enterprise thy cunning must pursue. Weave thou to end this web which I begin, I will the distaff hold, come thou and spin. Go to the Christian's host, and there assay all subtle slights that women use in love. Shed brinish tears, sob, sigh, and treat, and pray. Wring thy fair hands, cast up thine eyes above, for morning beauty hath much power, men say, the stubborn hearts with pity frail to move. Look pale for dread, and blush sometime for shame. In seeming truth thy lies will soonest frame. Take with the bait, Lord Godfrey, if thou mayst, frame snares of looks, strains of alluring speech, for if he love, the conquest then thou hast. Thus purposed war thou mayst with ease impeach, else lead the other lords to deserts waste, and hold them slaves far from their leader's reach. Thus taught he her, and for conclusion saith, all things are lawful for our lands and faith. The sweet Armida took this charge on hand, a tender piece for beauty, sex, and age. The sun was sunken underneath the land when she began her wanton pilgrimage. In silken weeds she trusteth to withstand and conquer knights in warlike equipage. Of their night-ambling dame the Syrians prated, some good, some bad, as they her loved or hated. Within few days the nymph arrived there, where puissant Godfrey had his tents apite. Upon her strange attire and visage clear gazed each soldier, gazed every night. As when a comet doth in skies appear, the people stand amazed at the light. So wondered they, and each at other sought what Mr. White she was, and whence he brought. Yet never I to Cupid's service vowed Beheld a face of such a lovely pride. A tinsel veil her amber locks did shroud That strove to cover what it could not hide. The golden sun behind a silver cloud So streameth out his beams on every side. The marble goddess set at Nidos naked, She seemed, were she unclothed, Or that awaked. The gamesome wind among her tresses plays, And curleth up those glowing riches short. Her spareful eye to spread his beams denays, But keeps his shot where Cupid keeps his fort. The rose and lily on her cheek Essays to paint true fairness out in bravest sort. Her lips, where blooms not but the single rose, Still blush, for still they kiss, while still they close. Her breasts, 
two hills o'erspread with purest snow sweet smooth and supple soft and gently swelling between them lies a milken dale below where love youth gladness whiteness make their dwelling her breasts half hid and half were laid to show her envious vesture greedy sight repelling so was the wanton clad as if thus much should please the eye the rest unseen the touch as when the sunbeams dive through tagus wave to spy the storehouse of his springing gold love piercing thought so through her mantle drave and in her gentle bosom wandered bold it viewed the wondrous beauty virgins have and all to fond desire with vantage told alas what hope is left to quench his fire that kindled is by sight blown by desire thus passed she praised wished and wondered at among the troops who there encamped lay she smiled for joy but well dissembled that her greedy eye chose out her wished prey on all her gestures seeming virtue sat toward the imperial tent she asked the way with that she met a bold and lovesome knight lord godfrey's youngest brother eustace hight this was the fowl that first fell in the snare he saw her fair and hoped to find her kind the throne of cupid had an easy stare his bark is fit to sail with every wind the breach he makes no wisdom can repair with reverence meet the barren low inclined and thus his purpose to the virgin told for youth use nature all had made him bold lady if thee beseem a style so low in whose sweet looks such sacred beauties shine for never yet did heaven such grace bestow on any daughter born of adam's line thy name let us though far and worthy know unfold thy will and whence thou art in fine lest my audacious boldness learn too late what honors due become thy high estate sir knight quoth she your praises reach too high above her merit you commend and so a hapless maid i am both born to die and dead to joy that live in care and woe a virgin helpless fugitive pardee my native soil and kingdom thus forego to seek duke godfrey's aid such store men tell a virtuous ruth doth in his bosom dwell conduct me then that mighty duke before if you be courteous sir as well you seem content quoth he since of one womb I bore we brothers are your fortune good esteemed encounter me whose word prevaileth more in godfrey's hearing than you haply deem mine aid i grant and his i promise too all that his sceptre or my sword can do he led her easily forth when this was said where godfrey sat among his lords and peers she reverence did then blushed as one dismayed to speak for secret wants and inward fears it seemed a bashful shame her speeches stayed at last the courteous duke her gently cheers silence was made and she began her tale they sit to hear thus sung this nightingale victorious prince whose honorable name is held so great among our pagan kings that to those lands thou dost by conquest tame that thou hast won them some content it brings well known to all as thy immortal fame the earth thy worth thy foe thy praises sings and paynims wronged come to seek thine aid so doth thy virtue so thy power persuade and i though bred in macon's heathenish lore which thou oppressest with thy puissant might yet trust thou wilt an helpless maid restore and repossess her in her father's right others in their distress do aid implore of kin and friends but i in this sad plight invoke thy help my kingdom to invade so doth thy virtue so my need persuade in thee i hope thy succors i invoke to win the crown whence i am dispossessed for like renown awaiteth on the stroke to cast the haughty down or raise the pressed 
nor greater glory brings a scepter broke than doth deliverance of a maid distressed. And since thou canst at will perform the thing, more is thy praise to make than kill a king. But if thou wouldst thy succors due excuse, because in Christ I have no hope nor trust, ah, yet for virtue's sake thy virtue use, who scorneth gold because it lies in dust? Be witness, heaven, if thou to grant refuse, thou dost forsake a maid in cause most just, and for thou shalt at large my fortunes know, I will my wrongs and their great treasons show. Prince Arbilan, that reigned in his life on fair Damascus, was my noble sire. Born of mean race he was, yet got to wife the queen Cariclea, such was the fire of her hot love. But soon the fatal knife had cut the thread that kept their joys entire, for so mishap her cruel lot had cast, my birth, her death, my first day was her last. And ere five years were fully come and gone, since his dear spouse to hasty death did yield, my father also died, consumed with moan, and sought his love amid the Lysian field. His crown and me, poor orphan, left alone. Mine uncle governed in my tender eeld, for well he thought, if mortal men have faith, in brother's breast true love his mansion hath. He took the charge of me and of the crown, and with kind shows of love so brought to pass, that through Damascus great report was blown how good, how just, how kind mine uncle was. Whether he kept his wicked hate unknown, and hid the serpent in the flowering grass, or that true faith did in his bosom won, because he meant to match me with his son which son within short while did undertake degree of knighthood, as beseemed him well, yet never durst he for his lady's sake break sword or lance, advanced in lofty cell. As fair he was, as Cytherea's make, as proud as he that signorizeth hell, in fashions wayward and in love unkind, for Cupid deigns not wound a currish mind. This paragon should Queen Armida wed, a goodly swain to be a princess fear, a lovely partner of a lady's bed, a noble head, a golden crown to wear. His glozing sire his errand daily said, and sugared speeches whispered in mine ear, to make me take this darling in mine arms. But still the adder stopped her ears from charms. At last he left me with a troubled grace, through which transparent was his inward spite, Methought I read the story in his face of these mishaps that on me since have light. Since that, foul spirits haunt my resting place, and ghastly visions break my sleep at night. Grief, horror, fear, my fainting soul did kill, for so my mind foreshowed my coming ill. Three times the shape of my dear mother came, pale, sad, dismayed, to warn me in my dream. Alas! How far transformed from the same whose eyes shone erst like Titan's glorious beam. Daughter, she says, fly, fly, behold thy dame, for shows the treasons of thy wretched eam, who poison gainst thy harmless life provides. This said, to shapeless air unseen she glides. But what avail high walls or bulwarks strong, where fainting cowards have the peace to guard? My sex too weak, mine age was all too young to undertake alone a work so hard, to wander wild, the desert woods among, a banished maid of wanted ease debarred. So grievous seemed that liefer were my death, and there to expire where first I drew my breath. I fear a deadly evil, if long I stayed, and yet to fly had neither will nor power, nor durst my heart declare it waxed afraid, lest so I hasten might my dying hour. Thus restless waited I, unhappy maid, what hand should first pluck up my springing flower? Even as the wretch condemned to lose his life awaits the falling of the murdering knife. In these extremes, for so my fortune would perchance preserve me to my further ill, one of my noble father's servants old, that for his goodness bore his child good will, with store of tears this treason gan unfold, and said, My guardian would his pupil kill, and that himself, if promise made he kept, should give me poison dire, ere next I slept. 
and further told me if I wished to live, I must convey myself by secret flight, and offered then all succors he could give to aid his mistress, banished from her right. His words of comfort, fear to exile drive. The dread of death made lesser dangers light. So we concluded, when the shadows dim obscured the earth, I should depart with him. Of close escapes the aged patroness, blacker than erst her sable mantle spread, when with two trusty maids in great distress, both from mine uncle and my realm I fled. Oft looked I back, but hardly could suppress those streams of tears mine eyes incessant shed, for when I looked on my kingdom lost, it was a grief, a death, and hell almost. My steeds drew on the burden of my limbs, but still my looks, my thoughts, drew back as fast. So fare the men that from the heaven's brims far out to sea by sudden storm are cast. Swift o'er the grass the rolling chariot swims, through ways unknown, all night, all day we haste. At last, nigh tired, a castle strong we fanned, the utmost border of my native land. The fort Arontes was, for so the night was called that my deliverance thus had wrought. But when the tyrant saw by mature flight I had escaped the treasons of his thought, the rage increased in the cursed wight gainst me and him that me to safety brought, and us accused, we would have poisoned him, but descried to save our lives we fled. And that, in lieu of his approved truth, to poison him I hired had my guide, that he dispatched mine unbridled youth might range at will in no subjection tied and that each night i slept o oh foul untruth mine honor lost by this arontes side but heaven i pray send down revenging fire when so base love shall change my chaste desire not that he sitteth on my regal throne nor that he thirst to drink my lukewarm blood so grieveth me as this despite alone that my renown which ever blameless stood hath lost the light wherewith it always shone with forged lies he makes his tale so good and holds my subjects hearts in such suspense that none take armor for their queen's defense and though he doth my regal throne possess, clothed in purple, crowned with burnished gold, yet is his hate, his rancor, ne'er the less, since naught assuageth malice when tis old. He threats to burn Arontes' fortress, and murder him unless he yield the hold, and me and mine threats not with war but death. Thus causeless hatred endless is uneath. And so he trusts to wash away the stain, And hide his shameful fact with mine offense, And saith he will restore the throne again To his late honor and due excellence, And therefore would I should be all gates slain, For while I live his right is in suspense. This is the cause my guiltless life is sought, For on my ruin is his safety wrought. And let the tyrant have his heart's desire, Let him perform the cruelty he meant, My guiltless blood must quench the ceaseless fire, On which my endless tears were bootless spent, Unless thou help. To thee, renowned sire, I fly, A virgin, orphan, innocent, And let these tears that on thy feet distill Redeem the drops of blood he thirsts to spill. By these thy glorious feet that tread secure on necks of tyrants, By thy conquests brave, by that right hand, And by those temples pure thou seek'st to free from Macon's lore, I crave help for this sickness, none but thou canst cure. My life and kingdom let thy mercy save from death and ruin, But in vain I prove thee if right, if truth, if justice cannot move thee. Thou who dost all thou wishest at thy will, And never willest aught but what is right, Preserve this guiltless blood they seek to spill. Thine be my kingdom, save it with thy might. Among these captains, lords, and knights of skill, Appoint me ten approved most in fight, Who with assistance of my friends and kin May serve my kingdom lost again to win. For lo, a knight that hath a gate to ward, a man of chiefest trust about his king, hath promised so to beguile the guard that me and mine he undertakes to bring safe 
where the tyrant haply sleepeth hard. He counseled me to undertake this thing, of these some little succor to entreat, whose name alone accomplish can the feat. This said, his answer did the nymph attend. Her looks, her sighs, her gestures all did pray him. But Godfrey wisely did his grant suspend. He doubts the worst, and that a while did stay him. He knows who fears no god, he loves no friend. He fears the heathen false would thus betray him. But yet such ruth dwelt in his princely mind, that gainst his wisdom pity made him kind. Besides the kindness of his gentle thought, ready to comfort each distressed wight, the maiden's offer profit with it brought. For if the Syrian kingdom were her right, that one the way were easy which he sought, to bring all Asia subject to his might. There might he raise munition, arms, and treasure, to work the Egyptian king and his displeasure. Thus was his noble heart long time betwixt fear and remorse, not granting nor denying. Upon his eyes the dame her lookings fixed, as if her life and death lay on his saying. Some tears, she said, with sighs and sobbings mixed, as if her hopes were dead through his delaying. At last her earnest suit the duke denied, but with sweet words thus would content the maid. If not in service of our God we fought, in meaner quarrel if this sword were shaken, well might thou gather in thy gentle thought, so fair a princess should not be forsaken. But since these armies from the world's end brought to free this sacred town have undertaken, it were unfit we turned our strength away, and victory, even in her coming, stay. I promise thee, and on my princely word the burden of thy wish and hope repose, that when this chosen temple of the Lord her holy doors shall to his saints unclose in rest and peace, then this victorious sword shall execute due vengeance on thy foes. But if for pity of a worldly dame I left this work, such pity were my shame. At this the princess bent her eyes to ground, and stood unmoved, though not unmarked, the space. The secret bleeding of her inward wound shed heavenly dew upon her angel's face. Poor wretch, quoth she, in tears and sorrows drowned. Death be thy peace, the grave thy resting place, since such thy hap, that lest thou mercy find, the gentlest heart on earth is proved unkind. Where none attends, what boots it to complain? Men's froward hearts are moved with women's tears, as marble stones are pierced with drops of rain. No plaints find passage through unwilling ears. The tyrant haply would his wrath restrain, heard he these prayers ruthless Godfrey hears. Yet not thy fault is this. My chance I see hath made even pity pitiless in thee. So both thy goodness and good hap denied me, grief, sorrow, mischief, care hath overthrown me. The star that ruled my birthday hath betrayed me. My genius sees his charge, but dares not own me. Of queen-like state my flight hath disarrayed me, my father died ere he five years had known me, my kingdom lost, and lastly resteth now, down with the tree sith broke is every bough. And for the modest lore of maidenhood bids me not sojourn with these armed men, oh, whither shall I fly? What secret wood shall hide me from the tyrant? Or what den, what rock, what vault, what cave can do me good? No, no, where death is sure, it resteth then to scorn his power. And be it therefore seen, Armida lived and died both like a queen. With that she looked as if a proud disdain kindled displeasure in her noble mind. The way she came, she turned her steps again, with gesture sad but in disdainful kind. A tempest railed down her cheeks amain with tears of woe and sighs of anger's wind. The drops her footsteps wash whereon she treads, and seems to step on pearls or crystal beads. 
her cheeks on which this streaming nectar fell still through the limbeck of her diamond eyes the roses white and red resembled well whereon the rory made you sprinkled lies when the fair morn first blusheth from her cell and breatheth balm from opened paradise thus sighed thus mourned thus wept this lovely queen and in each drop bathed a grace unseen thrice twenty cupids unperceived flew to gather up this liquor ere it fall and of each drop an arrow forged new else as it came snatched up the crystal ball and at rebellious hearts for wildfire threw o wondrous love thou makest gain of all for if she weeping sit or smiling stand she bends thy bow or kindleth else thy brand this forged plaint drew forth unfeigned tears from many eyes and pierced each worthy's heart each one condoleth with her that her hears and of her grief would help her bear the smart if godfrey aid her not not one but swears some tigress gave him suck on roughest part midst the rude crags on alpine cliffs aloft hard is that heart which beauty makes not soft but jolly eustace in whose breast the brand of love and pity kindled had the flame while others softly whispered under hand before the duke with comely boldness came brother and lord quoth he too long you stand in your first purpose yet vouchsafe to frame your thoughts to ours and lend this virgin aid thanks are half lost when good turns are delayed and think not that eustace's talk essays to turn these forces from this present war or that i wish you should your armies raise from sion's walls my speech tends not so far but we that venture all for fame and praise that to no charge nor service bounden are forth of our troop may ten well spared be to succor her which naught can weaken thee and know they shall in god's high service fight that virgins innocent save and defend dear will the spoils be in the heaven's sight that from a tyrant's hateful head we rend nor seem i forward in this lady's right with hope of gain or profit in the end but for i know he arms unworthy bears to help a maiden's cause that shuns or fears ah be it not for thee declared in france or elsewhere told where curtsy is in prize that we forsook so fair a chevisance for doubt or fear that might from fight arise else here surrender i both sword and lance and swear no more to use this martial guise for ill deserves he to be termed a knight that bears a blunt sword in a lady's right thus parled he and with confused sound the rest approved what the gallant said their general the knights encompassed round with humble grace and earnest suit they prayed i yield quoth he and be it happy found that i have granted let her have your aid yours be the thanks for yours the danger is if aught succeed and much i fear amiss but if with you my words may credit find o oh, temper then this heat misguides you so thus much he said but they with fancy blind accept his grant and let his counsel go what works not beauty man's relenting mind is eath to move with plaints and shows of woe her lips cast forth a chain of sugared words that captive led most of the christian lords eustace recalled her and bespake her thus beauty's chief darling let these sorrows be for such assistance shall you find in us as with your need or will may best agree with that she cheered her forehead dolorous and smiled for joy that phoebus blushed to see and had she deigned her veil for to remove the god himself once more had fallen in love with that she broke the silence once again and gave the knight great thanks in little speech she said she would his handmaid poor remain so far as honour's laws received no breach her humble gestures made the residue plain dumb eloquence persuading more than speech 
thus women know and thus they use the guise to enchant the valiant and beguile the wise and when she saw her enterprise had got some wished mean of quick and good proceeding she thought to strike the iron that was hot for every action hath its hour of speeding medea or false kirke changed not so far the shapes of men as her eyes spreading altered their hearts and with her siren sound in lust their minds their hearts in love she drowned all wily slights that subtle women know hourly she used to catch some lover new none ken the bent of her unsteadfast bow for with the time her thoughts her looks renew from some she cast her modest eyes below at some her gazing glances roving flew and while she thus pursued her wanton sport she spurred the slow and reined the forward short if some as hopeless that she would be won forbore to love because they durst not move her on them her gentle looks to smile begun as who say she is kind if you dare prove her on every heart thus shone this lustful sun all strove to serve to please to woo to love her and in their hearts that chaste and bashful were her eyes hot glance dissolved the frost of fear on them who durst with fingering bold essay to touch the softness of her tender skin she looked as coy as if she list not play and made as things of worth were hard to win yet tempered so her daneful looks alway that outward scorn showed store of grace within thus with false hope their longing hearts she fired for hardest gotten things are most desired alone sometimes she walked in secret where to ruminate upon her discontent within her eyelids sate the swelling tear not pour it forth though sprung from sad lament and with this craft a thousand souls well near in snares of foolish ruth and love she hent and kept as slaves by which we fitly prove that witless pity breedeth fruitless love sometimes as if her hope unloosed had the chains of grief wherein her thoughts lay fettered upon her minions looked she blithe and glad in that deceitful lore so was she lettered not glorious titan in his brightness clad the sunshine of her face in lustre bettered for when she list to cheer her beauty so she smiled away the clouds of grief and woe her double charm of smiles and sugared words lulled on sleep the virtue of their senses reason small aid gainst those assaults affords wisdom no warrant from those sweet offences cupid's deep rivers have their shallow forts his griefs bring joys his losses recompenses he breeds the sore and cures us of the pain achilles lance that wounds and heals again while thus she them torments twixt frost and fire twixt joy and grief twixt hope and restless fear the sly enchantress felt her gain the nigher these were her flocks that golden fleeces bear but if some one durst utter his desire and by complaining make his griefs appear he labored hard rocks with plaints to move she had not learned the gamut then of love for down she bent her bashful eyes to ground and donned the weeds of women's modest grace down from her eyes welled the pearl is round upon the bright enamel of her face such honey drops on springing flowers are found when phoebus holds the crimson morn in chase full seemed her looks of anger and of shame yet pity shone transparent through the same if she perceived by his outward cheer that any would his love by talk bewray sometimes she heard him sometimes stopped her ear and played fast and loose the livelong day thus all her lovers kind deluded were their earnest suit got neither yea nor nay but like the sort of weary huntsman fair that hunt all day and lose at night the hare these were the arts by which she kept of it a thousand souls of young and lusty knights these were the arms 
where with love conquered their feeble hearts subdued in wanton fights what wonder if achilles were misled or great alcides at their lady's sights since these true champions of the lord above were thralls to beauty yielding slaves to love end of book four Book Five of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso, translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The argument: Gernando scorns Rinaldo should aspire to rule that charge for which he seeks and strives, and slanders him so far that in his ire the wronged knight his foe of life deprives. Far from the camp the slayer doth retire, Nor lets himself be bound in chains or jives. Armide departs content, And from the seas Godfrey hears news Which him and his displease. While thus Armida false, The knights misled in wandering errors Of deceitful love, And thought, besides the champions promised, The other lordings in her aid to move, In Godfrey's thought a strong contention bred Who fittest were this hazard great to prove. For all the worthies of that venturous band Were like in birth, in power, in strength of hand. But first the prince, by grave advice, Decreed they should some knight choose at their own election That in his charge Lord Dudon might succeed, And of that glorious troop should take protection. So none should grieve, displeased with the deed, Nor blame the causer of their new subjection. Besides, Godfredo showed by this device How much he held that regiment in price. He called the worthies then, and spake them so. Lordings, you know I yielded to your will, And gave you license with this dame to go, To win her kingdom, and that tyrant kill. But now again I let you further know, In following her it may betide you ill. Refrain therefore, and change this forward thought. For death unsent for, danger comes unsought. But if to shun these perils, sought so far, May seem disgraceful to the place you hold, If grave advice and prudent counsel Are esteemed detractors from your courage bold, Then know I none against his will debar, Nor what I granted erst I now withhold. But be mine empire as it ought of right, Sweet, easy, pleasant, gentle, meek, and light. Go then or tarry, each as likes him best, Free power I grant you on this enterprise, but first, in Dudon's place, now laid in chest, Choose you some other captain, stout and wise, Then ten appoint among the worthiest. But let no more attempt this hard emprise. In this my will content you that I have, For power constrained is but a glorious slave. Thus Godfrey said, and thus his brother spake, And answered for himself and all his peers, My lord, as well it fitteth thee to make these wise delays and cast these doubts and fears, so tis our part at first to undertake. Courage and haste beseem our might and years, and this proceeding with so grave advice, wisdom in you, in us were cowardice. Since then the feat is easy, danger none, all set in battle and in hardy fight, do thou permit the chosen ten to gone and aid the damsel? Thus devised the knight, to make men think the sun of honor shone there where the lamp of Cupid gave the light. The rest perceive his guile, and it approve, and call that knighthood which was childish love. But loving Eustace, that with jealous eye beheld the worth of Sophia's noble child, and his fair shape did secretly envy, besides the virtues in his breast compiled, and for in love he would no company, he stored his mouth with speeches smoothly filed, drawing his rival to attend his word. Thus, with fair slight, he laid the knight aboard. Of great Bertoldo thou, far greater heir, thou star of knighthood, flower of chivalry, tell me, who now shall lead this squadron fair, since our late guide in marble cold doth lie? I, that with famous student, might compare in all but years whorelocks and gravity, to whom should I Duke Godfrey's brother yield unless to thee?
the Christian army's shield. Thee, whom high birth makes equal with the best, thine acts prefer both me and all beforn, nor that in fight thou both surpass the rest and Godfrey's worthy self I hold in scorn. Thee to obey, then, am I only pressed. Before these worthies be thine eagle born. This honor haply thou esteemest light, whose day of glory never yet found night. Yet mayst thou further by this means display the spreading wings of thy immortal fame. I will procure it, if thou sayst not nay, and all their wills to thine election frame. But for I scantly am resolved which way to bend my force, or where employ the same, leave me, I pray, at my discretion free to help Armida, or serve here with thee. This last request, for love is evil to hide, empurpled both his cheeks with scarlet red. Rinaldo soon his passions had descried, and, gently smiling, turned aside his head. And for weak Cupid was too feeble-eyed to strike him sure, the fire in him was dead. So that of rivals was he not afraid, nor cared he for the journey or the maid. But in his noble thought revolved he oft Duden's high prowess, death and burial and how Argantes bore his plumes aloft, praising his fortunes for that worthy's fall. Besides, the knight's sweet words and praises soft, to his due honor did him fitly call, and made his heart rejoice, for well he knew, though much he praised him, all his words were true. Degrees, quoth he, of honors high to hold, I would them first deserve, and then desire. And were my valor such as you have told, would I for that to higher place aspire? But if to honor's due raise me you would, I will not of my works refuse the hire. And much it glads me that my power and might appraise it is by such a valiant knight. I neither seek it nor refuse the place, which if I get the praise and thanks be thine. Eustace, this spoken, hired thence apace to know which way his fellow's hearts incline. But Prince Gernando coveted the place, whom, though Armida sought to undermine, gainst him yet vain did all her engines prove. His pride was such, there was no place for love. Gernando was the king of Norway's son, that many a realm and region had to guide, and for his elders lands and crowns had won. His heart was puffed up with endless pride. The other boasts more what himself had done than all his ancestors' great acts beside. Yet his forefathers old before him were famous in war and peace five hundred year. This barbarous prince, who only vainly thought that bliss in wealth and kingly power doth lie, and in respect esteemed all virtue not, unless it were adorned with titles high, could not endure that to the place he sought a simple knight should dare to press so nigh, and in his breast so boiled fell despite that ire and wrath exiled reason quite. The hidden devil that lies in close await to win the forth of unbelieving man found entry there where ire undid the gate, and in his bosom unperceived ran. It filled his heart with malice, strife, and hate, it made him rage, blaspheme, swear, curse, and ban. Invisible it still attends him near, And thus each minute whispereth in his ear, What? Shall Rinaldo match thee? Dares he tell those idle names of his vain pedigree? Then let him say, if thee he would excel, What lands, what realms his tributaries be, If his forefathers in the graves that dwell Were honored like thine that live? Let's see. Oh, how dares one so mean aspire so high, born in that servile country Italy? Now, if he win, or if he lose the day, yet is his praise and glory hence derived. For that the world will to his credit say, Lo, this is he that with Gernando strived. The charge, some deal, thee haply honor may, that noble Duden had while here he lived, but laid on him, he would the office shame. Let it suffice, he durst desire the same. If when this breath from man's frail body flies, The soul take keep, or know the things done here, Oh, how looks Duden from the glorious skies! What wrath, what anger in his face appear! 
on this proud youngling while he bends his eyes marking how high he doth his feathers rear seeing his rash attempt how soon he dare though but a boy with his great worth compare he dares not only but he strives and proves her chastisement were fit there wins he praise one counsels him his speech him forward moves another fool approveth all he says if godfrey favor him more than behooves why then he wrongeth thee an hundred ways nor let thy state so far disgraced be now what thou art and canst let godfrey see with such false words the kindled fire began to every vein his poisoned heat to reach it swelled his scornful heart and forth it ran at his proud looks and too audacious speech all that he thought blameworthy in the man to his disgrace that would he each way a preach he termed him proud and vain his worth in fight he called fool hard ice rashness madness right all that in him was rare or excellent all that was good all that was princely found with such sharp words as malice could invent he blamed such power has wicked tongue to wound the youth for everywhere those rumors went of these reproaches heard sometimes the sound nor did for that his tongue the fault amend until it brought him to his woeful end the cursed fiend that set his tongue at large still bred more fancies in his idle brain his heart with slanders new did overcharge and soothed him still in his angry vein amid the camp a place was broad and large where one fair regiment might easily train and there in tilt and harmless tournament their days of rest the youths and gallants spent there as his fortune would it should betide amid the press gernando gan retired to vomit out his venom unespied wherewith foul envy did his heart inspire rinaldo heard him as he stood beside and as he could not bridle wrath and ire thou liest cried he aloud and with that word about his head he tossed his flaming sword thunder his voice and lightning seemed his brand so fell his look and furious was his cheer gernando trembled for he saw at hand pale death and neither help nor comfort near yet for the soldiers all to witness stand he made proud sign as though he naught did fear but bravely drew his little helping blade and valiant show of strong resistance made with that a thousand blades of burnished steel glistered on heaps like flames of fire in sight hundreds that knew not yet the quarrel wheel ran thither some to gaze and some to fight the empty air a sound confused did feel of murmurs low and outcries loud on height like rolling waves and boreous angry blasts when roaring seas against the rocks he casts but not for this the wronged warrior stayed his just displeasure and incensed ire he cared not what the vulgar did or said to vengeance did his courage fierce aspire among the thickest weapons way he made his thundering sword made all on heaps retire so that of near a thousand stayed not one but prince gernando bore the brunt alone his hand too quick to execute his wrath performed all as pleased his eye and heart at head and breast oft times he struck and hath now at the right now at the other part on every side thus did he harm and scath and oft beguiled his sight with nimble art that no defence the prince of wounds acquits where least he thinks or fears there most he hits nor ceased he till in gernando's breast he sheathed once or twice his furious blade down fell the hapless prince with death oppressed a double way to his weak soul was made his bloody sword the victor wiped and dressed nor longer by the slaughtered body stayed but sped him thence and soon appeased hath his hate his ire his rancor and his wrath called by the tumult godfrey drew him near and there beheld a sad and rueful sight the signs of death upon his face appear with dust and blood his locks were loathly dight sighs and complaints on each side might he hear made for the sudden death of that great knight amazed he asked who durst and did so much for yet he knew not whom the fault would touch 
Arnaldo, minion of the prince thus slain, augments the fault in telling it, and saith, This prince is murdered for a quarrel vain by young Rinaldo in his desperate wrath, and with that sword that should Christ's law maintain, one of Christ's champions bold he killed hath. And this he did in such a place and hour, as if he scorned your rule, despised your power. And further adds that he deserved death by law, and law should be inviolate. That none offense could greater be aneath, and yet the place the fault did aggravate. If he escaped, that mischief would take breath, and flourish bold in spite of rule and state, and that Jornando's friends would venge the wrong, although to justice that should first belong. And by that means, should discord, hate, and strife raise mutinies, and what thereof ensueth. Lastly, he praised the dead, and still had rife all words he thought could vengeance move or ruth. Against him Tancred argued for life, with honest reasons to excuse the youth. The duke heard all, but with such sober cheer as banished hope, and still increased fear. Grave prince, quoth Tancred, set before thine eyes Rinaldo's worth and courage, what it is, how much our hope of conquest in him lies. Regard that princely house and race of his, he that correcteth every fault he spies, and judgeth all alike doth all amiss. For faults you know are greater thought or less, as is the person's self that doth transgress. Godfredo answered him, If high and low of sovereign power alike should feel the stroke, then, Tancred, ill you counsel us, I trow. If lords should know no law, as erst you spoke, how vile and base our empire were you know. If none but slaves and peasants bear the yoke, Weak is the sceptre, and the power is small, that such provisos bring the next withal. But mine was freely given ere it was sought, nor that it lessened be I now consent. Right well know I both when and where I ought to give condign reward and punishment. Since you are all in like subjection brought, both high and low, obey, and be content. This heard, Tancredi wisely stayed his words such weight the sayings have of kings and lords. Old Raymond praised this speech, for old men think they ever wisest seem when most severe. Tis best, quoth he, to make these great ones shrink. The people love him whom the nobles fear. There must the rule to all disorders sink, where pardons more than punishments appear. For feeble is each kingdom, frail and weak, unless his basis be this fear I speak. These words Tancredi heard and pondered well, and by them wist how Godfrey's thoughts were bent. Nor list he longer with these old men dwell, but turned his horse and to Rinaldo went, who when his noble foe death wounded fell, withdrew him softly to his gorgeous tent. There Tancred found him, and at large declared the words and speeches sharp which late you heard, and said, Although I wot the outward show is not true witness of the secret thought, for that some men so subtle are, I trow that when they purpose most appeareth not. Yet dare I say Godfredo means I know such knowledge hath his looks and speeches wrought, you shall first prisoner be, and then be tried, as he shall deem it good, and law provide. With that, a bitter smile, well might you see Rinaldo cast, with scorn and high disdain. Let them in fetters plead their cause, quoth he, that are base peasants, born of servile stain. I was free-born, I live and will die free, before these feet be fettered in a chain. These hands were made to shake sharp spears and swords, not to be tied in jives and twisted cords. If my good service reap this recompense, to be clapped up in close and secret mew, and as a thief be after dragged from thence to suffer punishment as law finds due, let Godfrey come or send, I will not hence, until we know who shall this bargain rue. That of our tragedy, the late done fact, may be the first, and this the second act. Give me mine arms, he cried, his squire them brings, and clad his head. And dressed in iron strong, about his neck his silver shield he flings. Down by his side a cutting sword there hung. Among this earth's brave lords and mighty kings was none so stout, so fierce, so fair, so young, 
God Mars he seemed descending from his sphere, Or one whose looks could make great Mars to fear. Tancredi labored with some pleasing speech, His spirits fierce and courage to appease. Young prince, thy valor, thus he gan to preach, Can chastise all that do thee wrong at ease. I know your virtue can your enemies teach, That you can venge you when and where you please, but God forbid this day you lift your arm To do this camp and us, your friends, such harm. Tell me, what will you do? Why would you stain your noble hands In our unguilty blood? By wounding Christians will you again pierce Christ, Whose parts they are and members good? Will you destroy us for your glory vain? Unstayed as rolling waves in ocean flood, Far be it from you so to prove your strength, but let your zeal appease your rage at length. For God's love, stay your heat and just displeasure, appease your wrath, your courage fierce assuage. Patience a praise, forbearance is a treasure, sufferance an angel is, a monster rage. At least your actions by example measure, and think how I in mine unbridled age was wronged. Yet I know revengement take on all this camp, for one offender's sake. Cilicia conquered I, as all men wot, And there the glorious cross on high I reared. But Baldwin came, and what I nobly got Bereft me falsely when I least him feared. He seemed my friend, and I discovered not His secret covetous, which since appeared. Yet strive I not to get mine own by fight Or civil war, although perchance I might. If then you scorn to be in prison pent, If bonds, as high disgrace, your hands refuse, Or if your thoughts still to maintain Are bent your liberty, as men of honor use, To Antioch, what if forthwith you went, And leave me here your absence to excuse? There with Prince Bohemond live in ease and peace Until this storm of Godfrey's anger cease. For soon, if forces come from Egypt land, Or other nations that us here confine, Godfrey will beaten be with his own wand, And feel he wants that valor great of thine. Our camp may seem an arm without a hand, Amid our troops, unless thy eagle shine. With that came Guelpho, and those words approved, And prayed him go, if him he feared or loved. Their speeches soften much the warrior's heart, And make his willful thoughts at last relent, So that he yields, and saith he will depart, And leave the Christian camp incontinent. His friends, whose love did never shrink or start, Proffered their aid, what way soe'er he went. He thanked them all, but left them all, Besides two bold and trusty squires, And so he rides. He rides, revolving in his noble sprite Such haughty thoughts as fill the glorious mind. On hard adventures was his whole delight, And now to wondrous acts his will inclined. Alone against the pagans would he fight, And kill their kings from Egypt unto Ind. From Cynthia's hills and Nilus unknown spring He would fetch praise and glorious conquest bring. But Guelpho, when the prince his leave had take, And now had spurred his courser on his way, No longer tarriance with the rest would make, But hastes to find Godfredo if he may. Who, seeing him approaching, forthwith spake, Guelpho, quoth he, for thee I only stay, For thee I sent my heralds all about In every tent to seek and find thee out. This said, he softly drew the knight aside Where none might hear, and then bespake him thus, How chanceth it thy nephew's rage and pride Makes him so far forget himself and us? Hardly could I believe what is betide, A murder done for cause so frivolous. How I have loved him, thou and all can tell, But Godfrey loved him, but whilst he did well. I must provide that every one have right, That all be heard, each cause be well discussed, As far from partial love, as free from spite, I hear complaints, yet not but proofs I trust. Now if Rinaldo weigh our rule too light, And have the sacred lore of war so brust, Take you the charge that he before us come, To clear himself and hear our upright doom. But let him come without an bond or chain, For still my thoughts to do him grace are framed. But if our power he haply shall disdain, As well I know his courage yet untamed, To bring him by persuasion take some pain, Else 
if I prove severe, both you be blamed that forced my gentle nature gainst my thought to rigor, lest our laws return to naught. Lord Welfo answered thus, What heart can bear such slanders false, devised by hate and spite, or with staid patience reproaches here, and not revenge by battle or by fight? The Norway prince hath bought his folly dear, but who with words could stay the angry knight? A fool is he that comes to preach or prate when men with swords their right and wrong debate. And where you wish he should himself submit to hear the censure of your upright laws, alas, that cannot be, for he is flit out of this camp without an stay or pause. There, take my gage. Behold, I offer it to him that first accused him in this cause, or any else that dare and will maintain that for his pride the prince was justly slain. I say with reason, Lord Gernando's pride he hath abated. If he have offended against your commands, who are his lord and guide, oh, harden him, that fault shall be amended. If he be gone, quoth Godfrey, let him ride and brawl elsewhere. Here let all strife be ended, and you, Lord Guelpho, for your nephew's sake, breed us no new, no quarrels old awake. This while the fair and false Armida strived to get her promised aid in sure possession. The day to end with endless plaint she drived, wit, beauty, craft, for her made intercession. But when the earth was once of light deprived, and western seas felt Titan's hot impression, Twixt two old knights and matrons twain she went, Where pitched was her fair and curious tent. But this false queen of craft and sly invention, Whose looks love's arrows were, Whose eyes his quivers, Whose beauty matchless, free from reprehension, A wonder left by heaven to after livers. Among the Christian lords had bred contention, Who first should quench his flames in Cupid's rivers. While all her weapons and her darts rehearsed, Had not Godfredo's constant bosom pierced. To change his modest thought the dame procureth, And proffereth heaps of love's enticing treasure. But as the falcon newly gorged, Endureth her keeper lure her oft, But comes at leisure. So he, whom fullness of delight assureth, What long repentance comes of love's short pleasure, Her crafts, her arts, herself, and all despiseth, so base affections fall when virtue riseth. And not one foot his steadfast foot was moved, out of that heavenly path wherein he paced, yet thousand wiles and thousand ways she proved to have that castle fair of goodness raised. She used those looks and smiles that most behooved to melt the frost which his hard heart embraced, and gainst his breast a thousand shot she ventured, yet was the fort so strong it was not entered. The dame, who thought that one blink of her eye could make the chastest heart feel love's sweet pain, oh, how her pride abated was hereby, when all her slights were void, her crafts were vain. Some other where she would her forces try, where at more ease she might more vantage gain. As tired soldiers, whom some fort keeps out, Thence raise their siege, and spoil the towns about. But yet, always the wily witch could find, Could not Tancredi's heart to loveward move. His sails were filled with another wind, He list no blast of new affection prove. For as one poison doth exclude by kind another's force, So love excludeth love. These two alone, nor more nor less the dame could win, the rest all burnt in her sweet flame. The princess, though her purpose would not frame, as late she hoped, and as still she would, yet for the lords and knights of greatest name became her prey, as erst you heard it told, she thought, ere truth-revealing time or fame bewrayed her act, to lead them to some hold, where chains and bands she meant to make them prove, composed by Vulcan, not by gentle love. The time prefixed at length was come and past, which Godfrey had set down to lend her aid, when at his feet herself to earth she cast. The hour is come, my lord, she humbly said, 
and if the tyrant haply here at last his banished niece hath your assistance prayed he will in arms to save his kingdom rise so shall we harder make this enterprise before report can bring the tyrant news or his espials certify their king Oh, let thy goodness these few champions choose that to her kingdom should thy handmaid bring, who, except heaven to aid the right refuse, recover shall her crown, from whence shall spring thy profit. For betide thee peace or war, thine all her cities, all her subjects are. The captain sage, the damsel fair assured, his word was passed and should not be recanted and she with sweet and humble grace endured to let him point those ten which lady granted but to be one each one sought and procured no suit no entreaty intercession wanted their envy each at others love exceeded and all importunate made more than needed she that well saw the secret of their hearts and knew how best to warm them in their blood against them threw the cursed poison darts of jealousy and grief at others good for love she wist was weak without these arts and slow for jealousy is cupid's food for the swift steed runs not so fast alone as when some strain some strive him to outgone her words in such alluring sort she framed her looks enticing and her wooing smiles that every one his fellows favors blamed that of their mistress he received erewhiles this foolish crew of lovers unashamed mad with the poison of her secret wiles ran forward still in this disordered sort nor could godfredo's bridle rein them short he that would satisfy each good desire without impartial love of every night although he swelled with shame with grief and ire to see these follies and these fashions light yet since by no advice they would retire another way he sought to set them right write all your names quoth he and see whom chance of lot to this exploit will first advance their names were writ and in a helmet shaken while each did fortune's grace and aid implore at last they drew them and the foremost taken the earl of pembroke was artemidor doubtless the county thought his bread well bacon now gerard followed then with tresses hoar old wenceslaus that felt cupid's rage now in his doting and his dying age oh how contentment in their foreheads shined their looks with joy thoughts swelled with secret pleasure these three it seemed good success designed to make the lords of love and beauty's treasure their doubtful fellows at their hap repined and with small patience wait fortune's leisure upon his lips that read the scrolls attending as if their lives were on his words depending quasca the fourth ridolfo him succeeds then alderic whom love list so advance lord william of roncillion next he reads then eberard and henry born in france rambaldo last whom wicked lust so leads that he forsook his savior with mischance this wretch the tenth was who was thus deluded the rest to their huge grief were all excluded or come with envy wrath and jealousy the rest blind fortune curse and all her laws and mad with love yet out on love they cry that in his kingdom let her judge their cause and for man's mind is such that oft we try things most forbidden without stay or pause in spite of fortune purposed many a night to follow fair armida when twas night to follow her by night or else by day and in her quarrel venture life and limb with sighs and tears she gan them softly pray to keep that promise when the skies were dim to this and that night did she plain and say what grief she felt to part without in him meanwhile the ten had donned their armor best and taken leave of godfrey and the rest the duke advised them every one apart how light how trustless was the pagan's faith and told what policy what wit what art avoids deceit which heedless men betrayeth his speeches pierce their ear but not their heart love calls it folly what so wisdom saith thus warned he leaves them to their wanton guide who parts that night such haste had she to ride the conqueress departs and with her led these prisoners whom love would captive keep 
the hearts of those she left behind her bled with point of sorrow's arrow pierced deep but when the night her drowsy mantle spread and filled the earth with silence shade and sleep in secret sort then each forsook his tent and as blind cupid led them blind they went eustatio first who scantly could forbear till friendly night might hide his haste and shade he rode in post and let his beast him bear as his blind fancy would his journey frame all night he wandered and he wist not where but with the morning he espied the dame that with her guard up from a village road where she and they that night had made abode thither he galloped fast and drawing near rambaldo knew the knight and loudly cried whence comes young eustace and what seeks he here i come quoth he to serve the queen armide if she accept me would we all were there where my good will and faith might best be tried who quoth the other choseth thee to prove this high exploit of hers he answered love love hath eustatio chosen fortune thee in thy conceit which is the best election nay then these shifts are vain replied he these titles false serve thee for no protection thou canst not here for this admitted be our fellow servant in this sweet subjection and who quoth eustace angry dares deny my fellowship rambaldo answered i and with that word his cutting sword he drew that glittered bright and sparkled flaming fire upon his foe the other champion flew with equal courage and with equal ire the gentle princess who the danger knew between them stepped and prayed them both retire rambald quoth she why should you grudge or plain if i a champion you a helper gain if me you love why wish you me deprived in so great need of such a puissant knight but welcome eustace in good time arrive a defender of my state my life my right i wish my hapless self no longer livid when i esteem such good assistance light thus talked they on and travelled on their way their fellowship increasing every day from every side they come yet wist there none of others coming or of others mind she welcomes all and telleth every one what joy her thoughts in his arrival find but when duke godfrey wist his knights were gone within his breast his wiser soul divined some hard mishap upon his friend should light for which he sighed all day and wept all night a messenger while thus he mused drew near all soiled with dust and sweat quite out of breath it seemed the man did heavy tidings bear upon his look sat news of loss and death my lord quoth he so many ships appear at sea that neptune bears the load uneath from egypt come they all this lets thee wheat william lord admiral of the genoa fleet besides a convoy coming from the shore with vittel for this noble camp of thine surprise it was and lost is all that store mules horses camels laden corn and wine thy servants fought till they could fight no more for all were slain or captives made in fine the arabian outlaws them assailed by night when least they feared and least they looked for fight their frantic boldness doth presume so far that many christians have they falsely slain and like a raging flood they spursed are and overflow each country field and plain send therefore some strong troops of men of war to force them hence and drive them home again and keep the ways between these tents of thine and those broad seas the seas of palestine from mouth to mouth the heavy rumor spread of these misfortunes which dispersed wide among the soldiers great amazement bred famine they doubt and new-come foes beside the duke that saw their wanted courage fled and in the place thereof weak fear espied with merry looks these cheerful words he spake to make them heart again and courage take new champions bold with me that scaped have so many dangers and such hard assays whom still your god did keep defend and save in all your battles combats fights and frays you that subdued the turks and persians brave that thirst and hunger held in scorn always and vanquished hills and seas with heat and cold shall vain reports appall your courage bold 
that Lord who helped you out at every need, when aught befell this glorious camp amiss, shall fortune all your actions well to speed, on whom his mercy large extended is. To fore his tomb when conquering hands you spreed, with what delight will you remember this? Be strong, therefore, and keep your valors high, to honor, conquest, fame, and victory. Their hopes half dead, and courage well nigh lost, revived with these brave speeches of their guide. But in his breast a thousand cares he tossed, although his sorrows he could wisely hide. He studied how to feed that mighty host in so great scarceness, and what force provide he should against the Egyptian warriors sly, and how subdue those thieves of Araby. End of Book Five. Book Six of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso. Translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Argument. Argantes calls the Christians out to just. Otho, not chosen, doth his strength assay. But from his saddle tumbleth in the dust, and captive to the town is sent away. Tancred begins new fight. And when both trust to win the praise and palm, night ends the fray. Erminia hopes to cure her wounded knight, and from the city armed rides by night. But better hopes had them recomforted that lay besieged in the sacred town. With new supply late were they victualed, when night obscured the earth with shadows brown. Their arms and engines on the walls they spread, their slings to cast and stones to tumble down. And all that side which to the northward lies, high rampiers and strong bulwarks fortifies. Their wary king commands now here, now there, to build this tower, to make that bulwark strong. Whether the sun, the moon, or stars appear to give them time to work, no time comes wrong. In every street new weapons forged were by cunning smiths, sweating with labor long, while thus the careful prince provision made, to him Argantes came, and boasting said, How long shall we, like prisoners in chains, kept hived lie enclosed within this wall? I see your workmen taking endless pains to make new weapons for no use at all. Meanwhile these western thieves destroy the plains. Your towns are burnt, your forts and castles fall. Yet none of us dares at these gates outpeep or sound one trumpet shrill to break their sleep. Their time in feasting and good cheer they spend, nor dare we once their banquet sweep molest. The days and night likewise they bring to end in peace, assurance, quiet, ease, and rest. But we must yield, whom hunger soon will shend, and make for peace to save our lives request. Else, if the Egyptian armies stay too long, like cowards die within this fortress strong. Yet never shall my courage great consent so vile a death should end my noble days, nor on mine arms within these walls a pent to-morrow's sun shall spread his timely rays. Let sacred heavens dispose, as they are bent, of this frail life. Yet not without in praise of valor, prowess, might, Argante shall inglorious die, or unrevenged fall. But if the roots of wanted chivalry be not quite dead your princely breast within, Devise not how with fame and praise to die, but how to live, to conquer, and to win. Let us together at these gates out fly, and skirmish bold, and bloody fight begin. For when last need to desperation driveth, who dareth most, he wisest counsel giveth. But if in field your wisdom dare not venture to hazard all your troops to doubtful fight, then bind yourself to Godfrey by indenture to end your quarrels by one single night. And, for the Christian this accord shall enter with better will, say such you know your right, that he the weapons, place, and time shall choose, and let him for his best that vantage use. For though your foe had hands like Hector strong, with heart unfeared and courage stern and stout, Yet no misfortune can your justice wrong, and what that wanteth shall this arm help out. In spite of fate shall this right hand ere long return victorious. If hereof you doubt, 
take it for pledge, wherein, if trust you have, it shall yourself defend and kingdom save. Bold youth, the tyrant thus began to speak, although I withered seem with age and years, yet are not these old arms so faint and weak nor this hoar head so full of doubts and fears, but when as death this vital thread shall break, he shall my courage hear my death who hears. And Aladine, that lived a king and knight, to his fair morn will have an evening bright. But that which yet I would have further blazed, to thee in secret shall be told and spoken. Great Solomon of Nice, so far appraised, to be revenged for his sceptre broken, the men of arms of Araby hath raised, from Ind to Afric, and when we give token attends the favor of the friendly knight to victual us, and with our foes to fight. Now, though Godfredo hold by warlike feet some castles poor and forts in vile oppression, care not for that, for still our princely seat, this stately town, we keep in our possession. But thou appease and calm that courage great which in thy bosom makes so hot impression, and stay fit time, which will be tied ere long, to increase thy glory and revenge our wrong. The Saracen at this was inly spited, who Solomon's great worth had long invited. To hear him praised thus he not delighted, nor that the king upon his aid relied. Within your power, Sir King, he says, united our peace and war nor shall that be denied. But for the Turk and his Arabian band, he lost his own. Shall he defend your land? Perchance he comes some heavenly messenger sent down to set the pagan people free. Then let Argantes for himself take care. This sword, I trust, shall well safe conduct me. But while you rest and all your forces spare, that I go forth to war at least agree, though not your champion, yet a private knight, I will some Christian prove in single fight. The king replied, Though thy force and might should be reserved to better time and use, yet that thou challenge some renowned knight among the Christians bold, I not refuse. The warrior breathing out desire of fight, and herald called, and said, Go tell those news to Godfrey's self, and to the western lords, and in their hearings boldly say these words. Say that a knight who holds in great disdain to be thus closed up in secret mew, will with his sword in open field maintain, if any dare deny his words for true, that no devotion, as they falsely feign, hath moved the French these countries to subdue, but vile ambition, and pride's hateful vice, desire of rule and spoil and covetise, and that to fight I am not only pressed with one or two that dare defend the cause, but come the fourth or fifth, come all the rest, come all that will and all that weapon draws. Let him that yields obey the victor's hest, as wills the lore of mighty Mars's laws. This was the challenge that fierce pagan sent, the herald donned his coat of arms, and went. And when the man before the presence came of princely Godfrey, and his captains bold, My lord, quoth he, may I without and blame before your grace my message brave unfold? Thou mayst, he answered, we approve the same. Without and fear be thine ambassage told. Then, quoth the herald, shall your highness see if this ambassage sharp or pleasing be. The challenge gan he then at large expose, with mighty threats, high terms, and glorious words. On every side an angry murmur rose, to wrath so moved were the knights and lords. Then Godfrey spake, and said, The man hath chosen hard exploit, but when he feels our swords I trust we shall so far entreat the knight as to excuse the fourth or fifth of fight. But let him come and prove, the field I grant nor wrong nor treason let him doubt or fear. Some here shall pay him for his glorious vaunt, without or guile or vantage, that I swear. The herald turned when he had ended scant, and hasted back the way he came while e'er, nor stayed he aught, nor once forslowed his pace, 
till he bespake Argantes face to face. Arm you, my lord, he said, your bold defies by your brave foes accepted boldly been. This combat neither high nor low denies. Ten thousand wish to meet you on the green. A thousand frowned with angry flaming eyes, and shaked for rage their swords and weapons keen. The field is safely granted by their guide. This said, the champion for his armor cried. While he was armed, his heart for ire and I break. So yearned his courage hot his foes to find. The king, to fair Clorinda present spake, If he go forth, remain not you behind, But of our soldiers best a thousand take, To guard his person and your own assign. Yet let him meet alone the Christian knight, And stand yourself aloof while they two fight. Thus spake the king, and soon, without abode, The troop went forth in shining armor clad, Before the rest the pagan champion rode His wanted arms and ensigns all he had. A goodly plain displayed wide and broad Between the city and the camp was spread, A place like that wherein proud Rome Beheld the forward young men manage spear and shield. There, all alone, Argantes took his stand, defying Christ and all his servants true, in stature, stomach, and in strength of hand, in pride, presumption, and in dreadful show, and solid like on the Phlegrean strand, or that huge giant Jesse's infant slew. But his fierce semblant they esteemed light, for most not knew, or else not feared, his might. As yet, not one had Godfrey singled out to undertake this hardy enterprise, but on Prince Tancred saw he all the rout had fixed their wishes and had cast their eyes. On him he spied them gazing round about, as though their honour on his prowess lies. And now they whispered louder what they meant, which Godfrey heard and saw, and was content. The rest gave place. For every one descried to whom their chieftain's will did most incline. Tancred, quoth he, I pray thee calm the pride, abate the rage of yonder Saracine. No longer would the chosen champion bide, his face with joy, his eyes with gladness shine. His helm he took, and ready steed bestrode, and guarded with his trusty friends forth rode. But scantly had he spurred his courser swift near to the plain, where proud Argantes stayed, when unawares his eyes he chanced to lift, and on the hill beheld the warlike maid, as white as snow upon the alpine cliff the virgin shone, in silver arms arrayed, her ventel up so high that he descried her goodly visage and her beauty's pride. He saw not where the pagan stood and stared, as if with looks he would his foemen kill, but full of other thoughts he forward fared, and sent his looks before him up the hill. His gesture such, his troubled soul declared. At last, as marble rock he standeth still, stone cold without, within, burnt with love's flame, and quite forgot himself and why he came. A challenger that yet saw none appear, that made or sign or show he came to just, how long, cried he, shall I attend you here? Dares none come forth? Dares none his fortune trust? The other stood amazed. Love stopped his ear. He thinks on Cupid, think of Mars who lust. But forth start Otho bold, and took the field, A gentle knight, whom God from danger shield. This youth was one of those who late desired With that vainglorious boaster to have fought, but Tancred chosen, he and all retired. Now, when his slackness he a while admired, And saw elsewhere employed was his thought, Nor that to just, though chosen, once he proffered, He boldly took that fit occasion offered. No tiger, panther, spotted leopard Runs half so swift, the forests wild among, As this young champion hasted thitherward, Where he attending saw the pagan strong. Tancredi started with the noise he heard, as waked from sleep, where he had dreamed long. Oh, stay, he cried, to me belongs this war, but cried too late, Otho was gone too far. Then, full of fury, anger, and despite, he stayed his horse, 
and waxed red for shame. The fight was his, but now disgraced quite himself, he thought, another played his game. Meanwhile the Saracen did hugely smite on Otho's helm, who to requite the same his foe quite through his sevenfold targe did bear, and in his breastplate stuck and broke his spear. The encounter such, upon the tender grass, down from his steed the Christian backward fell. Yet his proud foe so strong and sturdy was, that he nor shook nor staggered in his cell. But to the knight that lay full low, alas, in high disdain, his will thus gan he tell. Yield thee, my slave, and this thine honour be, thou mayst report thou hast encountered me. Not so, quoth he, pardie, it's not the guise of Christian knights, though fall'n, so soon to yield. I can my fall excuse in better wise, and will revenge this shame, or die in field. The great Circassian bent his frowning eyes, like that grim visage in Minerva's shield. Then learn, quoth he, what force Argantes useth against that fool that proffered grace refuseth. With that he spurred his horse with speed and haste, forgetting what good knights to virtue owe. Otho his fury shunned, and as he passed, at his right side he reached a noble blow. Wide was the wound, the blood outstreamed fast, and from his side fell to his stirrup low. But what avails to hurt, if wounds augment our foe's fierce courage, strength, and hardiment? Argantes nimbly turned his ready steed, and ere his foe was whist or well aware, against his side he drove his courser's head. What force could he against so great might prepare? Weak were his feeble joints, his courage dead, his heart amazed, his paleness showed his care, his tender side Against the hard earth he cast, Shamed with the first fall, Bruised with the last. The victor spurred again his light foot steed, And made his passage over Otho's heart, And cried, These fools thus underfoot I tread, That dare contend with me in equal mart. Tancred for anger shook his noble head, So was he grieved with that unknightly part. The fault was his, he was so slow before. With double valour would he salve that sore. Forward he galloped fast, and loudly cried, Villain, quoth he, thy conquest is thy shame. What praise, what honour shall this fact betide? What gain, what guerdon shall befall the same? Among the Arabian thieves thy face go hide, Far from resort of men of worth or fame, Or else in woods and mountains wild by night on savage beasts employ that savage might. The pagan patience never knew nor used. Trembling for ire, his sandy locks he tore. Out from his lips flew such a sound confused as lions make in deserts thick which roar. Or, as when clouds together crushed and bruised, pour down a tempest by the Caspian shore. So was his speech imperfect, stopped and broken, he roared and thundered when he should have spoken. But when with threats they both had whetted keen their eager rage, their fury, spite, and ire, they turned their steeds and left large space between, to make the forces greater, approaching nigher, with sacred terms that warlike and that worthy been. O sacred muse, my haughty thoughts inspire, and make a trumpet of my slender quill to thunder out this furious combat shrill. These sons of Mabel's bore instead of spears two knotty masts, which none but they could lift, each foaming steed so fast as master bears that never beast, bird, shaft flew half so swift. Such was their fury as when Boreas tears the shattered crags from Taurus' northern cliff. Upon their helms their lances long they broke, and up to heaven flew splinters, sparks, and smoke. The shock made all the towers and turrets quake, and woods and mountains all nigh hand resound. Yet could not all that force and fury shake the valiant champions, nor their persons wound. Together hurtled both their steeds, and break each other's neck, 
the riders lay on ground. But they, great masters of war's dreadful art, plucked forth their swords, and soon from earth upstart. Close at its surest ward each warrior lieth. He wisely guides his hand, his foot, his eye. This blow he proveth, that defence he trieth. He traverseth, retireth, presseth nigh. Now strikes he out, and now he falsifieth. This blow he wardeth, that he let slip by. And for advantage oft he lets some part discovered seem. Thus art deludeth art. The pagan, ill-defenced with sword or targe, Tancredi's thighs he supposed, espied, and, reaching forth against it his weapon large, quite naked to his foe leaves his left side. Tancred avoideth quick his furious charge, and gave him eke a wound deep, sore, and wide. That done, himself safe to his ward retired, his courage praised by all, his skill admired. The proud Circassian saw his streaming blood down from his wound as from a fountain running. He sighed for rage and trembled as he stood. He blamed his fortune, folly, want of cunning. He lift his sword aloft for iron I would, and forward rushed. Tancred, his fury shunning, with a sharp thrust once more the pagan hit, to his broad shoulder where his arm is knit. Like as a bear, through pierced with a dart within the secret woods, no further flieth, but bites the senseless weapon mad with smart, seeking revenge till unrevenged she dieth. So mad Argantes fared when his proud heart, wound upon wound, and shame on shame espieth. Desire of vengeance so o'ercame his senses that he forgot all dangers, all defences. Uniting force extreme with endless wrath, Supporting both with youth and strength untired, his thundering blow so fast about he layeth that skies and earth the flying sparkles fired. His foe to strike one blow no leisure hath. Scantly he breathed, though he oft desired, his warlike skill and cunning all was waste. Such was Organti's force, and such his haste. Long time Tancredi had in vain attended when this huge storm should overblow and pass. Some blows his mighty target well defended, some fell besides and wounded deep the grass. But when he saw the tempest never ended, nor that the Paynim's force aught weaker was, he high advanced his cutting sword at length, and rage to rage opposed and strength to strength. Wrath bore the sway, both art and reason fail. Fury new force and courage new supplies. Their armors forged were of metal frail, on every side thereof huge cantles flies. The land was strewed all with plate and mail. That on the earth, on that their warm blood lies. And at each rush and every blow they smote, thunder the noise, the spark seemed lightning hot. The Christian people and the pagans gazed on this fierce combat, wishing off the end. Twixt hope and fear they stood long time amazed to see the knights assail and eke defend. Yet neither sign they made nor noise they raised, but for the issue of the fight attend, and stood as still as life and sense they wanted, save that their hearts within their bosoms panted. Now were they tired both and well nigh spent. Their blows show greater will than power to wound, but night her gentle daughter darkness sent with friendly shade to overspread the ground. Two heralds to the fighting champions went to part the fray, as laws of arms them bound, a Rydens born in France, and wise Pindor, the man that brought the challenge proud before. These men their scepters interpose between the doubtful hazards of uncertain fight, for such their privilege hath ever been, the law of nations doth defend their right. Pindor began, Stay, stay, you warriors keen, Equal your honor, equal is your might, Forbear this combat, so we deem it best, Give night her due, and grant your persons rest. Man goeth forth to labor with the sun, But with the night all creatures draw to sleep, nor yet of hidden praise in darkness one the valiant heart of noble knight takes keep. 
Agantes answered him, The fight begun now to forbear doth wound my heart right deep. Yet will I stay, so that this Christian swear before you both again to meet me here. I swear, quoth Tancred, but swear thou likewise to make return thy prisoner eke with thee, else for achievement of this enterprise none other time but this expect of me. Thus swore they both. The heralds both devise what time for this exploit should fittest be, and for their wounds of rest and cure had need, to meet again the sixth day was decreed. This fight was deep imprinted in their hearts, that saw this bloody fray to ending brought, and horror great possessed their weaker parts, which made them shrink who on their combat thought. Much speech was of the praise and high desarts of these brave champions that so nobly fought, but which, for knightly worth was most appraised, of that was doubt and disputation raised. All longed to see them end this doubtful fray, and as they favor, so they wish success. These hope true virtue shall obtain the day, those trust on fury, strength, and hardiness. But on Arminia most this burden lay, whose looks her trouble and her fear express. For on this dangerous combat's doubtful end, her joy, her comfort, hope, and life depend. Her, the sole daughter of that hapless king that of proud Antioch laid before the crown, the Christian soldiers to Trancredi bring, when they had sacked and spoiled that glorious town. But he, in whom all good and virtue spring, the virgin's honor saved, and her renown. And when her city and her state was lost, then was her person loved and honored most. He honored her, served her, and leave her gave, and willed her go whither and when she list. Her gold and jewels had he care to save, and them restore it all she nothing missed. She that beheld this youth in person brave, when by his deed his noble mind she wist, laid ope her heart for Cupid's shaft to hit, who never knots of love more surer knit. Her body free, Captived was her heart, and love the keys did of that prison bear. Prepared to go, it was a death to part from that kind lord, and from that prison dear. But thou, O honour, which esteemed art the chiefest virtue noble ladies wear, enforcest her against her will, to wend to Aladine, her mother's dearest friend. At Sion was this princess entertained, by that old tyrant and her mother dear, whose loss too soon the woeful damsel plained, her grief was such she lived not half the year. Yet banishment nor loss of friends constrained the hapless maid her passions to forbear, for though exceeding were her woe and grief, of all her sorrows, yet her love was chief. The silly maid in secret longing pined, her hope a moat, drawn up by Phoebus' rays. Her love a mountain seemed, whereon bright shined fresh memory of Tancred's worth and praise. Within her closet, if herself she shrined, a hotter fire her tender heart assays. Tancred, at last, to raise her hope nigh dead, before those walls did his broad ensign spread. The rest, to view the Christian army, feared. Such seemed their number, such their power and might, but she alone her troubled forehead cleared, and on them spread her beauty shining bright. In every squadron when it first appeared her curious eye sought out her chosen knight, and every gallant that the rest excels, the same seems him, so love and fancy tells. Within the kingly palace, builded high, a turret standeth near the city's wall, from which Herminia might at ease descry the western host, the plains and mountains all. And there she stood, all the long day, to spy from Phoebus rising to his evening fall, and with her thoughts disputed of his praise, and every thought a scalding sigh did raise. From hence the furious combat she surveyed, and felt her heart tremble with fear and pain. 
her secret thoughts thus to her fancies said, Behold thy dear in danger to be slain. So with suspect, with fear and grief dismayed, Attended she her darling's loss or gain. And ever when the pagan lift his blade, A stroke a wound in her weak bosom made. But when she saw the end, and wist with all their strong contention should eftsoons begin, amazement strange her courage did appall, her vital blood was icy cold within. Sometimes she sighed, sometimes tears let fall, to witness what distress her heart was in. Hopeless, dismayed, pale, sad, astonished, her love, her fear, her fear, her torment bred. Her idle brain unto her soul presented death in an hundred ugly fashions painted, and, if she slept, then was her grief augmented, with such sad visions were her thoughts acquainted. She saw her lord with wounds and hurts tormented, how he complained, called for her help, and fainted, and found, awaked from that unquiet sleeping, her heart with panting sore, eyes red with weeping. Yet these presages of his coming ill, not greatest cause of her discomfort were, she saw his blood from his deep wounds distill, nor what he suffered could she bide or bear. Besides, report, her longing ear did fill, doubling his danger, doubling so her fear, that she concludes, so was her courage lost, her wounded lord was weak, faint, dead almost and for her mother had her taught before the secret virtue of each herb that springs besides fit charms for every wound or sore corruption breedeth or misfortune brings and art esteemed in those times of yore beseeming daughters of great lords and kings she would herself be surgeon to her knight and heal him with her skill or with her sight thus would she cure her love and cure her foe she must that had her friends and kinfolk slain. Some cursed weeds her cunning hand did know that could augment his harm, increase his pain, but she abhorred to be revenged so. No treason should her spotless person stain, and virtueless she wished all herbs and charms wherewith false men increase their patient's harms. Nor feared she among the bands to stray of armed men, for often had she seen the tragic end of many a bloody fray. Her life had full of haps and hazards been. This made her bold in every heart assay more than her feeble sex became, I ween. She feared not the shake of every reed, so cowards are courageous made through need. Love, fearless, hardy, and audacious love, emboldened had this tender damsel so that where wild beasts and serpents glide and move through Afric's deserts, durst she ride or go, save that her honour she esteemed above her life and body's safety told her no. For, in the secret of her troubled thought, a doubtful combat, love and honour fought. O oh, spotless virgin, honour thus began, that my true lore observed firmly hast, when with thy foes thou didst in bondage one, Remember then I kept thee pure and chaste, but liberty now, where wouldst thou run, to lay that field of princely virtue waste, or lose that jewel ladies hold so dear? Is maidenhood so great a load to bear? Or deemst thou it a praise of little prize, the glorious title of a virgin's name, that thou wilt gad by night and giglet wise amid thine armed foes to seek thy shame? O fool, a woman conquers when she flies, refusal kindleth, proffers quench the flame. Thy lord will judge thou sinnest beyond measure, if vainly thus thou waste so rich a treasure. The sly deceiver Cupid thus beguiled the simple damsel with his filed tongue. Thou wert not born, quoth he, in desert wild, the cruel bears and savage beasts among thou shouldst scorn fair Cytherea's child, or hate those pleasures that to youth belong. Nor did the gods thy heart of iron frame, to be in love is neither sin nor shame. Go then, go whither sweet desire inviteth, 
How can thy gentle knight so cruel be? Love in his heart thy grief and sorrows writeth, For thy laments how he complaineth. See, O oh, cruel woman, whom no care exciteth To save his life that saved and honoured thee. He languished. One foot thou wilt not move to succour him, Yet say'st thou art in love. No, no, stay here, Argante's wounds to cure, And make him strong to shed thy darling's blood. Of such reward he may himself assure That doth a thankless woman so much good. Ah, may it be thy patience can endure To see the strength of this Circassian wood, And not with horror and amazement shrink, when on their future fight thou haps to think? Besides the thanks and praises for the deed, Suppose what joy, what comfort shalt thou win When thy soft hand doth wholesome plasters speed Upon the breeches in his ivory skin. Thence to thy dearest lord may health succeed, Strength to his limbs, blood to his cheeks so thin, And his rare beauties, now half dead and more, Thou mayst to him, him to thyself, restore. So shall some part of his adventures bold and valiant acts henceforth be held as thine. His dear embracements shall thee straight enfold, together joined in marriage rites divine. Lastly, high place of honour shalt thou hold among the matrons sage and dames latine in Italy, a land, as each one tells, where valour true and true religion dwells. With such vain hopes the silly maid abused, promised herself mountains and hills of gold. Yet were her thoughts with doubts and fears confused how to escape unseen out of that hold, because the watchman every minute used to guard the walls against the Christians bold, and in such fury and such heat of war the gates or celled or never opened are. With strong Clorinda was Erminia sweet in surest links of dearest friendship bound. With her she used the rising sun to greet, and her when Phoebus glided underground she made the lovely partner of her sheet. In both their hearts one will, one thought was found, nor aught she hid from that virago bold except her love, that tale to none she told. That kept she secret. If Clorinda heard her make complaints or secretly lament, to other cause her sorrow she referred. Matter enough she had of discontent, like as the bird that having close embarred her tender young ones in the springing bent, to draw the searcher further from her nest, cries and complains most where she needeth least. Alone within her chamber's secret part, Sitting one day upon her heavy thought, Devising by what means, what slight, what art, Her close departure should be safest wrought, Assembled in her unresolved heart, An hundred passions strove and ceaseless fought. At last she saw, high hanging on the wall, Clorinda's silver arms, and sighed withal, And sighing, softly to herself she said, how blessed is this virgin in her might! How I envy the glory of the maid, Yet envy not her shape or beauty's light. Her steps are not with trailing garments stayed, Nor chambers hide her valour shining bright. But armed she rides and breaketh sword and spear, Nor is her strength restrained by shame or fear. Alas, why did not heaven these members frail with lively force and vigour strengthen so that I, the silken gown and slender veil, might for a breastplate and an helm forego. Then should not heat, nor cold, nor rain, nor hail, nor storms that fall, nor blustering winds that blow withhold me. But I would both day and night in pitched field or private combat fight. Nor hadst thou, Argantes, first begun with my dear lord that fierce and cruel fight, but I to that encounter would have run and haply ta'en him captive by my might. Yet should he find our furious combat done, his thraldom easy, and his bondage light. For fetters, mine embracements should he prove, for diet, kisses sweet, 
for keeper, love, or else my tender bosom opened wide, and heart through pierced with his cruel blade, the bloody weapon in my wounded side might cure the wound which love before had made. Then should my soul in rest and quiet slide down to the valleys of the Elysian shade, and my mishap the night perchance would move to shed some tears upon his murdered love. Alas! Impossible are all these things, such wishes vain afflict my woeful sprite. Why yield I thus to plaints and sorrowings, as if all hope and help were perished quite? My heart dares much, it soars with Cupid's wings. Why use I not for once these armors bright? I may sustain a while this shield aloft, though I be tender, feeble, weak, and soft. Love! strong bold mighty never tired love supplieth force to all his servants true the fearful stags he doth to battle move till each his horns in others blood imbrue yet mean i not the haps of war to prove a stratagem i have devised new clorinda like in this fair harness dight i will escape out of the town this night I know the men that have the gate to ward, if she command, dare not or will deny. In what sort else could I beguile the guard? This way is only left, this will I try. O oh, gentle love, in this adventure hard, thine handmaid guide, assist, and fortify. The time, the hour, now fitteth best the thing, while stout Clorinda talketh with the king. Resolve it thus. Without delay she went, as her strong passion did her rashly guide, and those bright arms down from the drafter hent within her closet did she closely hide. That might she do unseen, for she had sent the rest on sleeveless errands from her side. And night her stealths brought to their wished end. Night, patroness of thieves and lover's friend. Some sparkling fires on heaven's bright visage shone, his azure robe the orient blueness lost when she whose wit and reason both were gone called for a squire she loved and trusted most to whom and to a maid a faithful one part of her will she told how that in post she would depart from judah's king and feigned that other cause her sudden flight constrained the trusty squire provided needments meet as for their journey fitting most should be Meanwhile her vesture, pendant to her feet, Erminia doffed, as erst determined she. Stripped to her petticoat the virgin sweet so slender was, that wonder was to see. Her handmaid ready, at her mistress' will, to arm her helped, though simple were her skill. The rugged steel oppressed and offended her dainty neck, and locks of shining gold, her tender arm, so feeble was, it bended when that huge target it presumed to hold. The burnished steel, bright rays far off extended. She feigned courage, and appeared bold. Fast by her side, unseen, smiled Venus' son, as erst he laughed when Alcides spun. Oh, with what labor did her shoulders bear that heavy burthen, and how slow she went! Her maid, to see that all the coasts were clear, before her mistress through the streets was sent, love gave her courage, love exiled fear, love to her tired limbs new vigor lent, till she approached where the squire abode, there took their horse forthwith, and forward rode. Disguised they went, and by unused ways, and secret paths they strove unseen to gone, until the watch they meet, which sore affrays their soldiers knew when swords and weapons shone, yet none to stop their journey once essays, but place and passage yielded every one, for that bright armor and that helmet bright were known and feared in the darkest night. Erminia, though some deal she were dismayed, yet when she on and goodly countenance bore, she doubted lest her purpose were bewrayed, her too much boldness she repented sore. But now, the gate her fear and passage stayed the heedless porter she beguiled therefore 
I am Clorinda. Ope the gate, she cried. Whereas the king commands, this late I ride. Her woman's voice and terms all framed been, most like the speeches of the princess stout. Who would have thought on horseback to have seen that feeble damsel armed round about? The porter her obeyed, and she, between her trusty squire and maiden, sallied out, and through the secret dales they silent pass, where danger least, least fear, least peril was. But when these fair adventurers entered were deep in a vale, Herminia stayed her haste, to be recalled she had no cause to fear. This foremost hazard has she trimly passed, but dangers new to fore unseen appear. New perils she descried, new doubts she cast. The way that her desire to quiet brought, more difficult now seemed than erst she thought. Armed to ride among her angry foes, she now perceived it were great oversight. Yet would she not, she thought, herself disclose until she came before her chosen knight. To him she purposed to present the rose, pure, spotless, clean, untouched of mortal white. She stayed therefore, and in her thoughts more wise, she called her squire, whom thus she can advise. Thou must, quoth she, be mine ambassador. Be wise, be careful, true and diligent. Go to the camp, present thyself before the prince Tancredi, wounded in his tent. Tell him thy mistress comes to cure his sore. If he, to grant her peace and rest, consent, Against whom fierce love such cruel war hath raised, So shall his wounds be cured, her torments eased. And say, in him such hope and trust she hath, That in his power she fears no shame nor scorn. Tell him thus much, and whatsoe'er he saith, Unfold no more, but make a quick return. I, for this place is free from harm or scath, within this valley will meanwhile sojourn. Thus spake the princess, and her servant true, to execute the charge imposed, flew. And was received, he so discreetly wrought, first of the watch that guarded in their place, before the wounded prince then was he brought, who heard his message kind with gentle grace, which told he left him tossing in his thought a thousand doubts, and turned his speedy pace to bring his lady and his mistress word she might be welcome to that courteous lord. But she, impatient, to whose desire grievous and harmful seemed each little stay, recounts his steps and thinks, now draws he nigher, now enters in, now speaks, now comes his way, and that which grieved her most the careful squire less speedy seemed than e'er before that day. Lastly, she forward rode with love to guide until the Christian tents at hand she spied. Invested in her starry veil, the knight, in her kind arms, embraced all this round the silver moon, from sea uprising bright, spread frosty pearl upon the candid ground. And Cynthia like, for beauty's glorious light, the lovesick nymph threw glittering beams around, and counsellors of her old love she made those valleys dumb, that silence and that shade. Beholding then the camp, quoth she, O oh, fair and castle-like pavilions richly wrought, from you how sweet, methinketh, blows the air, how comforts it my heart, my soul, my thought, through heaven's fair face from gulf of sad despair, my tossed bark to port well nigh is brought. In you I seek redress for all my harms, rest midst your weapons, peace amongst your arms. Receive me then, and let me mercy find, as gentle love assureth me I shall. Among you had I entertainment kind when first I was the Prince Tancredi's thrall. I covet not, led by ambition blind, you should me in my father's throne install. Might I but serve in you, my lord, so dear, that my content, my joy, my comfort were. Thus parlied she, poor soul, and never feared the sudden blow of fortune's cruel spite. 
she stood where Phoebe's splendid beam appeared upon her silver armor double bright. The place about her round she shining cleared, with that pure white wherein the nymph was dight. The tigress great that on her helmet laid bore witness where she went and where she stayed. So, as her fortune would, a Christian band their secret ambush there had closely framed, led by two brothers of Italia land, young polyphern and alicandro name these with their forces watched to withstand those that brought victuals to their foes untamed and kept that passage them arminia spied and fled as fast as her swift steed could ride but polyphern before whose watery eyes his aged father strong clorinda slew when that bright shield and silver helm he spies the championess he thought he saw and knew. Upon his hidden mates for aid he cries against his supposed foe, and forth he flew, as he was rash and heedless in his wrath, bending his lance, Thou art but dead, he saith. As when a chased hind her course doth bend to seek by soil to find some ease or goad, whether from craggy rock the spring descend or softly glide within the shady wood, if there the dog she meet, where late she weaned to comfort her weak limbs in cooling flood, again she flies, swift as she fled at first, forgetting weakness, weariness, and thirst. So she, but thought to rest her weary sprite and quench the endless thirst of ardent love with dear embracements of her lord and knight, but such as marriage right should first approve, when she beheld her foe, with weapon bright threatening her death, his trusty courser move, her love, her lord, herself abandoned, she spurred her speedy steed, and swift she fled. Herminia fled, scantly the tender grass, her pegasus with his light footsteps bent. Her maiden's beast for speed did likewise pass, yet diverse ways such was their fear they went. The squire, who all too late returned, alas, with tardy news from Prince Tancredi's tent, fled likewise, when he saw his mistress gone, it booted not to sojourn there alone. But Alicandro, wiser than the rest, who the supposed Clorinda saw likewise, to follow her yet was he nothing pressed, but in his ambush still and close he lies. A messenger to Godfrey he addressed, that should him of this accident advise, how that his brother chased with naked blade Clorinda's self, or else Clorinda's shade. Yet that it was, or that it could be she, he had small cause or reason to suppose. Occasion great and weighty must it be, should make her ride by night among her foes. What Godfrey willed, that observed he, and with his soldiers lay in ambush close. These news through all the Christian army went, in every cabin talked, in every tent. Tancred, whose thoughts the squire had filled with doubt by his sweet words, supposed now hearing this, alas, the virgin came to seek me out, and for my sake her life in danger is. Himself forthwith he singled from the rout, and rode in haste, though half his arms he missed among those sandy fields and valleys green to seek his love he galloped fast unseen end of book six book seven of jerusalem delivered by torquato tasso translated by edward fairfax this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Argument A shepherd fair Erminia entertains, whom, whilst Tancredi seeks in vain to find, he is entrapped in Armida's trains. Raymond with strong Argantes is assigned to fight, an angel to his aid he gains. Satan, that sees the pagan's fury blind, and hasty wrath turned to his loss and harm, doth raise new tempest, uproar, and alarm. Erminia's steed this while his mistress bore through forests thick, among the shady treen, her feeble hand the bridle reins forlore, half in a swoon she was for fear, I ween. 
But her fleet courser spared ne'er the more To bear her through the desert woods unseen Of her strong foes, that chased her through the plain, And still pursued, but still pursued in vain. Like as the weary hounds at last retire, Windless, displeased, from the fruitless chase, When the sly beast, tapished in bush and briar, No art nor pains can rouse out of his place. The Christian knights, so full of shame and ire, Returned back with faint and weary pace. Yet still the fearful dame fled swift as wind, Nor ever stayed, nor ever looked behind. Through thick and thin all night, all day, she drived, without in comfort, company, or guide. Her plaints and tears, with every thought revived, she heard and saw her griefs, but not beside. But when the sun his burning chariot dived in Thetis' wave, and weary team untied, on Jordan's sandy banks her course she stayed, at last there down she light, and down she laid. Her tears, her drink, her food, her sorrowings, this was her diet that unhappy night, but sleep that sweet repose and quiet brings to ease the griefs of discontented wight, spread forth his tender, soft and nimble wings in his dull arms folding the virgin bright. And love, his mother, and the graces kept strong watch and ward while this fair lady slept. The birds awaked her with their morning song, their warbling music pierced her tender ear. The murmuring brooks and whistling winds among the rattling boughs and leaves their parts did bear. Her eyes unclosed beheld the groves along of swains and shepherd grooms that dwellings were, and that sweet noise birds, winds, and water sent, provoked again the virgin to lament. Her plaints were interrupted with a sound that seemed from thickest bushes to proceed. Some jolly shepherd sung a lusty round, and to his voice had tuned his oaten reed. Thither she went. An old man there she found, at whose right hand his little flock did feed, sat making baskets, his three sons among, that learned their father's art and learned his song. Beholding one in shining arms appear, the silly man and his were sore dismayed. But sweet Erminia comforted their fear, her ventail up, her visage open laid. You happy folk of heaven, beloved dear, work on, quoth she, upon your harmless trade. These dreadful arms I bear no warfare bring to your sweet toil, nor those sweet tunes you sing. But, father, since this land, these towns and towers, destroy it are with sword, with fire and spoil, how may it be? unhurt that you and yours in safety thus apply your harmless toil my son quoth he this poor estate of ours is ever safe from storm of warlike broil this wilderness doth us in safety keep no thundering drum no trumpet breaks our sleep haply just heaven's defence and shield of right doth love the innocence of simple swains the thunderbolts on highest mountains light and seldom ever strike the lower plains. So kings have cause to fear Bologna's might, not they who sweat and toil their dinner gains, nor ever greedy soldier was enticed by poverty, neglected and despised. O oh, poverty, chief of the heavenly brood, dearer to me than wealth or kingly crown, no wish for honor, thirst of others' good can move my heart, contented with mine own. We quench our thirst with water of this flood, nor fear we poison should therein be thrown. These little flocks of sheep and tender goats give milk for food and wool to make us coats. We little wish, we need but little wealth, from cold and hunger us to clothe and feed. These are my sons, their care preserves from stealth their father's flocks, nor servants more I need. Amid these groves I walk oft for my health, and to the fishes, birds, and beasts give heed how they are fed in forest, spring, and lake, and their contentment for example take. Time was, for each one hath his doting time, these silver locks were golden tresses then, that country life I hated as a crime, and from the forest's sweet contentment ran, to Memphis' stately palace would I climb, and there became the mighty caliph's man. And though I but a simple gardener were, yet could I mark abuses, see and hear. Enticed on with hope of future gain, I suffered long what did my soul displease. But when my youth was spent, my hope was vain. 
I felt my native strength at last decrease, I gan my loss of lusty years complain, And wished I had enjoyed the country's peace. I bade the court farewell, and with content, My later age, here have I quiet spent. While thus he spake, Erminia, hushed and still, His wise discourses heard with great attention. His speeches grave, those idle fancies kill, Which in her troubled soul bred such dissension. After much thought, reformed was her will, Within those woods to dwell was her intention, Till fortune should occasion new afford, To turn her home to her desired lord. She said therefore, O shepherd fortunate, That trouble some didst whilom feel and prove, Yet livest now in this contented state, Let my mishap thy thoughts to pity move, To entertain me as a willing mate in shepherd's life, which I admire and love. Within these pleasant groves perchance my heart of her discomforts may unload some part. If gold or wealth of most esteemed dear, if jewels rich thou didst hold in prize, such store thereof, such plenty have I here, as to a greedy mind might well suffice. With that down trickled many a silver tear, two crystal streams fell from her watery eyes, Part of her sad misfortunes then she told, and wept, and with her wept that shepherd old. With speeches kind he gan the virgin dear toward his cottage gently home to guide. His aged wife there made her homely cheer, yet welcomed her, and placed her by her side. The princess donned a poor pastoral's gear, a kerchief coarse upon her head she tied, but yet her gestures and her looks, I guess, were such as ill beseemed a shepherdess. Not those rude garments could obscure and hide the heavenly beauty of her angel's face, nor was her princely offspring damnified, or aught disparaged by those labors base. Her little flocks to pasture would she guide, and milk her goats, and in their folds them place. Both cheese and butter could she make, and frame herself to please the shepherd and his dame. But oft, when underneath the greenwood shade Her flocks lay hid from Phoebus' scorching rays, Unto her night she songs and sonnets made, And them engraved in bark of beech and bays. She told how Cupid did her first invade, How conquered her, and ends with Tancred's praise. And when her passions writ she overread, Again she mourned, again salt tears she shed. You happy trees, forever keep quoth she, this woeful story in your tender rind, another day under your shade may be will come to rest again some lover kind, who if these trophies of my griefs he see, shall feel dear pity pierce his gentle mind. With that she sighed and said, too late I prove there is no truth in fortune, trust in love. Yet may it be, if gracious heavens attend the earnest suit of a distressed wight, at my entreat they will vouchsafe to send to these huge deserts that unthankful night, that when to earth the man his eyes shall bend and see my grave, my tomb and ashes light, my woeful death his stubborn heart may move with tears and sorrows to reward my love. So though my life hath most unhappy been, at least yet shall my spirit dead be blessed, my ashes cold shall, buried on this green, enjoy that good the body ne'er possessed. Thus she complained to the senseless treen, floods in her eyes and fires were in her breast. But he for whom these streams of tears she shed, wandered far off, alas, as chance him led. He followed on the footsteps he had traced, till in high woods and forests old he came, where bushes, thorns, and trees so thick were placed, and so obscure the shadows of the same, that soon he lost the track wherein he paced, yet went he on, which way he could not aim, but still attentive was his longing ear, if noise of horse or noise of arms he hear. If with the breathing of the gentle wind, an aspen leaf but shake it on the tree, if bird or beast stirred in the bushes blind, thither he spurred, thither he rode to see. Out of the wood, by Cynthia's favor kind, at last with travel great and pains got he, and following on a little path, he heard a rumbling sound, and hasted thitherward. 
It was a fountain from the living stone That poured down clear streams in noble store, Whose conduit pipes, united all in one, Throughout a rocky channel ghastly roar. Here Tancred stayed and called, yet answered none, Save babbling echo from the crooked shore. And there the weary knight at last despise The springing daylight red and white arise. He sighed sore, and guiltless heaven gan blame That wished success to his desires denied, And sharp revenge protested for the same, If aught but good his mistress fair betide. Then wished he to return the way he came, Although he wist not by what path to ride, and time drew near when he again must fight with proud Argantes, that vainglorious knight. His stalwart steed the champion stout bestrode, and pricked fast to find the way he lost. But through a valley, as he musing rode, he saw a man that seemed for haste a post. His horn was hung between his shoulders broad, as is the guise with us. Tancredi crossed his way, and gently prayed the man to say to Godfrey's camp how he should find the way. Sir, in the Italian language answered he, I ride where noble Bohemond hath me sent. The prince thought this his uncle's man should be, and after him his course with speed he bent. A fortress stately built, at last they see, bout which a muddy, stinking lake there went. There they arrived, when Titan went to rest his weary limbs in night's untroubled nest. The courier gave the fort a warning blast. The drawbridge was let down by them within. If thou a Christian be, quoth he, thou mayst, till Phoebus shine again, here take thine inn. The county of Cosina, three days past, this castle from the Turks did nobly win. The prince beheld the peace, which sight and art impregnable had made on every part. He feared within a pile so fortified some secret treason or enchantment lay. But had he known even there he should have died, Yet should his looks no sign of fear betray, For wheresoever will or chance him guide, His strong victorious hand still made him way. Yet for the combat he must shortly make, No new adventures this to undertake. Before the castle, in a meadow plain, Beside the bridge's end he stayed and stood, Nor was entreated by the speeches vain Of his false guide to pass beyond the flood. Upon the bridge appeared a warlike swain from top to toe all clad in armor good, who brandishing a broad and cutting sword, thus threatened death with many an idle word. O thou, whom chance or will brings to the soil where fair Armida doth the scepter guide, thou canst not fly, of arms thyself to spoil, and let thy hands with iron chains be tied. Enter, and rest thee from thy weary toil. Within this dungeon shalt thou safe abide, And never hope again to see the day, Or that thy hair for age shall turn to gray. Except thou swear her valiant knights to aid Against those traitors of the Christian crew. Tancred at this discourse a little stayed, His arms, his gesture, and his voice he knew. It was Rambaldo, who... For that false maid forsook his country and religion true, And of that fort defender chief became, And those vile customs established in the same. The warrior answered, blushing red for shame, Cursed apostate and ungracious wight, I am that Tancred, who defend the name of Christ, And have been a his faithful knight. His rebel foes can I subdue and tame, As thou shalt find before we end this fight. And thy false heart, cleft with this vengeful sword, shall feel the ire of thy forsaken lord. When that great name Rambaldo's ears did fill, he shook for fear, and looked pale for dread, yet proudly said, Tancred, thy hap was ill to wander hither, where thou art but dead, where naught can help thy courage, strength, and skill. To Godfrey will I send thy cursed head, that he may see how, for Armida's sake, Of him and of his Christ a scorn I make. This said, the day to sable night was turned, That scant one could another's arms descry, But soon a hundred lamps and torches burned, That cleared all the earth and all the sky. The castle seemed a stage with lights adorned, On which men play some pompous tragedy. 
within a terrace sat on high the queen, and heard, and saw, and kept herself unseen. The noble baron whet his courage hot, and busked him boldly to the dreadful fight. Upon his horse long while he tarried not, because on foot he saw the pagan knight, who underneath his trusty shield was got, his sword was drawn, closed was his helmet bright, against whom the prince marched on a stately pace, wrath in his voice, rage in his eyes and face. His foe, his furious charge not well abiding, traversed his ground and started here and there, but he, though faint and weary both with riding, yet followed fast and still oppressed him near, and on what side he felt Rambaldo sliding, on that his forces most employed were. Now it is helm, now it is hauberk bright, he thundered blows, now at his face and sight. Against those members battery chief he maketh, wherein man's life keeps chiefest residence. At his proud threats the Gascoigne warrior quaketh, an uncouth fear appalled every sense. To nimble shifts the knight himself betaketh, and skippeth here and there for his defence. Now with his targe, now with his trusty blade, against his blows he good resistance made. Yet no such quickness for defence he used, as did the prince to work him harm and scathe. His shield was cleft in twain, his helmet bruised, and in his blood his other arms did bathe. On him he heaped blows, with thrust confused, and more or less each stroke annoyed him hath. He feared, and in his troubled bosom strove, remorse of conscience, shame, disdain, and love. At last, so careless foul despair he made, he meant to prove his fortune, ill or good. His shield cast down, he took his helpless blade in both his hands, which yet had drawn no blood, and with such force upon the prince he laid, that neither plate nor mail the blow withstood. The wicked steel seized deep in his right side, and with his streaming blood his bases died. Another stroke he lent him on the brow, so great that loudly rung the sounding steel, yet pierced he not the helmet with the blow, although the owner twice or thrice did reel. The prince, whose looks his daneful anger show, now meant to use his puissance every deal. He shaked his head and crashed his teeth for ire, his lips breathed wrath, eyes sparkled shining fire. The pagan wretch no longer could sustain the dreadful terror of his fierce aspect. Against the threatened blow he saw right plain no tempered armor could his life protect. He leaped aside. The stroke fell down in vain against a pillar near the bridge erect. Thence flaming fire and thousand sparks outstart, and kill with fear the coward pagan's heart. Toward the bridge the fearful pain him fled, and in swift flight his hope of life reposed. Himself Fast after Lord Tancredi sped, and now in equal pace almost they closed. When all the burning lamps extinguished, the shining fort his goodly splendor loosed, and all those stars on heaven's blue face that shone with Cynthia's self dispirit were and gone. Amid those witchcrafts and that ugly shade, no further could the prince pursue the chase. Nothing he saw, yet forward still he made, with doubtful steps and ill-assured pace, at last his foot upon a threshold trade, and ere he wished he entered had the place. With ghastly noise the door-leaves shut behind, and closed him fast in prison dark and blind. As in our seas, in the Comachian Bay, a silly fish, with streams enclosed, striveth to shun the fury, and avoid the sway wherewith the current in that whirlpool driveth, yet seeketh all in vain, but finds no way out of that watery prison where she diveth. For with such force there be the tides in brought, there entereth all that will, thence issueth not. This prison so entrapped that valiant knight, of which the gate was framed by subtle train, to close without the help of human white, so sure none could undo the leaves again. Against the doors he bended all his might, but all his forces were employed in vain. At last a voice scanned to him loudly call, Yield thee, quoth it, thou art our Midas thrall. Within this dungeon buried shalt thou spend the residue of thy woeful days and years, the champion list not more with words contend, but in his heart kept close his griefs and fears. He blamed love, chance can he reprehend, 
and gainst enchantments huge complaints he rears. It were small loss, softly he thus begun, to lose the brightness of the shining sun, but I, alas, the golden beam forgo of my far brighter sun. Nor can I say, if these poor eyes shall e'er be blessed so, as once again to view that shining ray. Then thought he on his proud circassian foe, and said, Ah, how shall I perform that fray? He and the world with him will tancred blame. This is my grief, my fault, mine endless shame. While those high spirits of this champion good with love and honor's care are thus oppressed, while he torments himself, Argantes would wax weary of his bed and of his rest. Such hate of peace and such desire of blood, such thirst of glory boiled in his breast, that though he scant could stir or stand upright, yet longed he for the appointed day to fight. The night, which that expected day forewent, scantly the pagan closed his eyes to sleep. He told how night her sliding hours spent, and rose ere springing day began to peep. He called for armor, which incontinent was brought by him that used the same to keep. That harness rich old Aladdin him gave a worthy present for a champion brave. He donned them on, nor long their riches eyed, nor did he aught with so great weight incline. His wanted sword upon his thigh he tied, the blade was old and tough, of temper fine. As when a comet far and wide descried, in scorn of Phoebus, midst bright heaven doth shine, and tidings sad of death and mischief brings to mighty lords, to monarchs, and to kings, so shone the pagan in bright armor clad, and rolled his eyes great, swollen with ire and blood. His dreadful gestures threatened horror sad, and ugly death upon his forehead stood. Not one of all his squires the courage had to approach their master in his angry mood. Above his head he shook his naked blade, and gainst the subtle air vain battle made. The Christian thief, quoth he, that was so bold to combat me in hard and single fight, shall wounded fall inglorious on the mould his locks with clots of blood and dust bedight, and living shall with watery eyes behold how from his back I tear his harness bright, nor shall his dying words me so entreat, but that I'll give his flesh to dogs for meat. Like as a bull, when pricked with jealousy, he spies the rival of his hot desire, through all the fields doth bellow, roar, and cry, and with his thundering voice augments his ire, and threatening battle to the empty sky, tears with his horn each tree, plant, bush, and briar, and with his foot casts up the sand on height, defying his strong foe to deadly fight. Such was the pagan's fury, such his cry. A herald called he then, and thus he spake, Go to the camp, and in my name defy the man that combats for his Jesus' sake. This said, Upon his steed he mounted high, and with him did his noble prisoner take. The town he thus forsook, and on the green he ran as mad or frantic he had been. A bugle small he winded loud and shrill, that made resound the fields and valleys near. Louder than thunder from Olympus' hill seemed that dreadful blast to all that hear. The Christian lords of prowess, strength, and skill within the imperial tent assembled were. The herald there in boasting terms defied Tancredi first, and all the durst beside. With sober cheer, Godfredo looked about, and viewed at leisure every lord and knight. But yet, for all his looks, not one stepped out with courage bold to undertake the fight. Absent were all the Christian champions stout, no news of Tancred since his secret flight. Bowman far off, and banished from the crew was that strong prince who proud Gernando slew. And eke those ten which chosen were by lot, and all the worthies of the camp beside, after Armida false were followed hot, when night was come their secret flight to hide. The rest, their hands and hearts that trusted not, blushed for shame, yet silent still abide. For none there was that sought to purchase fame in so great peril. Fear exited shame. The angry duke their fear discovered plain, 
by their pale looks and silence from each part, and as he moved was with just disdain, these words he said, and from his seat upstart, Unworthy life, I judge, that coward swain to hazard it e'en now that wants the heart, when this vile pagan with his glorious boast dishonors and defies Christ's sacred host. But let my camp sit still in peace and rest, and my life's hazard at their ease behold. Come, bring me here my fairest arms and best, and they were brought sooner than could be told. But gentle Raymond, in his aged breast, who had mature advice and counsel old, than whom in all the camp were none or few of greater might, before Godfredo drew, and gravely said, Ah, let it not betide on one man's hand to venture all this host. No private soldier thou, thou art our guide. If thou miscarry, all our hope were lost. By thee must Babel fall, and all her pride. Of our true faith thou art the prop and post. Rule with thy scepter, conquer with thy word. Let others combat make with spear and sword. Let me this pagan's glorious pride assuage. These aged arms can yet their weapons use. Let others shun Bologna's dreadful rage. These silver locks shall not Raimondo's skews. Oh, that I were in prime of lusty age, like you that this adventure brave refuse, and dare not once lift up your coward eyes against him that you and Christ himself devise. Or as I was when all the lords of fame and German princes great stood by to view, in Conrad's court, the second of that name, when Leopold in single fight I slew. A greater praise I reaped by the same, so strong a foe in combat to subdue, than he should do who all alone should chase or kill a thousand of these pagans base. Within these arms had I that strength again, this boasting Paynim had not lived till now. Yet in this breast doth courage still remain, for age or years these members shall not bow. And if I be in this encounter slain, Scot free Argantes shall not scape, I vow. Give me mine arms, this battle shall with praise augment mine honor got in younger days. The jolly baron old thus bravely spake, his words are spurs to virtue. Every knight that seemed before to tremble and to quake, now talk it bold, example hath such might. Each one the battle fierce would undertake, now strove they all who should begin the fight. Baldwin and Roger both would combat fain, Stephen, Guelpho, Gernier, and the Gerards twain, and Pyrrhus, who with help of Bowman's sword, proud Antioch by cunning sleight oppressed. The battle eke, with many a lowly word, Ralph, Rosamond, and Eberard request, a Scotch, an Irish, and an English lord, whose lands the sea divides far from the rest, and for the fight did likewise humble you, Edward and his Gildippes lovers true but raymond more than all the rest doth sue upon that pagan fierce to wreak his ire now wants he not of all his armors due except his helm that shone like flaming fire to whom godfredo thus o mirror true of antique worth thy courage doth inspire new strength in us of mars in thee doth shine the art the honor and the discipline if ten like thee of valor and of age among these legions I could haply find, I should the heat of Babel's pride assuage, and spread our faith from fuel to furthest Ind. But now, I pray thee, calm thy valiant rage, reserve thyself till greater need us bind, and let the rest, each one, write down his name, and see whom fortune chooseth to this game. Or rather, see whom God's high judgment taketh, to whom is chance and fate and fortune slave. Raymond, his earnest suit not yet forsaketh. His name writ with the residue would he have. Godfrey himself, in his bright helmet, shaketh the scrolls with names of all the champions brave. They drew, and read the first whereon they hit, wherein was Raymond, Earl of Tholu's writ. His name with joy and mighty shouts they bliss, the rest allow his choice, and fortune praise. New vigor blushed through those looks of his, it seemed he now resumed his youthful days. Like 
to a snake whose slough new change it is that shines like gold against the sunny rays but godfrey most approved his fortune high and wished him honor conquest victory then from his side he took his noble brand and giving it to raymond thus he spake this is the sword wherewith in saxon land the great rubello battle used to make from him i took it fighting hand to hand and took his life with it and many a lake of blood with it i have shed since that day with thee god grant it prove as happy may of these delays meanwhile impatient argantes threateneth loud and sternly cries o oh, glorious people of the occident behold him here that all your host defies why comes not tancred whose great hardiment with you is prized so dear pardi he lies still on his pillow and presumes the knight again may shield him from my power and might why then some other come by band and band come all come forth on horseback come on foot if not one man dares combat hand to hand in all the thousands of so great a rout see where the tomb of mary's son doth stand march thither warriors bold what makes you doubt why run you not there for your sins to weep or to what greater need these forces keep thus scorned by the heathen saracine were all the soldiers of christ's sacred name raymond while others at his words repine burst forth in rage he could not bear this shame for fire of courage brighter far doth shine if challenges and threats augment the same so that upon his steed he mounted light which aquilino for his swiftness height this genet was by tagus bred for oft the breeder of these beasts to war assigned when first on trees burgeon the blossoms soft pricked forward with the sting of fertile kind against the air casts up her head aloft and gathereth seed so from the fruitful wind and thus conceiving of the gentle blast a wonder strange and rare she folds at last and had you seen the beast you would have said the light and subtile wind his father was for if his course upon the sands he made no sign was left what way the beast did pass or if he managed were or if he played he scantly bended down the tender grass thus mounted rode the earl and as he went thus prayed to heaven his zealous looks upbent o lord that didst save keep and defend thy servant david from goliath's rage and broughtest that huge giant to his end slain by a faithful child of tender age like grace o lord like mercy now extend let me this vile blasphemous pride assuage that all the world may to thy glory know old men and babes thy foes can overthrow thus prayed the county and his prayers dear strengthened with zeal with godliness and faith before the throne of that great lord appear in whose sweet grace is life death in his wrath among his armies bright and legions clear the lord an angel good selected hath to whom the charge was given to guard the knight and keep him safe from that fierce pagan's might the angel good appointed for the guard of noble raymond from his tender eeld that kept him then and kept him afterward when spear and sword he able was to wield now when his great creator's will he heard that in this fight he should him chiefly shield up to a tower set on a rock did fly where all the heavenly arms and weapons lie there stands the lance wherewith great michael slew the aged dragon in a bloody fight there are the dreadful thunders forged new with storms and plagues that on poor sinners light the massy trident mayst thou pendant view there on a golden pin hung up on height wherewith sometimes he smites this solid land and throws down towns and towers thereon which stand among the blessed weapons there which stands upon a diamond shield his looks he bended so great that it might cover all the lands twixt caucasus and atlas hills extended with it the lord's dear flocks and faithful bands the holy kings and cities are defended the sacred angel took this target sheen and by the christian champion stood unseen but now the walls and turrets round about both young and old with many thousands fill 
The king Clorinda sent, and her brave rout to keep the field. She stayed upon the hill. Godfrey likewise some Christian band sent out, which armed and ranked in good array stood still, and to their champions empty let remain twixt either troop a large and spacious plain. Argantes looked for Tancredi bold, but saw an uncouth foe at last appear. Raymond rode on, and what he asked him told. Better thy chance, Tancred is now elsewhere. Yet glory not of that, myself behold, am come prepared, and bid thee battle here, and in his place, or for myself, to fight. Lo, here I am, who scorn thy heathenish might. The pagan cast a scornful smile, and said, But where is Tancred? Is he still in bed? His looks late seemed to make high heaven afraid, but now for dread he is or dead or fled. But were earth's center or the deep sea made his lurking hole, it should not save his head. Thou liest, he says, to say so brave a knight is fled from thee, who thee exceeds in might. The angry pagan said, I have not spilt my labor then, if thou his place supply. Go take the field, and let's see how thou wilt maintain thy foolish words and that brave lie. Thus parlied they to meet an equal tilt. Each took his aim at other's helm on high. Even in the sight his foe good Raymond hit, but shaked him not, he did so firmly sit. The fierce Circassian missed of his blow a thing which seld befell the man before. The angel by, unseen, his force did know, and far awry the poignant weapon bore. He burst his lance against the sand below, and bit his lips for rage, and cursed, and swore. Against his foe returned he swift as wind, half mad, in arms a second match to find. Like to a ram that butts with horned head, so spurred he forth his horse with desperate race. Raymond, at his right hand, let slide his steed, and as he passed, struck at the pagan's face, who turned again. The brave earl, nothing dread, yet stepped aside, and to his rage gave place, and on his helm with all his strength gan smite, which was so hard his court lax could not bite. The Saracen employed his art and force to gripe his foe within his mighty arms, but he avoided nimbly with his horse. He was no prentice in those fierce alarms, about him made he many a winding course, no strength nor slight the subtle warrior harms. His nimble steed obeyed his ready hand, and where he stepped, no print left in the sand. As when a captain doth besiege some hold set in a marsh or high up on a hill, and trieth ways and wiles a thousandfold to bring the peace subjected to his will, so fared the county with the pagan bold. And when he did his head and breast none ill, his weaker parts he wisely gan assail, and entrance searched oft twixt male and mail. At last he hit him on a place or twain, that on his arms the red blood trickled down, and yet himself untouched did remain. No nail was broke, no plume cut from his crown. Argantes raging spent his strength in vain, waste were his strokes, his thrusts were idle thrown, yet pressed he on, and doubled still his blows, and where he hits he neither cares nor knows. Among a thousand blows the Saracen at last struck one, when Raymond was so near that not the swiftness of his aquiline could his dear lord from that huge danger bear. But lo, at hand unseen was help divine, which saves when worldly comforts none appear. The angel on his targe received that stroke, and on that shield Argante's sword was broke. The sword was broke, therein no wonder lies if earthly tempered metal could not hold against that target forged above the skies. Down fell the blade in pieces on the mould. The proud Circassian scant believed his eyes, though naught were left him but the hilts of gold, and full of thoughts amazed a while he stood, wondering the Christian's armor was so good. The brittle web of that rich sword he thought was broke through hardness of the county's shield, and so thought Raymond, who discovered not what succor heaven did for his safety yield. But when he saw the man against whom he fought unweaponed, still stood he in the field. His noble heart esteemed the glory light at such advantage if he slew the knight. Go fetch, he would have said, another blade, when in his heart a better thought arose, how for Christ's glory he was champion made, how Godfrey had him to this combat chose, the army's honor on his shoulder laid, to hazards new he list not that expose. 
while thus his thoughts debated on the case, the hilt, Argantes hurled at his face, and forward spurred his mounter fierce withal, within his arms longing his foe to strain, upon whose helm the heavy blow did fall, and bent well nigh the metal to his brain. But he, whose courage was heroical, leapt by and makes the pagan's onset vain, and wounds his hand, which he outstretched saw fiercer than eagle's talon, lion's paw. Now here, now there, on every side he rode with nimble speed, and spurred now out, now in, and as he went and came, still laid on load where Lord Agante's arms were weak and thin. All that huge force which in his arms abode, his wrath, his ire, his great desire to win, against his foe together all he bent, and heaven and fortune furthered his intent. But he, whose courage for no peril fails, well armed and better hearted, scorns his power. Like a tall ship, when spent are all her sails, which still resists the rage of storm and shower, whose mighty ribs, fast bound with bands and nails, withstand fierce Neptune's wrath for many an hour, and yields not up her bruised keel to winds, in whose stern blast no ruth or grace she finds. Argantes, such thy present danger was, when Satan stirred to aid thee at thy need. In human shape he forged an airy mass, and made the shade a body seem indeed. Well might the spirit for Clorinda pass, like her it was in armor and in weed, in stature, beauty, countenance, and face, in looks, in speech, in gesture, and in pace. And for the sprite should seem the same indeed, from where she was, whose show and shape it had, towards the wall it rode with feigned speed, where stood the people all dismayed and sad to see their knight of help have so great need. And yet the law of arms all help forbade. There in a turret sat a soldier stout to watch, and at a loophole peep it out. The spirit spake to him, called Oradine, the noblest archer then that handled bow. O oh, Aradin, quoth she, whose straightest line canst shoot, and hit each mark set high or low, if yonder knight, alas, be slain in fine, as likest is, great ruth it were, you know, and greater shame if his victorious foe should with his spoils triumphant homeward go. Now prove thy skill, thine arrow's sharp head dip in yonder thievish Frenchman's guilty blood. I promise thee thy sovereign shall not slip to give thee large rewards for such a good. Thus said the sprite. The man did laugh and skip for hope of future gain, no longer stood, but from his quiver huge a shaft he hent, and set it in his mighty bow new bent. Twanged the string, out flew the quarrel long, and through the subtle air did singing pass. It hit the knight, the buckles rich among wherewith his precious girdle fastened was. It bruised them and pierced his hauberk strong. Some little blood down trickled on the grass. Light was the wound. The angel by, unseen, the sharp head blunted of the weapon keen. Raymond drew forth the shaft, as much behooved, and with the steel his blood outstreaming came. With bitter words his foe he then reproved, for breaking faith to his eternal shame. Godfrey, whose careful eyes from his beloved were never turned, saw and marked the same, and when he viewed the wounded county bleed, he sighed and feared more perchance than need and with his words and with his threatening eyes he stirred his captains to revenge that wrong. Forthwith the spurred courser forward highs, within their rests put were their lances long, from either side a squadron brave outflies, and boldly made a fierce encounter strong. The raised dust to overspread begun their shining arms, and far more shining sun. Of breaking spears, of ringing helms and shield, a dreadful rumor roared on every side. There lay a horse, Another through the field ran masterless, dismounted was his guide. Here one lay dead, there did another yield, some sighed, some sobbed, some prayed, and some cried. Fierce was the fight, and longer still it lasted, fiercer and fewer, still themselves they wasted. Argantes nimbly leaped amid the throng, and from a soldier wrung an iron mace, and breaking through the ranks and ranges long, therewith he passage made himself and place. Raymond he sought the thickest press among, to take revenge for late received disgrace. A greedy wolf he seemed, and would assuage with Raymond's blood his hunger and his rage. The way he found, not easy as he would, but fierce encounters put him off to pain. He met Ormano and Rogero Bold, of Balneville Guy and the Gerards twain. 
Yet nothing might his rage and haste withhold, These worthies strove to stop him but in vain, With these strong lets increased still his ire, Like rivers stopped, or closely smoldered fire. He slew Ormano, wounded Guy, And laid Rogero low among the people slain, on every side new troops the man invade, Yet all their blows were waste, their onsets vain. But while Argantes thus his prizes played, And seemed alone this skirmish to sustain, The duke his brother called, and thus he spake, Go with thy troop, fight for thy saviour's sake, There enter in where hottest is the fight, Thy force against the left wing strongly bend. This said, so brave an onset gave the knight, That many a pain him bold there made his end. The Turks too weak seemed to sustain his might, And could not from his power their lives defend. Their ensigns rent, and broke was their array, And men and horse on heaps together lay. Or thrown likewise away the right wing ran, Nor was there one again that turned his face, Save bold Argantes, else fled every man. Fear drove them thence on heaps with headlong chase. He stayed alone, and battle new began. Five hundred men, weaponed with sword and mace, so great resistance never could have made as did Argantes with his single blade. The strokes of swords and thrusts of many a spear, the shock of many a just he long sustained. He seemed of strength enough this charge to bear, and time to strike now here, now there he gained it. His armors broke, his members bruised were, he sweat and bled, yet courage still he fainted. But now his foes upon him pressed so fast that with their weight they bore him back at last. His back against this storm at length he turned, Whose headlong fury bore him backward still, Not like to one that fled, But one that mourned because he did his foes no greater ill. His threatening eyes like flaming torches burned, His courage thirsted yet more blood to spill, And every way and every mean he sought To stay his flying mates, but all for naught. This good he did, while thus he played his part, his bands and troops at ease and safe retired. Yet coward dread lacks order, fear wants art, deaf to attend, commanded, or desired. But Godfrey, that perceived in his wise heart how his bold knights to victory aspired, fresh soldiers sent to make more quick pursuit, and helped to gather conquest's precious fruit. But this, alas, was not the pointed day set down by heaven to end this mortal war. The western lords this time had borne away the prize for which they traveled had so far, had not the devils, that saw the sure decay of their false kingdom by this bloody war, at once made heaven and earth with darkness blind, and stirred up tempests, storms, and blustering wind. Heaven's glorious lamp, wrapped in an ugly veil of shadows dark, was hid from mortal eye and hell's grim blackness did bright skies assail. On every side the fiery lightnings fly, the thunders roar, the streaming rain and hail pour down, and make that sea which erst was dry. The tempests rend the oaks, and cedars break, and make not trees but rocks and mountains shake. The rain, the lightning, and the raging wind beat in the Frenchman's eyes with hideous force, the soldiers stayed amazed in heart and mind, the terror such that stopped both man and horse. Surprised with this ill, no way they find whither for succor to direct their course. But wise Clorinda soon an advantage spied, and spurring forth, thus to her soldiers cried, You hardy men at arms, behold, quoth she, how heaven, how justice in our aid doth fight. Our visages are from this tempest free, our hands at will may wield our weapons bright. The fury of this friendly storm you see upon the foreheads of our foes doth light, and blinds their eyes. Then let us take the tide. Come, follow me. Good fortune be our guide. This said, against her foes, on rode the dame, and turned their backs against the wind and rain. Upon the French, with furious rage, she came, and scorned those idle blows they struck in vain. Argantes at the instant did the same, and them who chased him now chased again. Not but his fearful back each Christian shows against the tempest and against their blows. The cruel hail and deadly wounding blade upon their shoulders smote them as they fled. The blood new spilt while thus they slaughter made, the water fallen from skies had dyed red. Among the murdered bodies Pyrrhus laid, and valiant Rafe his heart blood there outbled. The first subdued by strong Argantes' might, the second conquered by that virgin knight. 
Thus fled the French, and them pursued in chase The wicked sprites and all the Syrian train. But gainst their force and gainst the fell menace Of hail and wind, of tempest and of rain, Godfrey alone turned his audacious face, Blaming his barons for their fear so vain. Himself at the camp gate boldly stood to keep, And saved his men within his trenches deep. And twice upon Argantes proud he flew, And beat him backward Mogor all his might, And twice his thirsty sword he did embrew In pagan's blood, where thickest was the fight. At last himself with all his folk withdrew, And that day's conquest gave the virgin bright. Which got, she home retired with all her men, And thus she chased this lion to his den. Yet ceased not the fury and the ire Of these huge storms of wind, of rain, and hail. Now was it dark, now shone the lightning fire, the wind and water every place assail. No bank was safe, no rampire left entire, no tent could stand when beam and cordage fail. Wind, thunder, rain, all gave a dreadful sound, and with that music deft the trembling ground. End of Book 7Book Eight of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso, translated by Edward Fairfax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The argument: A messenger to Godfrey Sage doth tell the Prince of Denmark's valor, death, and end. The Italians, trusting signs untrue too well, think their Rinaldo slain. The wicked fiend breeds fury in their breasts. Their bosoms swell with ire and hate, and war and strife forth send. They threaten Godfrey. He prays to the Lord, and calms their fury with his look and word. Now were the skies of storms and tempests cleared. Lord Aeolus shut up his winds in hold. The silver-mantled morning fresh appeared, with roses crowned and buskined high with gold. The spirits yet, which had these tempests reared, Their malice would still more and more unfold. And one of them, that Astragor was named, His speeches thus to foul Alecto framed. Alecto, see, we could not stop nor stay The night that to our foes new tidings brings, Who from the hands escaped with life away Of that great prince, chief of all pagan kings, He comes, the fall of his slain lord, to say, of death and loss he tells, and such sad things, great news he brings, and greatest danger is Bertoldo's son shall be called home for this. Thou know'st what would befall, bestir thee then, prevent with craft what force could not withstand. Turn to their evil the speeches of the man, with his own weapon wound Godfredo's hand. Kindle debate, infect with poison wan the English, Switzer, and Italian band. Great tumult move, make brawls and quarrels rife, Set all the camp on uproar and at strife. This act beseems thee well, and of the deed Much mayst thou boast before our lord and king. Thus said the sprite, persuasion small did need, The monster grants to undertake the thing. Meanwhile the knight, whose coming thus they dread, Before the camp his weary limbs doth bring, And well nigh breathless, warriors bold, he cried, who shall conduct me to your famous guide? An hundred strove the stranger's guide to be, To hearken news the knights by heaps assemble. The man fell lowly down upon his knee, And kissed the hand that made proud Babel tremble. Right puissant lord, whose valiant acts, quoth he, The sands and stars in number best resemble. Would God some gladder news I might unfold? And there he paused and sighed. Then thus he told, Sweno, the king of Denmark's only heir, the stay and staff of his declining yield, longed to be among these squadrons fair, who for Christ's faith here serve with spear and shield. No weariness, no storms of sea or air, no dear contents as crowns and scepters yield, no such entreaties of so kind a sire could in his bosom quench that glorious fire. He thirsted sore to learn this warlike art of thee, great lord and master of the same, and was ashamed in his noble heart that never act he did deserved fame. Besides, the news and tidings from each part of young Rinaldo's worth and praises came, 
but that which most his courage stirred hath is zeal, religion, godliness, and faith. He hasted forward then without delay, and with him took of knights a chosen band, directly towards Thrace we took the way to Byzance old, chief fortress of that land. There the Greek monarch gently prayed him stay, and there an herald sent from you we fand. How Antioch was one who first declared, and how defended nobly afterward. Defended gainst Corbana, valiant knight, that all the Persian armies had to guide and brought so many soldiers bold to fight, that void of men he left that kingdom wide. He told thine acts, thy wisdom, and thy might, and told the deeds of many a lord beside. His speech at length to young Rinaldo passed, and told his great achievements first and last, and how this noble camp of yours of late besieged had this town, and in what sort, and how you prayed him to participate of the last conquest of this noble fort. In hardy Sueno opened was the gate of worthy anger by this brave report, so that each hour seemed five years long till he were fighting with these pagans strong. And while the herald told your fights and phrase, himself of cowardice reproved, he thought, and him to stay that counsels him or praise, he hears not, or, else heard, regardeth not. He fears no perils, but, whilst he delays, lest this last work without his help be wrought. In this his doubt, in this his danger lies, no hazard else he fears, no peril spies. Thus hasting on, he hasted on his death, death that to him and us was fatal guide. The rising morn appeared yet uneath, when he and we were armed and fit to ride. The nearest way seemed best, o'er Holt and Heth we went, through deserts waste and forests wide. The straits and ways he openeth as he goes, and sets each land free from intruding foes. Now want of food, now dangerous ways we find, now open war, now ambush closely laid. Yet passed we forth, all perils left behind, our foes or dead or run away afraid. A victory so happy blew the wind, that careless all and heedless too it made, until one day his tents he happed to rear, to Palestine, when we approach it near. There did our scouts return, and bring us news that dreadful noise of horse and arms they hear, and that they deemed, by sundry signs and shows, there was some mighty host of pagans near. At these sad tidings, many changed their hues. Some looked pale for dread, some shook for fear. Only our noble lord was altered not in look, in face, in gesture, or in thought, but said, a crown prepare you to possess of martyrdom or happy victory. For this I hope, for that I wish no less, of greater merit and of greater glory, brethren, this camp will shortly be, I guess, a temple sacred to our memory, to which the holy men of future age to view our graves shall come in pilgrimage. This said, he set the watch in order right to guard the camp along the trenches deep. And as he armed was, so every night he willed on his back his arms to keep. Now had the stillness of the quiet night drowned all the world in silence and in sleep, when suddenly we heard a dreadful sound, which deaf to the earth and tremble made the ground. Arm, arm, they cried. Prince Sueno, at the same glistering and shining steel, leapt foremost out. His visage shone, his noble looks did flame with kindled brand of courage bold and stout. And lo, the pagans to assault us came, and with huge numbers hemmed us round about. A forest thick of spears about us grew, and over us a cloud of arrows flew. Uneven the fight, unequal was the fray, our enemies were twenty men to one. On every side the slain and wounded lay, unseen where naught but glistering weapons shone. The number of the dead could no man say, so was the place with darkness overgone. The night her mantle black upon us spreads, hiding our losses and our valiant deeds. But hardy Sueno, midst the other twain, by his great acts was well descried, I wot. No darkness could his valor's daylight stain. Such wondrous blows on every side he smote, a stream of blood, a bank of bodies slain, about him made a bulwark and a moat. And when so e'er he turned his fatal brand, dread in his looks and death sat in his hand. Thus fought we till the morning bright appeared, and strewed roses on the azure sky. 
But when her lamp had night's thick darkness cleared, Wherein the bodies dead did buried lie, Then our sad cries to heaven for grief we reared. Our loss apparent was, for we descry How all our camp destroyed was almost, And all our people well nigh slain and lost. Of thousands twain and hundred scamps survived. When Sueno murdered saw each valiant knight, I know not if his heart in sun derived, For dear compassion of that woeful sight. He showed no change, but said, Since so deprived we are of all our friends, By chance of fight, come, follow them, The path to heaven their blood marks out, Now angels made of martyrs good. This said, and glad I think of death at hand, the signs of heavenly joy shone through his eyes, of Saracens against a mighty band, with fearless heart and constant breast he flies. No steel could shield them from his cutting brand, but whom he hits, without recure he dies. He never struck, but felled or killed his foe, and wounded was himself from top to toe. Not strength, but courage now preserved on live this hardy champion, fortress of our faith. Strucken he strikes, still stronger more they strive, The more they hurt him, more he doth them scathe. When towards him a furious knight gan drive, Of members huge, fierce looks, and full of wrath, That with the aid of many a pagan crew, After long fight, at last Prince Sueno slew. Ah, heavy chance, down fell the valiant youth, Nor amongst us all did one so strong appear As to revenge his death. That this is truth, by his dear blood and noble bones I swear, That of my life I had not care nor ruth, No wounds I shunned, no blows I would off bear, And had not heaven my wished end denied, Even there I should, and willing should, have died. Alive I fell among my fellows slain, Yet wounded, so that each one thought me dead. Nor what our foes did since can I explain, so sore amazed was my heart and head. But when I opened first my eyes again, Night's curtain black upon the earth was spread, And through the darkness to my feeble sight Appeared the twinkling of a slender light. Not so much force or judgment in me lies As to discern things seen and not mistake. I saw like them who ope and shut their eyes by turns, Now half asleep, now half awake. My body eke another torment tries, My wounds began to smart, my hurts to ache, For every sore each member pinched was With night's sharp air, heaven's frost, and earth's cold grass. But still the light approached near and near, And with the same a whispering murmur run, Till at my side arrived both they were, When I to spread my feeble eyes begun. Two men, behold, in vestures long appear, With each a lamp in hand, who said, O son, in that dear Lord who helps his servants, Trust, who, ere they ask, grants all things to the just. This said, each one his sacred blessings Flings upon my course with broad outstretched hand, And mumbled hymns and psalms and holy things, Which I could neither hear nor understand. Arise, quoth they, with that, as I had wings, all whole and sound, I leaped up from the land. O oh, miracle, sweet, gentle, strange, and true! My limbs new strength received, and vigor new. I gazed on them, like one whose heart denaith To think that done he sees so strangely wrought. Till one said thus, O oh, thou of little faith, What doubts perplex thy unbelieving thought? Each one of us a living body hath, we are Christ's chosen servants, fear us not, Who to avoid the world's allurements vain In willful penance, hermits poor remain. Us, messengers, to comfort thee elect, That Lord hath sent that rules both heaven and hell, Who often doth his blessed will effect By such weak means as wonder is to tell. He will not that this body lie neglect, Wherein so noble soul did lately dwell, to which again, when it uprisen is, It shall united be in lasting bliss. I say, Lord Sueno's corpse, For which prepared a tomb there is according to his worth, By which his honor shall be far declared, And his just praises spread from south to north.
but lift thine eyes up to the heavens word mark yonder light that like the sun shines forth that shall direct thee with those beams so clear to find the body of thy master dear with that i saw from cynthia's silver face like to a falling star a beam down slide that bright as golden line marked out the place and lightened with clear streams the forest wide so latmos shone when phoebe left the chase and laid her down by her endymion side such was the light that well discern i could his shape his wounds his face though dead yet bold he lay not grovelling now but as a knight that ever had to heavenly things desire so towards heaven the prince lay bolt upright like him that upward still sought to aspire his right hand closed held his weapon bright ready to strike and execute his ire his left upon his breast was humbly laid that men might know that while he died he prayed while on his wounds with bootless tears i wept that neither helped him nor eased my care one of those aged fathers to him stepped and forced his hand that needless weapons spare this sword quoth he hath yet good token kept that of the pagan's blood he drunk his share and blushed still he could not save his lord rich strong and sharp was never better sword heaven therefore will not though the prince be slain who used erst to wield this precious brand that so brave blade unused should remain but that it pass from strong to stronger hand who with like force can wield the same again and longer shall in grace of fortune stand and with the same shall bitter vengeance take on him that Sueno slew for Sueno's sake. Great Solomon killed Sueno. Solomon, for Sueno's sake, upon this sword must die. Here, take the blade, and with it haste thee then thither where Godfrey doth encamped lie, and fear not thou that any shall or can or stop thy way or lead thy steps awry. For he that doth thee on this message send, thee with his hand shall guide, keep, and defend arrived there it is his blessed will with true report that thou declare and tell the zeal the strength the courage and the skill in thy beloved lord that late did dwell how for christ's sake he came his blood to spill and sample left to all of doing well that future ages may admire his deed and courage take when his brave end they read it resteth now thou know that gentle knight that of this sword shall be thy master's heir it is rinaldo young with whom in might and martial skill no champion may compare. Give it to him, and say, the heavens bright of this revenge, to him commit the care. While thus I listened what this old man said, a wonder new from further speech I stayed. For there, whereas the wounded body lay, a stately tomb with curious work, behold, and wondrous art, was built out of the clay, which rising round the carcass did enfold with words engraven in the marble gray the warrior's name his worth and praise the told on which i gazing stood and often read that epitaph of my dear master dead among his soldiers quoth the hermit here must sueno's corpse remain in marble chest while up to heaven are flown their spirits dear to live in endless joy forever blest his funeral thou hast with many a tear accompanied it's now high time to rest come be my guest until the morning ray shall light the world again then take thy way this said he led me over holts and hags through thorns and bushes scant my legs i drew till underneath a heap of stones and crags at last he brought me to a secret new among the bears wild boars the wolves and stags there dwelt he safe with his disciple true and feared no treason, force, nor hurt at all. His guiltless conscience was his castle's wall. My supper, roots. My bed was moss and leaves. But weariness in little rest found ease. But when the purple morning night bereaves of late usurped rule on land and seas, his loathed couch each wakeful hermit leaves. To pray rose they, and I, for so they please, I conge took when ended was the same, and hitherward, as they advised me, came. 
The Dane his woeful tale had done, when thus the good Prince Godfrey answered him, Sir Knight, thou bringest tidings sad and dolorous, for which our heavy camp laments of right, since so brave troops and so dear friends to us one hour hath spent in one unlucky fight. And so appeared hath thy master stout as lightning doth, now kindled, now quenched out. But such a death and end exceedeth all the conquests vain of realms or spoils of gold, nor aged Rome's proud stately capital did ever triumph yet like theirs behold. They sit in heaven on throne celestial, crowned with glory for their conquest bold, where each his hurts, I think, to others shows, and glories in those bloody wounds and blows. But thou, who hast part of thy race to run, with haps and hazards of this world it tossed, rejoice for those high honors they have won, which cannot be by chance or fortune crossed. But for thou askest for Bertoldo's son, know that he wandereth, banished from this host, and till of him new tidings some man tell, within this camp I deem it best thou dwell. These words of theirs in many a soul renewed the sweet remembrance of fair Sophia's child, some with salt tears for him their cheeks bedewed, lest evil tide him amongst the pagans wild, and every one his valiant prowess showed, and of his battles stories long compiled telling the Dane his acts and conquests past, which made his ears amazed, his heart aghast. Now when remembrance of the youth had wrought a tender pity in each softened mind, behold, return at home with all they caught, the bands that were to forage late assigned, and with them in abundance great they brought both flocks and herds of every sort and kind, and corn, although not much, and hay to feed their noble steeds and coursers when they need. They also brought, of misadventure sad, tokens and signs seemed too apparent true. Rinaldo's armor, frushed and hacked they had, oft pierced through with blood besmeared new. About the camp, for always rumors bad are farthest spread, these woeful tidings flew, thither assembled straight both high and low, longing to see what they were loath to know. His heavy hauberk was both seen and known, and his broad shield, wherein displayed flies the bird that proves her chickens for her own, by looking against the sun with open eyes. That shield was to the pagans often shown in many a hard and hardy enterprise. But now, with many a gash and many a stroke, they see and sigh to see it frushed and broke. While all his soldiers whispered underhand, and here and there the fault and cause do lay, Godfrey before him called Alaprand, captain of those that brought of late this prey, a man who did on points of virtue stand, blameless in words, and true whate'er he say. Say, quoth the duke, where you this armor had? Hide not the truth, but tell it, good or bad. He answered him, as far from hence think I, as on two days a speedy post well rideth to Gaza word, a little plain doth lie, itself among the steepy hills which hideth. Through it, slow falling from the mountains high, a rolling brook twixt bush and bramble glideth, clad with thick shade of boughs and broad-leaved treen, fit place for men to lie in wait unseen. Thither to seek some flocks or herds we went, perchance close hid under the greenwood shaw, and found the springing grass with blood besprent. A warrior tumbled in this blood we saw, his arms, though dusty, bloody, hacked and rent, yet well we knew when near the course we draw, to which, to view his face, in vain I started, for from his body his fair head was parted. His right hand wanted eke, with many a wound, the trunk through pierced was from back to breast, a little by his empty helm we found a silver eagle shining on his crest. To spy at whom to ask, we gazed round. A churl then toward us his steps addressed, but when us armed by the course he spied, he ran away his fearful face to hide. But we pursued him, took him, spake him fair, till comforted at last he answered made, how that the day before he saw repair a band of soldiers from that forest shade, of whom one carried by the golden hair a head, but late cut off with murdering blade, 
the face was fair and young and on the chin no sign of beard to bud yet did begin and how in sendal wrapped away he bore that head with him hung at his saddle bow and how the murderers by the arms they wore for soldiers of our camp he well did know the carcass i disarmed and weeping sore because i guessed who should that harness owe away i brought it but first order gave that noble body should be laid in grave but if it be his trunk whom i believe a nobler tomb his worth deserveth well this said good aliprando took his leave of certain truth he had no more to tell sore sighed the duke so did these news him grieve fears in his heart doubts in his bosom dwell he yearned to know to find and learn the truth and punish would them that had slain the youth but now the night to spread her lazy wings o'er the broad fields of heaven's bright wilderness sleep the soul's rest and ease of careful things buried in happy peace both more and less thou argelan alone whom sorrow stings still wakest musing on great deeds i guess nor sufferest in thy watchful eyes to creep the sweet repose of mild and gentle sleep this man was strong of limbs and all his says were bold of ready tongue and working sprite near trento born bred up in brawls and frays in jars in quarrels and in civil fight for which exiled the hills and public ways he filled with blood and robberies day and night until to asia's wars at last he came and boldly there he served and purchased fame he closed his eyes at last when day drew near yet slept he not but senseless lay oppressed with strange amazedness and sudden fear which false electo breathed in his breast his working powers within deluded were stone still he quiet lay yet took no rest for to his thought the fiend herself presented and with strange visions his weak brain tormented a murdered body huge beside him stood of head and right hand both but lately spoiled his left hand bore the head whose visage good both pale and wan with dust and gore defoiled yet spake though dead with whose sad words the blood forth at his lips in huge abundance boiled fly argelan from this false camp fly far whose guide a traitor captains murderers are godfrey hath murdered me by treason vile what favor then hope you my trusty friends his villain heart is full of fraud and guile to your destruction all his thoughts he bends yet if thou thirst for praise of noble style if in thy strength thou trust thy strength that ends all hard assays fly not first with his blood appease my ghost wandering by lethe's flood i will thy weapon wet inflame thine ire arm thy right hand and strengthen every part this said even while she spake she did inspire with fury rage and wrath his troubled heart the man awaked and from his eyes like fire the poisoned sparks of headstrong madness start and armed as he was forth as he gone and gathered all the talian bands in one he gathered them where lay the arms that late were good rinaldo's then with semblance stout and furious words his foreconceived hate in bitter speeches thus he vomits out is not this people barbarous and ingrate in whom truth finds no place faith takes no root whose thirst unquenched is of blood and gold whom no yoke aboweth bridle none can hold so much we suffered have these seven years long under this servile and unworthy yoke that thorough rome and italy are wrong a thousand years hereafter shall be spoke i count not how cilicia's kingdom strong subdued was by prince tancredi's stroke nor how false baldwin him that land bereaves of virtue's harvest fraud there reap the sheaves nor speak i how each hour at every need quick ready resolute at all assays with fire and sword we hasted forth with speed and bore the brunt of all their fights and frays 
But when we had performed and done the deed, At ease and leisure they divide the praise. We reaped not but travail for our toil. Theirs was the praise, the realms, the gold, the spoil. Yet all this season were we willing blind, Offended, unrevenged, wronged, but unbroken. Light griefs could not provoke our quiet mind. But now, alas, the mortal blow is stroken. Rinaldo have they slain, and law of kind, Of arms of nations, and of high heaven broken. Why doth not heaven kill them with fire and thunder, To swallow them, why cleaves not earth asunder? They have Rinaldo slain, The sword and shield of Christ's true faith, And unrevenged he lies. Still unrevenged lieth on the field His noble course, to feed the crows and pies. Who murdered him? Who shall us certain yield? Who sees not that, although he wanted eyes? Who knows not how the Italian chivalry Proud Godfrey and false Baldwin doth envie? What need we further proof? Heaven, heaven, I swear, will not consent Herein we be beguiled. This night I saw his murdered sprite appear, Pale, sad, and wan, with wounds and blood defiled, A spectacle full both of grief and fear. Godfrey, for murdering him, the ghost reviled. I saw it was no dream before mine eyes, Howe'er I look, still, still, methinks it flies. What shall we do? Shall we be governed still by this false hand, Contaminate with blood? Or else depart and travel forth, Until to Euphrates we come, that sacred flood? There dwells a people void of martial skill, Whose cities rich, whose land is fat and good, Where kingdoms great we may at ease provide, Far from these Frenchmen's malice, from their pride. Then let us go, and no revengement take for this brave knight, Though it lie in our power. No, no, that courage rather newly wake, Which never sleeps in fear and dread one hour, And this pestiferous serpent, Poisoned snake of all our knights that have destroyed the flower, first let us slay, and his deserved end example make to him that kills his friend. I will, I will, if your courageous force dareth so much as it can well perform, tear out his cursed heart without remorse, the nest of treason false and guile enorm. Thus spake the angry knight, with headlong course the rest him followed like a furious storm. Arm, arm, they cried, to arms the soldiers ran, and as they run, Arm, arm, cried every man. Mongst them Electo strewed wasteful fire, Envenoming the hearts of most and least. Folly, disdain, madness, strife, rancor, ire, Thirst to shed blood in every breast increased. This ill spread far, until it set on fire with rage, The Italian lodgings never ceased. From thence unto the Switzer's camp it went, And last infected every English tent. Not public loss of their beloved knight alone Stirred up their rage and wrath untamed, But four conceived griefs and quarrels light Their ire still nourished and still inflamed. Awaked was each former cause of spite, The Frenchmen cruel and unjust they named, And with bold threats they made their hatred known, Hate seld kept close, and oft unwisely shown. Like boiling liquor in a seething pot That fumeth, swelleth high, and bubbleth fast, Till o'er the brims among the embers hot Part of the broth and of the scum it cast, Their rage and wrath those few appeased not, In whom of wisdom yet remained some taste. Camillo, William, Tancred were away, And all whose greatness might their madness stay. Now headlong ran to harness in this heat These furious people, all on heaps confused. The roaring trumpets battle gan to threat, As it in time of mortal war is used. The messengers ran to Godfredo great, And bade him arm, while on this noise he mused. And Baldwin first, well clad in iron hard, Stepped to his side, a sure and faithful guard. Their murmurs heard, to heaven he lift his e'en, as was his wont, to God for aid he fled. O Lord, thou knowest this right hand of mine abhorred ever civil blood to shed. Illumine their dark souls with light divine. Repress their rage. 
by hellish fury bred the innocency of my guiltless mind thou knowst and make these know with fury blind tis said he felt infused in each vein a sacred heat from heaven above distilled a heat in man that courage could constrain that his brave look with awful boldness filled well guarded forth he went to meet the train of those that would revenge rinaldo killed and though their threats he heard and saw them bent to arms on every side yet on he went above his hauberk strong a coat he wear embroidered fair with pearl and richest stone his hands were naked and his face was bare wherein a lamp of majesty bright shone he shook his golden lance wherewith he dare resist the force of his rebellious foe thus he appeared and thus he gan them teach in shape an angel and a god in speech what foolish words what threats be these i hear what noise of arms who dares these tumults move am i so honoured stand you so in fear where is your late obedience where your love of godfrey's falsehood who can witness bear who dare or will these accusations prove perchance you look i should entreaties bring sue for your favours or excuse the thing ah god forbid these lands should hear or see him so disgraced at whose great name they quake this sceptre and my noble acts for me a true defence before the world can make yet for sharp justice governed shall be with clemency i will no vengeance take for this offence but for rinaldo's love i pardon you hereafter wiser prove but argilano's guilty blood shall wash this stain away who kindled this debate and led by hasty rage and fury rash to these disorders first undid the gate while thus he spoke the lightning beams did flash out of his eyes of majesty and state that argilon who would have thought it shook for fear and terror conquered with his look the rest with indiscreet and foolish wrath who threatened late with words of shame and pride whose hands so ready were to harm and staff and brandished light swords on every side now hushed and still attend what godfrey saith with shame and fear their bashful looks they hide and argolan they let in chains be bound although their weapons him environed round so when a lion shakes his dreadful mane and beats his tail with courage proud and wroth if his commander come who first took pain to tame his youth his lofty crest down goeth his threats he feareth and obeys the reign of thraldom base and servicage though loath nor can his sharp teeth nor his armed paws force him rebel against his ruler's laws fame is a winged warrior they beheeld with semblant fierce and furious look that stood and in his left hand had a splendent shield wherewith he covered safe their chieftain good his other hand a naked sword did wield from which distilling fell the lukewarm blood the blood perdi of many a realm and town whereon the lord his wrath had poured down thus was the tumult without bloodshed ended their arms laid down strife into exile sent godfrey his thoughts to greater actions bended and homeward to his rich pavilion went for to assault the fortress he intended before the second or third day were spent meanwhile his timber wrought he oft surveyed whereof his rams and engines great he made end of book eight book nine of jerusalem delivered by torquato tasso translated by edward fairfax this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Thomas Copeland The Argument Electo, false, great Solomon, doth move by night the Christians in their tents to kill. But God, who their intents saw from above, sends Michael down from his sacred hill. 
The spirits foul to hell the angel drove. The knights, delivered from the witch, at will destroy the pagans, scatter all their host. The soldan flies when all his bands are lost. The grisly child of Erebus the grim, who saw these tumults done and tempests spent, gainst stream of grace, who ever strove to swim, and all her thoughts against heaven's wisdom bent, departed now. Bright Titan's beams were dim, and fruitful lands waxed barren as she went. She sought the rest of her infernal crew, new storms to raise, new broils and tumults new. She that well wist her sisters had enticed, by their false arts far from the Christian host, Tancred, Rinaldo, and the rest, best prized for martial skill, for might esteemed most, said, of these discords and these strifes advised, Great Solomon, when day his light hath lost, These Christians shall assail with sudden war, And kill them all, while thus they strive and jar. With that, where Solomon remained, she flew, And found him out with his Arabian bands. Great Solomon, of all Christ's foes untrue, Boldest of courage, mightiest of his hands, like him was none of all that earth-bred crew that heaped mountains on the Monian sands. Of Turks he sovereign was, and Nice his seat, where late he dwelt, and ruled that kingdom great. The lands fornents the Greekish shore he held, from Sangar's mouth to crooked Meander's fall, where they of Phrygia, Mysia, Lydia dwelled, Bithynia's towns and Pontus cities all. But when the hearts of Christian princes swelled and rose in arms to make proud Asia thrall, those lands were one where he did scepter wield, and he twice beaten was in pitched field. When fortune oft he had in vain assayed, and spent his forces, which availed him not, to Egypt's king himself he close conveyed, who welcomed him as he could best have thought, glad in his heart and inly well appaid that to his course so great a lord was brought. For he decreed his armies huge to bring to succor Judah's land and Judah's king. But ere he open war proclaimed, he would that Solomon should kindle first the fire, and with huge sums of false enticing gold, the Arabian thieves he sent him forth to hire, while he the Asian lords and Morians bold unites. The Soldan won to his desire those outlaws, ready a for gold to fight. The hope of gain hath such alluring might. Thus made their captain, to destroy and burn in Judah land he entered is so far, that all the ways whereby he should return, by Godfrey's people kept and stopped are. And now he gan his former losses mourn. This wound had hit him on an elder scar. On great adventures ran his hardy thought, but not assured, he yet resolved on naught. To him Electo came, and semblant bore of one whose age was great, whose looks were grave, whose cheeks were bloodless, and whose locks were hoar, mustaches shrouting long, and chin close shave. A steepled turban on her head she wore, her garment wide, and by her side her glaive her gilded quiver at her shoulders hung, and in her hand a bow was stiff and strong. We have, quoth she, through wildernesses gone, through sterile sands, strange paths, and uncouth ways, yet spoil or booty have we gotten none, nor victory deserving fame or praise. Godfrey, meanwhile, to ruin stick and stone of this fair town with battery sore assays, and if a while we rest, we shall behold this glorious city smoking lie in mould. Are sheep coats burnt, or praise of sheep or kine, the cause why Suleiman these bands did arm? Canst thou that kingdom lately lost of thine recover thus, or thus redress thy harm? No, no, when heaven's small candles next shall shine, within their tents give them a bold alarm. Believe Araspes old, whose grave advice thou hast in exile proved, and proved in nice. He feareth not, he doubts no sudden broil from these ill-armed and worse-hearted bands. 
He thinks this people, used to rob and spoil, to such exploit dares not lift up their hands. Up then, and with thy courage put to foil this fearless camp, while thus secure it stands. This said, her poison in his breast she hides, and then to shapeless air unseen she glides. The Soldan cried, O thou which in my thought increased hast my rage and fury so, nor seemst a wight of mortal metal wrought, I follow thee whereso thou list to go. Mountains of men by dint of sword brought down thou shalt behold, and seas of red blood flow where'er I go. Only be thou my guide, when sable night the azure skies shall hide. When this was said, he mustered all his crew, reproved the cowards and allowed the bold. His forward camp, inspired with courage new, was ready dight to follow where he would. Electo's self the warning trumpet blew, and to the wind his standard great unrolled. Thus on they marched, and thus on they went, of their approach their speed the news prevent. Electo left them, and her person dight like one that came some tidings new to tell. It was the time when first the rising night her sparkling diamonds poureth forth to sell. When, into Sion come, she marched right where Judah's aged tyrant used to dwell, to whom of Solomon's designment bold the place, the manner, and the time she told. Their mantle dark the grisly shadows spread, stained with spots of deepest sanguine hue. Warm drops of blood on earth's black visage shed supplied the place of pure and precious dew. The moon and stars for fear of sprites were fled. The shrieking goblins each where howling flew. The furies roar, the ghosts and fairies yell. The earth was filled with devils, an empty hell. The soldan fierce through all this horror went toward the camp of his redoubted foes. The night was more than half consumed and spent. Now headlong down the western hills she goes, when distant scant a mile from Godfrey's tent he let his people there a while repose and victualled them, and then he boldly spoke these words, which rage and courage might provoke. See there a camp full stuffed of spoils and praise, not half so strong as false report recordeth. See there the storehouse, where their captain lays our treasures stolen, where Asia's wealth he hoardeth. Now chance the ball unto our racket plays. Take then the vantage which good luck affordeth. For all their arms, their horses, gold, and treasure are ours, ours without loss, harm, or displeasure. Nor is this camp that great victorious host that slew the Persian lords and Nice hath won. For those in this long war are spent and lost. These are the dregs, the wine is all outrun, and these few left are drowned and dead almost in heavy sleep. The labor half is done to send them headlong to Avernus deep, for little differs death and heavy sleep. Come, come, this sword the passage open shall into their camp, and on their bodies slain we will pass o'er their rampire and their wall. This blade, as scythes cut down the fields of grain, shall cut them so. Christ's kingdom now shall fall. Asia her freedom you shall praise obtain. Thus he inflamed his soldiers to the fight, and led them on through silence of the night. The sentinel by starlight, lo, descried this mighty Soldan and his host draw near, who found not as he hoped the Christian's guide unware, nay yet unready was his gear. The scouts, when this huge army they descried, ran back, and gan with shouts the larum rear. The watch start up and draw their weapons bright, and busked them bold to battle and to fight. The Arabians wist they could not come unseen, and therefore loud their jarring trumpet sound. Their yelling cries to heaven upheaved been. The horses thundered on the solid ground. The mountains roared, and the valleys green the echo sighed from the caves around. Electa with her brand, kindled in hell, tokened to them in David's tower that dwell. Before the rest, forth pricked the soldan fast against the watch, not yet in order just. As swift 
Swift as hideous Boreas hasty blast From hollow rocks when first his storms outburst, The raging floods that trees and rocks downcast, Thunders that towns and towers drive to dust, Earthquakes to tear the world in twain the threat, Are not compared to his fury great. He struck no blow but that his foe he hit, And never hit but made a grievous wound, And never wounded but death followed it. And yet no peril, hurt, or harm he found, No weapon on his hardened helmet bit, No puissant stroke his senses once astound. Yet like a bell his tinkling helmet rung, And thence flew flames of fire and sparks among. Himself well nigh had put the watch to flight, A jolly troop of Frenchmen strong and stout, When his Arabians came by heaps to fight, Covering like raging floods the fields about. The beaten Christians run away full light. The pagans, mingled with the flying rout, Entered their camp, and filled as they stood their tents With ruin, slaughter, death, and blood. High on the Soldan's helm, enameled, laid, and hideous dragon, Armed with many a scale, with iron paws and leathern wings displayed, Which twisted in a knot her forked tail. With triple tongue it seemed she hissed and brayed, About her jaws the froth and venom trail, And as he stirred, and as his foes him hit, So flames to cast and fire she seemed to spit. With this strange light the soldan fierce appeared, Dreadful to those that round about him been, As to poor sailors when huge storms are reared, With lightning flash the raging seas are seen. Some fled away because his strength they fear it, Some bolder against him bent their weapons keen, And froward night in ills and mischiefs pleased, Their dangers hid, and dangers still increased. Among the rest that strove to merit praise Was old Latinus, born by Tiber's bank, To whose stout heart in fights and bloody frays, For all his eeld, base fear yet never sank. Five sons he had, the comforts of his days, That from his side in no adventure shrank, But long before their time in iron strong They clad their members, tender, soft, and young. The old example of their father's might, Their weapons whetted, and their wrath increased. Come, let us go, quoth he, Where yonder knight upon our soldiers Makes his bloody feast. Let not their slaughter once your hearts affright, where danger most appears, there fear at least. For honor dwells in hard attempts, my sons, And greatest praise in greatest peril ones. Her tender brood, the forest's savage queen, Ere on their crests their rugged manes appear, Before their mouths by nature armed been, Or paws have strength a silly lamb to tear, So leadeth forth to prey, and makes them keen, and learns by her example not to fear the hunter in those desert woods that takes the lesser beasts whereon his feast he makes. The noble father and his hardy crew fierce Solomon on every side invade. At once all six upon the Soldan flew with lances sharp and strong encounters made. His broken spear the eldest boy down threw, and boldly, over boldly, drew his blade wherewith he strove, but strove therewith in vain, the pagan steed unmarked to have slain. But as a mountain or a cape of land, assailed with storms and seas on every side, doth unremoved, steadfast, still withstand storm, thunder, lightning, tempest, wind, and tide, the soldan so withstood Latinus' band, and unremoved did all their juists abide. And of that hapless youth, who hurt his steed, down to the chin he cleft in twain the head. Kind Aramant, who saw his brother slain, to hold him up stretched forth his friendly arm. O oh, foolish kindness, and O oh, pity vain, to add our proper loss to others' harm. The prince let fall his sword, and cut in twain, about his brother twined, the child's weak arm. Down from their saddles both together slide, together mourn they, and together died. That done, Sabino's lance with nimble force he cut in twain, and gainst the stripling bold he spurred his steed, that underneath his horse 
the hardy infant tumbled on the mould, whose soul, out squeezed from his bruised course, with ugly painfulness forsook her hold, and deeply mourned that of so sweet a cage she left the bliss and joys of youthful age. But Picus yet and Lawrence were on live, whom at one birth their mother fair brought out, a pair whose likeness made the parents strive oft which was which, and joyed in their doubt. But what their birth did undistinguished give, the soldan's rage made known, for Picus stout, headless, at one huge blow he laid in dust, and through the breast his gentle brother thrust. Their father, but no father now, alas, when all his noble sons at once were slain, in their five deaths so often murdered was, I know not how his life could him sustain, except his heart were forged of steel or brass, yet still he lived, Pardy, he saw not play in their dying looks, although their deaths he knows. It is some ease not to behold our woes. He wept not, for the night her curtain spread between his cause of weeping in his eyes, but still he mourned, and on sharp vengeance fed, and thinks he conquers if revenged he dies. He thirsts the soldan's heathenish blood to shed, and yet his own at less than naught doth prize nor can he tell whether he liefer would or die himself, or kill the pagan bold. At last, is this right hand, quoth he, so weak that thou disdainst against me to use thy might? Can it not do? Can this tongue nothing speak that may provoke thine ire, thy wrath and spite? With that he struck, his anger great to wreak, a blow that pierced the mail and metal bright, and in his flank set ope a floodgate wide, whereat the blood outstreamed from his side. Provoked with his cry, and with that blow, the Turk upon him gan his blade discharge. He cleft his breastplate, having first pierced through, lined with seven bulls' hides, his mighty targe, and sheathed his weapon in his guts below. Wretched Latinus, at that issue large, and at his mouth poured out his vital blood, and sprinkled with the same his murdered brood. On Apennine, like as a sturdy tree against the winds that makes resistance stout, if with a storm it overturned be, falls down and breaks the trees and plants about, so Latine fell, and with him fell at he, and slew the nearest of the pagans' rout. A worthy end, fit for a man of fame, that dying slew and conquered overcame. Meanwhile the soldan strove his rage in turn to satisfy with blood of Christians spilled. The Arabians, heartened by their captain stern, with murder every tent and cabin filled. Henry the English knight, and Olifern, O fierce Draguto, by thy hands were killed. Gilbert and Philip were by Ariadine both slain, both born upon the banks of Reen. Albazar with his mace Ernesto slew, under Algazel. Engerlin down fell, but the huge murder of the meaner crew, or manner of their deaths, what tongue can tell? Godfrey, when first the heathen trumpets blew, awaked, which heard, no fear could make him dwell, but he and his were up and armed ere long, and marched forward with a squadron strong. He that well heard the rumor and the cry, and marked the tumult still grow more and more, the Arabian thieves he judged by and by against his soldiers made this battle sore. For that they forayed all the countries nigh and spoiled the fields, the duke well knew before. Yet thought he not they had the hardiment so to assail him in his arm and tent. All suddenly he heard while on he went how to the city word, Arm, arm, they cried. The noise upreared to the firmament with dreadful howling filled the valleys wide. This was Clorinda, whom the king forth sent to battle, and Argantes by her side. The duke, this heard, to Guelfo turned and prayed him his lieutenant be, and to him said, You hear this new alarm from yonder part, that from the town breaks out with so much rage. Us needeth much your valor and your art to calm their fury and their heat to swage. Go thither then, 
and with you take some part of these brave soldiers of mine equipage, while with the residue of my champions bold I drive these wolves again out of our fold. They parted, this agreed on them between, by divers paths, Lord Welfo to the hill, and Godfrey hasted where the Arabians keen his men like silly sheep destroy and kill. But as he went, his troops increased been, from every part the people flocked still, that now grown strong enough, he approached nigh, where the fierce Turk caused many a Christian die. So from the top of Vesalus the cold, down to the sandy valleys tumbleth Po, whose streams, the further from their fountain rolled, still stronger wax, and with more puissance go. And horned like a bull, his forehead bold he lifts, and o'er his broken banks doth flow, and with his horns to pierce the sea essays, to which he proffereth war, not tribute pays. The duke his men fast flying did espy, and thither ran, and thus, displeased, spake. What fear is this? Oh, whither do you fly? See who they be that this pursuit do make? A heartless band that dare no battle try, who wounds before dare neither give nor take. Against them turn your stern eyes threatening sight, an angry look will put them all to flight. This said, he spurred forth where Solomon destroyed Christ's vineyard like a savage boar. Through streams of blood, through dust and dirt he ran, or heaps of bodies wallowing in their gore. The squadrons close, his sword to ope began. He broke their ranks, behind, beside, before, and where he goes, under his feet he treads the armed Saracens and barbed steeds. This slaughterhouse of angry Mars he passed, where thousands dead, half dead and dying were. The hardy Soldan saw him come in haste, yet neither stepped aside nor shrunk for fear, but busked him bold to fight. Aloft he cast his blade, prepared to strike and step it near. These noble princes twain, so fortune wrought, from the world's end here met, and here they fought. With virtue, fury, strength with courage strove for Asia's mighty empire. Who can tell with how strange force their cruel blows they drove, how sore their combat was, how fierce, how fell? Great deeds they wrought, each other's harness clove, yet still in darkness more the ruth they dwell the night their acts her black veil covered under their acts whereat the sun the world might wonder the christians by their guides and example hearted of their best armed made a squadron strong and to defend their chieftain forth they started the pagans also saved their knight from wrong fortune her favors twixt them evenly parted Fierce was the encounter, bloody, doubtful, long. These won, those lost. These lost, those won again. The loss was equal, even the numbers slain. With equal rage, as when the southern wind meeteth in battle strong the northern blast, the sea and air to neither is resigned, but cloud gainst cloud and wave gainst wave they cast. So from this skirmish neither part declined, but fought it out, and kept their footings fast, and oft with furious shock together rush, and shield gainst shield, and helm gainst helm they crush. The battle eke to Zion word grew hot, the soldiers slain, the hardy knights were killed, legions of sprites from Limbo's prisons got, the empty air, the hills and valleys filled, parting the pagans that they shrinked not, till where they stood their dearest blood they spilled. And with new rage Argantes they inspire, Whose heat no flames, whose burning need no fire. Where he came in, he put to shameful flight The fearful watch, and o'er the trenches leaped, Even with the ground he made the rampire's height, And murdered bodies in the ditch upheaped, So that his greedy mates with labor light Amid the tents a bloody harvest reaped. Clorinda went the proud Circassian by, so from a piece two chained bullets fly. Now fled the Frenchman, when in lucky hour arrived Guelfo and his helping band. He made them turn against this stormy shower, and with bold face their wicked foes withstand. Sternly they fought, 
that from their wounds down pour the streams of blood and run on either hand the lord of heaven meanwhile upon this fight from his high throne bent down his gracious sight from whence with grace and goodness compassed round he ruleth blesseth keepeth all he wrought above the air the fire the sea and ground our sense our wit our reason and our thought where persons three with power and glory crowned are all one god who made all things of naught under whose feet subjected to his grace sit nature fortune motion time and place this is the place from whence like smoke and dust of this frail world the wealth the pomp and power he tosseth tumbleth turneth as he lust and guides our life our death our end and hour no eye however virtuous pure and just can view the brightness of that glorious bower on every side the blessed spirits be equal in joys though differing in degree with harmony of their celestial song the palace echoed from the chambers pure at last he michael called in harness strong of never yielding diamonds armed sure behold quoth he to do despite and wrong to that dear flock my mercy hath in cure how satan from hell's loathsome prison sends his ghosts his sprites his furies and his fiends go bid them all depart and leave the care of war to soldiers as doth best pertain bid them forbear to infect the earth and air to darken heaven's fair light bid them refrain bid them to acheron's black flood repair fit house for them the house of grief and pain there let their king himself and them torment so i command go tell them mine intent this said the winged warrior low inclined at his creator's feet with reverence due then spread his golden feathers to the wind and swift as thought away the angel flew he passed the light and shining fire assigned the glorious seat of his selected crew the mover first and circle crystalline the firmament where fixed stars all shine unlike in working then in shape and show at his left hand saturn he left and jove and those untruly errant called i trow since he errs not who doth them guide and move the fields he passed then whence hail and snow thunder and rain fall down from clouds above where heat and cold dryness and moisture strive whose wars all creatures kill and slain revive the horrid darkness and the shadows done dispersed he with his eternal wings the flames which from his heavenly eyes outrun begilled the earth and all her sable things after a storm so spreadeth forth the sun his rays and binds the clouds in golden strings or in the stillness of a moonshine even a falling star so glideth down from heaven but when the infernal troop he approached near that still the pagans ire and rage provoke the angel on his wings himself did bear and shook his lance and thus at last he spoke have you not learned yet to know and fear the lord's just wrath and thunder's dreadful stroke or in the torments of your endless ill are you still fierce still proud rebellious still the lord hath sworn to break the iron bands the brazen gates of zion's fort which close who is it that his sacred will withstands against his wrath who dares himself oppose go hence ye cursed to your appointed lands the realms of death of torments and of woes and in the deeps of that infernal lake your battles fight and there your triumphs make there tyrannize upon the souls you find condemned to woe and double still their pains where some complain where some their teeth do grind some howl and weep some clank their iron chains this said they fled and those that stayed behind with his sharp lance he driveth and constrains they sighing left the lands his silver sheep where hesperus doth lead doth feed and keep 
and toward hell their lazy wings display to wreak their malice on the damned ghosts the birds that follow titan's hottest ray pass not in so great flocks to warmer coasts nor leaves in so great numbers fall away when winter nips them with his new-come frosts the earth delivered from so foul annoy recalled her beauty and resumed her joy but not for this in fierce argante's breast lessened the rancor or decayed the ire although electo left him to infest with the hot brands of her infernal fire round his armed head his trenchant blade he blessed and those thick ranks that seemed most entire he broke the strong the weak the high the low were equalized by his murdering blow not far from him amid the blood and dust heads arms and legs clorinda threw it wide her sword through berengaria's breast she thrust quite through the heart where life doth chiefly bide and that fell blow she struck so sure and just that at his back his blood and life forth glide even in the mouth she smote albinos then and cut in twain the visage of the man gernier's right hand she from his arm divided whereof but late she had received a wound the hand his sword still held although not guided the fingers half alive stirred on the ground so from a serpent slain the tail divided moves in the grass rolleth and tumbleth round the championess so wounded left the knight and gainst achilles turned her weapon bright upon his neck light that unhappy blow and cut the sinews and the throat in twain the head fell down upon the earth below and soiled with dust the visage on the plain the headless trunk a woeful thing to know still in the saddle seated did remain until his steed that felt the reins at large with leaps and flings that burden did discharge while thus this fair and fierce bellona slew the western lords and put their troops to flight gildippes raged amongst the pagan crew and low in dust laid many a worthy knight like was their sex their beauty and their hue like was their youth their courage and their might yet fortune would they should the battle try of mightier foes for both were framed to die yet wished they oft and strove in vain to meet so great betwixt them was the press and throng but hardy guelpho against clorinda sweet ventured his sword to work her harm and wrong and with a cutting blow so did her greet that from her side the blood streamed down along but with a thrust an answer sharp she made and twixt his ribs colored some deal her blade lord guelpho struck again but hit her not for strong osmida haply passed by and not meant him another's wound he got that cleft his front in twain above his eye near guelpho now the battle waxed hot for all the troops he led gan thither high and thither drew eke many a paynim knight that fierce stern bloody deadly waxed the fight meanwhile the purple morning peeped o'er the eastern threshold to our half of land and argelano in this great uproar from prison lucid was and what he fanned those arms he hent and to the field them bore resolved to take his chance what came to hand and with great acts amid the pagan host would win again his reputation lost as a fierce steed escaped from his stall at large where he had long been kept for warlike need runs through the fields unto the flowery marge of some green forest where he used to feed his curled mane his shoulders broad doth charge and from his lofty crest doth spring and spread thunder his feet his nostrils fire breathe out and with his neigh the world resounds about so argalon rushed forth sparkled his eyes his front high lifted was no fear therein lightly he leaps and skips it seems he flies he left no sign in dust imprinted thin and coming near his foes he sternly cries as one that feared not all their strength a pin you outcasts of the world you men of naught what hath in you this boldness newly wrought too weak are you to bear a helm or shield 
unfit to arm your breast in iron bright, you run half naked trembling through the field, your blows are feeble and your hope in flight. Your facts and all the actions that you wield, the darkness hides, your bulwark is the night. Now she is gone, how will your fight succeed? Now better arms and better hearts you need. While thus he spoke, he gave a cruel stroke against Algazel's throat with might and main, and as he would have answered him and spoke, he stopped his words and cut his jaws in twain. Upon his eyes death spread his misty cloak, the chilling frost congealed every vein. He fell, and with his teeth the earth he tore, raging in death and full of rage before. Then by his puissance mighty Saladine, proud Agricult and Muliasus died, and at one wondrous blow his weapon fine did Adiazel in two parts divide. Then through the breast he wounded Ariadine, whom dying with sharp taunts he gan deride. He, lifting up underneath his feeble eyes, to his proud scorns thus answereth ere he dies, Not thou, whoe'er thou art, shall glory long thy happy conquest in my death, I trow, like chance awaits thee from a hand more strong, which by my side will shortly lay thee low. He smiled and said, Of mine hour, short or long, let heaven take care. But here, meanwhile, die thou, pasture for wolves and crows. On him his foot he set, and drew his sword and life both out. Among this squadron rode a gentle page, the soldan's minion, darling and delight, on whose fair chin the springtime of his age yet blossomed not her flowers small or light. The sweat, spread on his cheeks with heat and rage, seemed pearls or morning dews on lilies white. The dust therein uprolled adorned his hair. His face seemed fierce and sweet, wrathful and fair. His steed was white and white as purest snow that falls on tops of aged Apennine, lightning and storm are not so swift, I trow, as he, to run, to stop, to turn, and twine. A dart his right hand shaked, pressed to throw, his cutlass by his thigh, short, hooked, fine, and braving in his Turkish pomp he shone, in purple robe or fret with gold and stone. The hardy boy, while thirst of warlike praise bewitched so his unadvised thought, gainst every band his childish strength assays, and little danger found, though much he sought, till Argelan, that watched fit time always in his swift turns to strike him as he fought, did unawares his snow-white courser slay, and under him his master tumbling lay, and gainst his face where love and pity stand to pray him that rich throne of beauty spare, the cruel man stretched forth his murdering hand to spoil those gifts whereof he had no share. It seemed remorse and sense was in his brand, which, lighting flat, to hurt the lad forbear, but all for naught, against him the point he bent, that, what the edge had spared, pierced and rent. Fierce Solomon, that with good Fredo strived, who first should enter conquest's glorious gate, left off the fray, and thither headlong drived. When first he saw the lad in such a state, he brake the press, and soon enough arrived to take revenge, but to his aid too late, because he saw his lesbian slain and lost, like a sweet flower nipped with untimely frost. He saw wax dim the starlight of his eyes, his ivory neck upon his shoulders fell. In his pale looks kind pity's image lies, that death e'en mourned to hear his passing bell. His marble heart such soft impression tries, that midst his wrath his manly tears outwell. Thou weepest, Solomon, thou that beheld thy kingdoms lost, and not one tear couldst yield. But when the murderer's sword he happed to view, Dropping with blood of his lesbino dead, His pity vanished, ire and rage renew, 
he had no leisure bootless tears to shed, but with his blade on Argelano flew, and cleft his shield, his helmet, and his head down to his throat, and worthy was that blow of Soliman, his strength and wrath to show, and not content with this, down from his horse he lights, and that dead carcass rent and tore like a fierce dog that takes his angry course to bite the stone which him had hit before. O oh, comfort vain for grief of so great force to wound the senseless earth that feels no sore. But mighty Godfrey against the Soldan's train spent not this while his force and blows in vain. A thousand hardy Turks affront he had in sturdy iron armed from head to foot, resolved in all adventures good or bad, in actions wise, in executions stout, whom Solomon into Arabia lad, when from his kingdom he was first cast out, where living wild, with their exiled guide, to him in all extremes they faithful bide. All these in thickest order sure unite, from Godfrey's valor small or nothing shrank. Corcutes first he on the face did smite, then wounded strong Rosteno in the flank. At one blow Selim's head he struck off quite, then both Rosano's arms. In every rank the boldest knights of all that chosen crew he felled, maimed, wounded, hurt, and slew. While thus he killed many a Saracine, and all their fierce assaults unhurt sustained, ere fortune wholly from the Turks decline, while still they hoped much, though small they gained, Behold, a cloud of dust, wherein doth shine lightning of war in midst thereof contained, whence unawares burst forth a storm of swords, which tremble made the pagan knights and lords. These fifty champions were amongst whom there stands in silver field the ensign of Christ's death. If I had mouths and tongues as briarious hands, if voice as iron tough, if iron breath, what harm this troop wrought to the heathen bands, what knights they slew I could recount aneath. In vain the Turks resist, the Arabians fly, for if they fly they're slain, if fight they die. Fear, cruelty, grief, horror, sorrow, pain, run through the field disguised in diverse shapes. Death might you see triumphant on the plain, drowning in blood him that from blows escapes. The king, meanwhile, with parcel of his train, comes hastily out, and for sure conquest gapes. And from a bank whereon he stood beheeled the doubtful hazard of that bloody field. But when he saw the pagans shrink away, he sounded the retreat, and gan desire his messengers in his behalf to pray Argantes and Clorinda to retire. The furious couple both at once said nay, even drunk with shedding blood and mad with ire. At last they went, and to recomfort thought and stay their troops from flight, but all for naught. For who can govern cowardice or fear? Their host already was begun to fly. They cast their shields and cutting swords arrear, as not defended, but made slow thereby. A hollow dale, the city's bulwarks near, from west to south outstretched long doth lie. Thither they fled, and in a mist of dust Toward the walls they run, they throng, they thrust. While down the bank disordered thus they ran, The Christian knights huge slaughter on them made. But when to climb the other hill they gan, Old Aladine came fiercely to their aid. On that steep bray Lord Guelpho Would not then hazard his folk, But there his soldiers stayed. And safe within the city's walls The king the relics small of that sharp fight did bring. Meanwhile the Soldan, in his latest charge, had done as much as human force was able. All sweat and blood appeared his members large. His breath was short, his courage waxed unstable. His arm grew weak to bear his mighty targe, his hand to rule his heavy sword unable. Which bruised, not cut, so blunted was the blade, it lost the use for which a sword was made. Feeling his weakness, he gan musing stand, and in his troubled thought this question tossed. If he himself should murder with his hand, because none else should of his conquest boast, or he should save his life, when on the land lay slain the pride of his subdued host. At last, 
to fortune's power, quoth he, I yield, and on my flight let her her trophies build. Let Godfrey view my flight and smile to see this mine unworthy second banishment, for armed again soon shall he hear of me, from his proud head the unsettled crown to rent, for as my wrongs, my wrath the turn shall be, and every hour the bow of war new bent. I will arise again, a foe fierce, bold, though dead, though slain, though burnt to ashes cold. End of Book Nine Book Ten of Jerusalem Delivered by Torquato Tasso Translated by Edward Fairfax This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland The Argument Ismene from sleep awakes the Soldan great, And into Sion brings the prince by night, Where the sad king sits fearful on his seat, Whom he emboldeneth and excites to fight. Godfredo hears his lords and knights repeat How they escaped Armida's wrath and spite. Rinaldo known to live, Peter foresays his offspring's virtue, good deserts, and praise. A gallant steed, while thus the Soldan said, came trotting by him without lord or guide. Quickly his hand upon the reins he laid, and weak and weary, climbed up to ride. The snake that on his crest hot fire outbraid was quite cut off. His helm had lost the pride. His coat was rent, his harness hacked and cleft and of his kingly pomp no sign was left. As when a savage wolf chased from the fold to hide his head runs to some holt or wood, who, though he filled hath while it might hold his greedy paunch, yet hungereth after food, with sanguine tongue forth of his lips outrolled about his jaws that licks up foam and blood. So from this bloody fray the soldan hide, if his rage unquenched, his wrath unsatisfied and as his fortune would, he scaped free from thousand arrows which about him flew, from swords and lances, instruments that be of certain death, himself he safe withdrew. Unknown, unseen, disguised traveled he by desert paths and ways but used by few, and rode revolving in his troubled thought what course to take, and yet resolved on naught. Thither at last he meant to take his way, Where Egypt's king assembled all his host, To join with him, and once again assay to win by fight, By which so oft he lost. Determined thus, he made no longer stay, But thitherward spurred forth his steed in post. Nor need he guide, the way right well he could That leads to sandy plains of Gaza old. Nor though his smarting wounds torment him oft, His body weak and wounded back and side, Yet rested he, nor once his armor doffed, But all day long o'er hills and dales doth ride. But when the night cast up her shade aloft, And all earth's colors strange and sable dyed, He light, and as he could, his wounds upbound, And shook ripe dates down from a palm he found. On them he suppered, and amid the field to rest his weary limbs a while he sought. He made his pillow of his broken shield, to ease the griefs of his distempered thought. But little ease could so hard lodging yield, his wounds so smarted that he slept right not, and in his breast his proud heart rent in twain two inward vultures, sorrow and disdain. At length, when midnight with her silence deep did heaven and earth hushed, still, and quiet make, sore watched and weary, he began to steep his cares and sorrows in oblivion's lake, and in a little, short, unquiet sleep, some small repose his fainting spirits take. But while he slept, a voice grave and severe at unawares thus thundered in his ear, O Solomon, thou far-renowned king, till better season serve forbear thy rest, a stranger doth thy lands in thraldom bring. Nice is a slave by Christian yoke oppressed. Sleepest thou here forgetful of this thing, That here thy friends lie slain, not laid in chest, Whose bones bear witness of thy shame and scorn, And wilt thou idly here attend the morn? The king awoke, 
and saw before his eyes a man whose presence seemed grave and old a writhen staff his steps unstable guise which served his feeble members to uphold and what art thou the prince in scorn replies what sprite to vex poor passengers so bold to break their sleep or what to thee belongs my shame my loss my vengeance or my wrongs i am the man of thine intent quoth he and purpose knew that sure conjecture hath and better than thou weenest know i thee i proffer thee my service and my faith my speeches therefore sharp and biting be because quick words the whetstones are of wrath except in gree my lord the words i spoke as spurs thine ire and courage to provoke but now to visit egypt's mighty king unless my judgment fail you are prepared i prophesy about a needless thing you suffer shall a voyage long and hard for though you stay the monarch great will bring his new assembled host to judah word no place of service there no cause of fight nor gainst our foes to use your force and might but if you follow me within this wall with christian arms hemmed in on every side without in battle fight or stroke at all even at noonday i will you safely guide where your delight rejoice and glory shall in perils great to see your prowess tried that noble town you may preserve and shield till egypt's host come to renew the field while thus he parleyed of this aged guest the turk the words and looks did both admire and from his haughty eyes and furious breast he laid apart his pride his rage his ire and humbly said i willing am and pressed to follow where thou leadest reverend sire and that advice best fits my angry vein that tells of greatest peril greatest pain the old man praised his words and for the air his late received wounds to worse disposes a quintessence therein he poured fair that stops the bleeding and incision closes beholding then before apollo's chair how fresh aurora violets strewed and roses it's time he says to wend for titan bright to wanted labor summons every wight and to a chariot that beside did stand ascended he and with him Solomon. he took the reins and with a mastering hand ruled his steeds and whipped them now and then the wheels or horses feet upon the land had left no sign or token where they ran the coursers pant and smoke with lukewarm sweat and foaming cream their iron mouthfuls eat the air about them round a wondrous thing itself on heaps in solid thickness drew the chariot hiding and environing the subtle mist no mortal eye could view and yet no stone from engine cast or sling could pierce the cloud it was a proof so true yet seen it was to them within which ride and heaven and earth without all clear beside his beetle brows the turk amazed bent he wrinkled up his front and wildly stared upon the cloud and chariot as it went for speed to cynthia's car right well compared the other seeing his astonishment how he bewondered was and how he fared all suddenly by name the prince gan call by which awaked thus he spoke withal where thou art above all worldly wit that hast these high and wondrous marvels wrought and knowst the deep intents which hidden sit in secret closet of man's private thought if in thy skilful heart this lore be writ to tell the event of things to end unbrought then say what issue and what end the stars allot to asia's troubles broils and wars but tell me first thy name and by what art thou dost these wonders strange above our skill for full of marvel is my troubled heart tell then and leave me not amazed still the wizard smiled and answered in some part easy it is to satisfy thy will is mean i hight called an enchanter great such skill have i in magic's secret feat but that i should the sure events unfold of things to come or destinies foretell too rash is your desire your wish too bold to mortal heart such knowledge never fell 
our wit and strength on us bestowed i hold to shun the evils and harms amongst which we dwell they make their fortune who are stout and wise wit rules the heavens discretion guides the skies that puissant arm of thine that well can rend from godfrey's brow the new usurped crown and not alone protect save and defend from his fierce people this besieged town against fire and sword with strength and courage bend adventure suffer trust tread perils down and to consent and to encourage thee know this which i as in a cloud foresee i guess before the overgliding sun shall many years meet out by weeks and days a prince that shall in fertile egypt one shall fill all asia with his prosperous phrase i speak not of his acts in quiet done his policy his rule his wisdom's praise let this suffice by him these christians shall in fight subdued fly and conquered fall and their great empire and usurped state shall overthrown in dust and ashes lie their woeful remnant in an angle straight compassed with sea themselves shall fortify from thee shall spring this lord of war and fate whereto great solomon gan thus reply o happy man to so great praise he bore thus he rejoiced but yet envied more and said let chance with good or bad aspect upon me look as sacred heaven's decree this heart to her i never will subject nor ever conquered shall she look on me the moon her chariot shall awry direct ere from this course i will diverted be while thus he spake it seemed he breathed fire so fierce his courage was so hot his ire thus talked they till they arrived been nigh to the place where godfrey's tents were reared there was a woeful spectacle is seen death in a thousand ugly forms appeared the soldan changed hue for grief and teen on that sad book his shame and loss he leered ah with what grief his men his friends he found and standards proud inglorious lie on ground and saw on visage of some well-known friend in foul despite a rascal frenchman tread and there another ragged peasant rend the arms and garments from some champion dead and there with stately pomp by heaps they wend and christians slain roll up in webs of lead lastly the turks and slain arabians brought on heaps he saw them burn with fire to naught deeply he sighed and with naked sword out of the coach he leaped in the mire but Dismin called again the angry lord and with grave words appeased his foolish ire the prince content remounted at his word toward a hill on drove the aged sire and hasting forward up the bank they pass till far behind the christian leader was there they alight and took their way on foot the empty chariot vanished out of sight yet still the cloud environed them about at their left hand down went they from the height of science hill till they approached the rout on that side where to west he looketh right there ismin stayed and his eyesight bent upon the bushy rocks and thither went a hollow cave was in the craggy stone wrought out by hand a number years to four and for of long that way had walked none the vault was hid with plants and bushes hoar the wizard stooping in thereat to gone the thorns aside and scratching brambles bore his right hand sought the passage through the cleft and for his guide he gave the prince his left what quoth the soldan by what privy mine what hidden vault behooves it me to creep this sword can find a better way than thine although our foes the passage guard and keep let not quoth he thy princely foot repine to tread this secret path though dark and deep for great king herod used to tread the same he that in arms had whilom so great fame this passage made he when he would suppress his subjects pride and them in bondage hold by this he could from that small fortress antonia called of antony the bold convey his folk unseen of more or less even to the middest of the temple old 
thence hither, where these privy ways begin, and bring unseen whole armies out and in. But now, save I, in all this world lives none that knows the secret of this darksome place. Come then, where Aladine sits on his throne, with lords and princes set about his grace. He feareth more than fitteth such a one, such signs of doubt show in his cheer and face. Fitly you come, hear, see, and keep you still till time and season serve, then speak your fill. This said, that narrow entrance past the night, so creeps a camel through a needle's eye, and through the ways as black as darkest night he followed him that did him rule and guide. Straight was the way at first, without and light, but further in did further amplify, so that upright walked at ease the men, ere they had passed half that secret den. A privy door is mean unlocked at last, and up they climbed a little used stair. Thereat the day a feeble beam in cast, dim was the light, and nothing clear the air. Out of the hollow cave at length they passed, into a goodly hall, high, broad, and fair, where crowned with gold and all in purple clad, sate the sad king among his nobles sad. The Turk, close in his hollow cloud embarred, unseen, at will did all the press behold. These heavy speeches of the king he heard, who thus from lofty siege his pleasure told. My lords, last day our state was much impaired, our friends were slain, killed were our soldiers bold, great helps and greater hopes are us bereft, nor aught but aid from Egypt land is left, and well you see far distant is that aid, upon our heels our danger treadeth still. For your advice was this assembly made, each what he thinketh speak, and what he will. A whisper soft arose when this was said, as gentle winds the groves with murmur fill. But with bold face, high looks, and merry cheer, Argantes rose, the rest their talk forbear. O oh, worthy sovereign, thus began to say the hardy young man to the tyrant wise, What words be these? What fears do you dismay? Who knows not this? You need not our advice but on our hands your hope of conquest lay, and for no loss true virtue damnifies, make her our shield. Pray her us succors give, and without her let us not wish to live. Nor say I this, for that I ought misdeem that Egypt's promised succors fail us might. Doubtful of my great master's words to seem to me were neither lawful, just, nor right. I speak these words, for spurs I them esteem, to waken up each dull and fearful sprite, and make our hearts resolve to all assays, to win with honor, or to die with praise. Thus much Argante said, and said no more, as if the case were clear of which he spoke. Orcano rose of princely stem bore, whose presence amongst them bore a mighty stroke. A man esteemed well in arms of yore, but now was coupled new in marriage yoke. Young babes he had, to fight which made him loath, he was a husband and a father both. My lord, quoth he, I will not reprehend the earnest zeal of this audacious speech, from courage sprung, which seld is close append in swelling stomach without violent breach. And though to you our good Circassian friend in terms too bold and fervent oft doth preach, Yet hold I that for good in warlike feet, for his great deeds respond his speeches great. But if it you beseem, whom graver age and long experience hath made wise and sly, to rule the heat of youth and hardy rage, which somewhat hath misled this night awry, in equal balance ponder then and gauge your hopes far distant with your perils nigh. This town's old walls and rampires now compare with Godfrey's forces and his engines rare. But, if I may say what I think unblamed, this town is strong by nature, sight, and art. But engines huge and instruments are framed against these defenses by our adverse part. Who thinks him most secure 
is Ethus shamed. I hope the best, yet fear unconstant mart. And with this siege, if we be long uppent, famine, I doubt, our store will all be spent. For all that store of cattle and of grain which yesterday within these walls you brought, while your proud foes triumphant through the plain are not but shedding blood and conquest thought, too little is this city to sustain, to raise the siege unless some means be sought. And it must last till the prefixed hour that it be raised by Egypt's aid and power. But what if that appointed day they miss? Or else, ere we expect, what if they came? The victory yet is not ours for this. Oh, save this town from ruin, us from shame. With that same Godfrey still our warfare is. These armies, soldiers, captains are the same who have so oft amid the dusty plain Turks, Persians, Syrians, and Arabians slain. And thou, Argantes, wottest what they be. Oft hast thou fled from that victorious host. Thy shoulders often hast thou let them see, and in thy feet hath been thy safeguard most. Clorinda Bright and I fled eke with thee. None than his fellows had more cause to boast. Nor blame I any, for in every fight we showed courage, valor, strength, and might. And though this hardy knight the certain threat of near approaching death to hear disdain, yet to this state of loss and danger great from this strong foe I see the tokens plain. No fort how strong so e'er by art or seek can hinder Godfrey why he should not reign. This makes me say, to witness heaven I bring, zeal to this state, love to my lord and king. The king of Tripoli was well advised to purchase peace and so preserve his crown, but Solomon, who Godfrey's love despised, is either dead or deep in prison thrown, else fearful is he run away disguised, and scant his life is left him for his own. And yet with gifts, with tribute, and with gold, he might in peace his empire still have hold. Thus spake Orcanes, and some inkling gave in doubtful words of what he would have said. To sue for peace, or yield himself a slave, he durst not openly his king persuade. But at these words the soldan gan to rave, and gainst his will wrapped in the cloud he stayed. Whom Wismin thus bespake, How can you bear these words, my lord, or these reproaches here? Oh, let me speak, quoth he, with ire and scorn I burn, and gainst my will thus hid I stay. This said, the smoky cloud was cleft and torn, which like a veil upon them stretched lay, and up to open heaven forthwith was born, and left the prince in view of lights and day. With princely look amid the press he shined, and on a sudden thus declared his mind. Of whom you speak, behold the soldan here, neither afraid nor run away for dread, and that these slanders, lies, and fables were, this hand shall prove upon that coward's head. I, who have shed a sea of blood well near, and heaped up mountains high of Christians dead, I, in their camp who still maintained the fray, my men all murdered, I, that run away. If this, or any coward vile beside, false to his faith and country, dares reply and speak of concord with yond men of pride, by your good leave, Sir King, here shall he die. The lambs and wolves shall in one fold abide, the doves and serpents in one nest shall lie before one town, us and these Christians shall in peace and love unite within one wall. While thus he spoke, his broad and trenchant sword, his hand held high aloft in threatening guise. Dumb stood the knight, so dreadful was his word. A storm was in his front, fire in his eyes. He turned at last to Sion's aged lord, and calmed his visage stern in humbler wise. Behold, quoth he, good prince, what aid I bring, since Solomon is joined with Judah's king. King Aladdin from his rich throne upstart, and said, O oh, how I joy thy face to view, my noble friend! It lesseneth in some part my grief for slaughter of my subjects true. My weak estate to establish come thou art, and mayst thine own again in time renew if heaven's consent. With that, the soldan bold, in dear embracements did he long enfold. 
Their greetings done, the king resigned his throne to Solomon, and set himself beside in a rich seat adorned with gold and stone, and Ismene sage did at his elbow bide, of whom he asked what way they two had gone, and he declared all what had them betide. Clorinda bright to Solomon addressed her salutations first, then all the rest. Among them rose Ormusus, valiant knight, whom late the Soldan with a convoy sent, and when most hot and bloody was the fight, by secret paths and blind byways he went, till aided by the silence and the night, safe in the city's walls himself he pent, and there refreshed with corn and cattle store the pined soldiers famished nigh before. With surly countenance and disdainful grace, sullen and sad, sat the Circassian stout, like a fierce lion grumbling in his place, his fiery eyes that turns and rolls about. Nor durst Orcanes view the soldan's face, but still upon the floor did pour and tout. Thus with his lords and peers in counseling the Turkish monarch sat with Judah's king. Godfrey this while gave victory the rein, and following her the straits he opened all. Then for his soldiers and his captains slain he celebrates a stately funeral, and told his camp within a day or twain he would assault the city's mighty wall, and all the heathen there enclosed doth threat with fire and sword, with death and danger great. And for he had that noble squadron known, in the last fight which brought him so great aid, to be the lords and princes of his own, who followed late the sly enticing maid, and with them Tancred, who had late been thrown in prison deep by that false witch betrayed, before the hermit and some private friends, for all these worthies, lords and knights, he sends. And thus he said, Some one of you declare your fortunes, whether good or to be blamed, and to assist us with your valors rare in so great need, how was your coming framed? They blush, and on the ground amazed stare, for virtue is of little guilt ashamed. At last the English prince, with countenance bold, the silence broke, and thus their errors told. We, not elect to that exploit by lot, with secret flight from hence ourselves withdrew, following false cupid I deny it not, enticed forth by love and beauty's hue. A jealous fire burnt in our stomachs hot, and by close ways we passed least in view. Her words, her looks, alas, I know too late, nursed our love, our jealousy, our hate. At last we gan approach that woeful clime where fire and brimstone down from heaven was sent to take revenge for sin and shameful crime gainst kind commit by those who nold repent. A loathsome lake of brimstone, pitch, and lime or goes that land, erst sweet and redolent. And when it moves, thence stench and smoke up flies, which dim the welkin and infect the skies. This is the lake in which yet never might aught that hath weight sink to the bottom down, but like to cork or leaves or feathers light, stones, iron, men, there float and never drown. Therein a castle stands, to which by sight, but o'er a narrow bridge, no way is known. Hither us brought, here welcomed us the witch. The house within was stately, pleasant, rich. The heavens were clear, and wholesome was the air. High trees, sweet meadows, waters pure and good. For there, in thickest shade of myrtles fair, a crystal spring poured out a silver flood. Amid the herbs, the grass, and flowers rare, the falling leaves down pattered from the wood. The birds sung hymns of love, yet speak I not of gold and marble rich and richly wrought. Under the curtain of the green wood shade, beside the brook, upon the velvet grass, in massy vessels of pure silver made, a banquet rich and costly furnished was, all beasts, all birds beguiled by fowler's trade, all fish were there in floods or seas that pass, all dainties made by art, and at the table an hundred virgins served for husbands able. She, with sweet words and false enticing smiles, infused love among the dainties set, and with empoisoned cups our souls beguiles, and made each knight himself and God forget. She rose, 
and turned again within short whiles with changed looks where wrath and anger met a charming rod a book with her she brings on which she mumbled strange and secret things she read and changed i felt my will and thought i longed to change my life and place of biding that virtue strange in me no pleasure wrought i leaped into the flood myself there hiding my legs and feet both into one were brought mine arms and hands into my shoulders sliding my skin was full of scales like shields of brass now made a fish where late a night i was the rest with me like shape like garments wore and dived with me in that quick silver stream such mind to my remembrance then i bore as when on vain and foolish things men dream at last our shape it pleased her to restore then full of wonder and of fear we seem and with an ireful look the angry maid thus threatened us and made us thus afraid you see quoth she my sacred might and skill how you are subject to my rule and power in endless thraldom damned if i will i can torment and keep you in this tower or make you birds or trees on craggy hill to bide the bitter blasts of storm and shower or hearten you to rocks on mountains old, or melt your flesh and bones to rivers cold. Yet may you well avoid mine ire and wrath, if to my will your yielding hearts you bend. You must forsake your Christendom and faith, and gainst Godfredo false my crown defend. We all refused, for speedy death each prayeth, save false Rambaldo, he became her friend, we in a dungeon deep were helpless cast in misery and iron chained fast then for alone they say falls no mishap within short while prince tancred thither came and was unwares surprised in the trap but there short while we stayed the wily dame in other folds our mischiefs would uprap from hidreort an hundred horsemen came whose guide a baron bold to Egypt's king should us disarmed and bound in fetters bring. Now on our way, the way to death we ride, but providence divine thus for us wrought. Rinaldo, whose high virtue is his guide to great exploits, succeeding human thought, met us, and all at once our guard defied, and ere he left the fight, to earth them brought, and in their harness armed us in the place which late were ours before our late disgrace i and all these the hearty champion knew we saw his valor and his voice we heard then is the rumor of his death untrue his life is safe good fortune long at guard three times the golden sun hath risen new since us he left and rode to antioch ward but first his armors broken hacked and cleft unfit for service there he doffed and left thus spake the Briton prince with humble cheer the hermit sage to heaven cast up his eyne his color and his countenance changed were with heavenly grace his looks and visage shine ravished with zeal his soul approached near the seat of angels pure and saints divine and there he learned of things and haps to come to give foreknowledge true and certain doom at last he spoke in more than human sound and told what things his wisdom great foresaw and at his thundering voice the folk around attentive stood with trembling and with awe rinaldo lives he said the tokens found from women's craft their false beginnings draw he lives and heaven will long preserve his days to greater glory and to greater praise these are but trifles yet, though Asia's king shrink at his name and tremble at his view. I well foresee he shall do greater things, and wicked emperors conquer and subdue. Under the shadow of his eagle's wings shall holy church preserve her sacred crew. From Caesar's bird he shall the sable train pluck off, and break her talon sharp in twain. His children's children at his hardiness and great attempts shall take example fair. From emperors unjust in all distress they shall defend the state of Peter's chair. To raise the humble up, pride to suppress, to help the innocents shall be their care. 
This bird of east shall fly with conquest great, As far as moon gives light or sun gives heat. Her eyes behold the truth and purest light, And thunders down in Peter's aid she brings, And where for Christ and Christian faith men fight, There forth she spreadeth her victorious wings. This virtue nature gives her, and this might. Then lure her home, for on her presence hings the happy end of this great enterprise. So heaven decrees, and so command the skies. These words of his, of Prince Rinaldo's death, out of their troubled hearts the fear had raised. In all this joy, yet Godfrey smiled uneath. In his wise thought such care and heed was placed. But now from deeps of regions underneath, night's veil arose, and sun's bright luster chased. When all full sweetly in their cabins slept, save he whose thoughts his eyes still open kept. End of Book Ten